Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening uh, in the States. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the day two symposium of the uh, 51st Karst International Symposium. So uh, in the day two, we have 14 speakers and uh, we also have a wonderful audiences in sight and also Zoom and the YouTube. Okay, so uh, today we have a two sessions. The session two is the spectroscopy and the reaction mechanism. And also in the afternoon, session three is a biomimetic catalyst. Uh, in the first session, we have two chairs, Professor Kiyong Bak from Kai and also Professor Yun Jung Bak from Kai. So uh, Professor uh, Kiyong Bak uh, will take care of the session, uh, uh, second session. Kiyong? the introduction, Professor Sung Jae Lee. It's a great honor for me to be able to introduce this to these three symbolic people in the bioinorganic spectroscopic fields. The first speaker is Professor Edward Solomon. He started his independent career at MIT at 19, in 1975, and then he moved to Stanford in 1982. And since 82, he's a full professor at Stanford, and also since 1991, he's been uh, a Mon Monroe Spot professor. And also to, from since 2005, he's been a uh, slack professor of photon science as well. He's a member of uh, National Academy of Science and American Academy of Arts and Science. Uh, he, he got a lot of numerous awards. You can check in in the CV. And please welcome Professor Solomon. <clears throat> thank you, Kiang. Uh, also, thank you, Wan Wu and Mihi and the other organizers for putting this symposium together. I'm going to try to get my talk up. Um, let me just get the pictures out of the way and go into present mode. And I assume you can all see this. We're good. Um, so let's begin. I'm going to talk about our work in uh, the area of oxygen activation by mononuclear non-heme iron, mostly metalloenzymes. But uh, in the latter part of the talk, I'm going to bring it to uh, metallozeolites that are heterogeneous catalysts. So in the first science slide, I give the five major classes of mononuclear non-heme iron enzymes. These all activate dioxygen using a high spin ferrous site. Um, let's just focus on the uh, most of the talk today on the cofactor dependent enzymes where the cofactor donates two electrons, the iron donates two electrons, and so you reduce the oxygen to four electrons to generate an iron four oxo intermediate, which in the alpha ketoglutarate dependent enzymes, this does H atom abstraction and leads to hydroxylation or halogenation or desaturation depending on the enzyme and the substrate, while in the terrin dependent uh, enzymes, you get electrophilic aromatic hydroxylation. The ferrous sites in all these enzymes are high spin ferrous, but they have generally been very um, inaccessible to spectroscopic methods revealing structural insights that are important to mechanism. However, high spin ferrous has a rich electronic structure uh, as given by ligand field theory. So the um, ground state of an octahedral ferrous site is a quintet T2G, and uh, there's one spin allowed excited state, which is a quintet EG at 10DQ, which for non-heme ligation, which are histidine and carboxylate ligation, this is about 10,000 wave numbers. This E is, um, is orbitally de <clears throat> degenerate, and that degeneracy will split based in energy based on the environment as given by ligand field theory. For distorted six coordinate sites, this splitting can be up to 2,000 wave numbers. Well, if you go to five coordinates, you get a large splitting with bands in the 10 and the 5,000 wave number region. If we go down and pull off another ligand and go to distorted four coordinate, 10 dq, as you all know, 10 dq of a tetrahedron is minus four ninths, 10 dq of an octahedron. So you only expect low energy ligand field excited states. So this is all great. But these are DD transitions, which means they're parity forbidden. 
They're also in the 12 to 4,000 wave number near infrared region, which is obscured by vibrations of the protein and the buffer. So you really can't study these transitions in absorption spectroscopy. However, the ground state is a quintet. It's paramagnetic, and the way to study paramagnetic metal centers is to do magnetic circular dichroism spectroscopy at low temperature and high field, where the signal is orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude greater than the diamagnetic background. Okay, and so we studied, used MC, MCD spectroscopy to study more than 20 structurally defined high spin ferrous sites. And what we see experimentally, and these are MCD data, I forgot to label that, um, is just what we see from ligand field theory. For distorted six coordinate sites, you see two transitions centered about 10,000 wave numbers split by less than 2,000. If you go to five coordinates, you get bands in the 10 and in the 5,000 wave number regime. And if you go to four coordinates, you only get low energy ligand field excited states. Okay, that's great. You should also notice the ground state is spin and orbitally degenerate. There's a lot of information there. And we developed the ability to use the temperature and field dependence of the MCD of an excited state to probe the ground state, which I won't have time to cover today, but I am going to use it in the latter part of my talk. But right now today, I just want to use the excited states to get structural insight into a mechanism of a terran dependent non-heme iron enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase, which if you remember diet soda cans, there's a warning on the label saying phenylketonureic, this has phenylalanine and you shouldn't drink it. Okay, so that's this enzyme. So the black spectrum is the MCD spectrum of the resting ferrous site, two bands at 10,000 wave numbers split by less than 2,000 at six coordinate. If you add the substrate, which is phenylalanine, you go black to blue, a small perturbation of the ligand field transitions with the substrate binding uh, near the active site in the protein pocket. If instead you add the terran, you go from black to green, there's no perturbation on the iron showing that the terran does not bind to the ferrous site in the absence of substrate. Finally, if I add both um, the substrate, phenylalanine, and the terran, you go black to red. You get one band in the 10,000, one band in the 5,000 wave number regime. The site has gone five coordinate, and it turns on reactivity. And we've seen this type of be behavior over all five of the different classes of mononuclear non-heme iron enzymes. And so we've referred to this as a general mechanistic strategy of these uh, different enzymes where for the cofactor dependent ones, the ferrous site, the site with substrate bound or the site with just cofactor bound is six coordinate. It's coordinatively saturated and relatively stable in the presence of oxygen. But when you bind both co-substrates, phenylalanine and the terran in this case, you open up a coordination position, you lose the water ligand and you turn on oxygen activation, which in the uh, terran and alpha ketoglutarate dependent enzymes, this is iron oxo intermediate. Okay, so this is a four electron reduction of oxygen and we uh, to make the iron for oxo. And we really wanted to understand how this works. And the only way, in my opinion, to do this is to trap an intermediate which reveals the mechanism. And we could do that finally in the terran, in the terran dependent non heme iron enzyme uh, tryptophan hydroxylase. Okay, and so the absorption spectrum in the visible UV of just ferrous enzyme with uh, terran present is uh, structureless, there's no features, but when you add substrate, you find this new band grows in at 330 nanometers, which from a variety of spectroscopies, mostly resonance, Raman and MCD on this, we find that when substrate binds to terran, now coordinates to the iron and produces this charge transfer transition uh, along with going five coordinate. This then reacts with oxygen to produce a new intermediate. So this goes down, this grows in, and then that decays, this 442 intermediate decays with a solvent KIE showing its protonation, a cleavage of the bond to generate an iron oxo. So we can use rapid freeze quench methods to trap this intermediate. And again, from a variety of spectroscopies, in particular, uh, in this case was resonance Raman and Mossbauer, we know this intermediate is a peroxy oxidized terran by dentate coordinated to a high spin ferrous site. Um, and since we now know the intermediate, we know the mechanism, we can calculate it 
uh, and find uh, a key feature of the enabling this reaction is that when the substrate bind, this terin binding to the iron lowers the activation barrier for making this peroxy terin intermediate by almost 15 kcal per mole. And that's because the terin has to donate two electrons to the peroxide, to, to the O2, to generate a peroxide. One comes directly from the terin, but the other one comes from the terin via the carbonyl to the iron to compensate for the iron's electron that provides a second electron to make the proxy ferrous oxidized terin species. So again, cleavage of this um, species, protonation cleavage gives us the iron for oxo intermediates and the enzyme. These are all quintet ground states. These iron oxo enzyme intermediates have generated a lot of model studies. Most of the models uh, have triplet ground states, but there are now also a number of structurally defined um, model complexes that have quintet ground states as in the enzyme. And what I want to do now is spend a few minutes on model spectroscopy and particularly use uh, spectroscopy to define the frontier molecular orbitals that are key to the reactivity and the spin state dependence. And then for the S of two in the enzyme, I want to go to a specific alpha ketoglutarate dependent halogenase and show how a key frontier molecular orbital enables selective halogenation over the thermodynamically favored hydroxylation reaction. Okay, so that's where we're going to go. Start with the S of one iron oxo model complex. So the first complex to be structurally defined by Wun Wu and Larry, okay. Um, is this um, TMC acetonitrile complex, an iron four oxo complex. Uh, it's six coordinate, so EG above the T2G by 10 dQ. But now you have this strong oxo uh, iron bond at 1.65 angstroms, which means you have a strong sigma bonding interaction of an oxygen PZ with the DZ squared orbital. And you have strong oxo pi PXY perpendicular to the oxo iron bond, pi bonding, anti-bonding interactions with the D pi X E Y Z D orbitals on the metal. Okay, and so uh, you now take an iron four with four D electrons, spin a one, it gets you this configuration. And so the low lying frontier molecular orbital on the spin of one surface available for reactivity is this pi star FMO. And so we wanted to look at it experimentally and see the nature of the frontier molecular orbital from spectroscopy. And so we did this by looking at the transition, transition of this non-bonding electron from the DXY orbital into the D pi star um, FMO. So this is a DD transition. And if you look at the low energy region of the absorption spectrum of this complex, there is DD bands, but not very much information. Uh, here, but the MCD is rich in information and we find there's actually three overlapping transitions contributing to this absorption feature, which are revealed by the temperature dependence of the MCD data at high field. Uh, I've labeled bands one, two, three. So let's start with band three. So at low temperature, which is in blue, there's very little in MCD intensity in band three, but as you increase the temperature up to 20 K, which is red, the intensity goes up, but as you keep increasing it to 80 K, it comes back down again. That's very different than what we see with band one, which is a broad positive feature, which at low temperature in blue is very intense. And now when you increase the temperature, the intensity goes down with increasing temperature. So what these polarization uh, differences reflect are the different, this temperature dependence of the MCD differences reflect the polarization differences of these transitions. And so we're able to do polarized single crystal type spectroscopy on a randomly oriented frozen model complex. Um, and that brings me to band two which is this sharp negative stuff overlapping the broad positive feature, which start weak, get intense as you go up in temperature and then come down again in intensity. So we can assign them as the lowest energy XY polarized transition, which is the one we're after, where you excite an electron out of the non-bonding and into this pi star FMO. And what this structure is, is vibronic structure, it's in the iron oxo bond. And it shows us how the, experimentally, 
emphasize that, shows us how the iron oxygen bond changes when we put a non-bonding electron into this pi star FMO. So I've pulled the band out and plotted as a positive uh, transition, which you're used to looking at. And so what you're seeing here is a transition from a ground to an excited state where you excite the electron up to this pi star orbital. And you're seeing a vibronic a progression in the iron oxo stretch in the excited state. And the spacing is 610 wave numbers, which is a lot weaker than in the ground state where the iron O stretch is 830 wave numbers. And associated with this much weaker iron oxo bomb when we put an electron into the pi star orbital, we can do an analysis of this intensity pattern in the Frank Condon progression uh, to find that the iron oxo bond elongates by 0.14 of an angstrom, uh, leading to this large decrease in the iron oxo stretching frequency. So what we're seeing is this very strong pi antibonding interaction of these d orbitals with the oxo pi orbitals. And that means we get a lot, we are seeing experimentally a lot of oxo pi character in these d orbitals, activating them for overlap and hence reactivity with a substrate perpendicular. That's a key point here, perpendicular to the oxo iron bond on the S of one surface. Okay, now let's go from an S of one to an S of two quintet system. So in spin unrestricted density functional theory, we're taking a beta electron out of the dxy orbital and putting it into alpha dx squared minus y squared orbital. So the whole alpha manifold comes down in energy because we have increased exchange interaction and that leads to a dz squared luma which is the frontier molecular orbital in the s of two case for reactivity with pz character along the oxo iron bond <clears throat> however i now want to show you that also in the s of two case we have a pi star fmo available for reactivity perpendicular to the oxo iron bond and this is going to be important in selectivity Okay, and we saw this from additional model spectroscopy studies we did on a quintet iron oxo uh, complex, this TMG trend complex of Larry K's. It's trigonal bipyramidal. It's got a DZ squared frontier molecular orbital, which again is activated along the oxo iron bond. But with a promotion energy, we can do a D pi to D sigma ligand field transition, which now opens up a pi star FMO activated for reactivity, overlap and reactivity perpendicular to the oxo iron bond. And we can see this transition experimentally from correlating the absorption spectrum with the low temperature MCD spectrum again. So at low energy, this is very weak band and absorption. Notice it's blown up by more than 300. Uh, and associated with that is a relatively intense MCD feature where the intensity of the MCD relative to the absorption, this derivative shape, the temperature dependence of the MCD and the vibronic structure in the iron oxo bond all rigorously assigns this as the D pi to D sigma uh, transition to a D pi FMO. Um, and importantly, the structure enables us to take this all over, got to get the pictures out of my screen, sorry for a second. Um, anyway, you all can see it if I can't, but you should see vibronic structure down here, uh, which is a, um, let me, let me just go to a pointer, can't see my slide. Yeah, so this, so in MCD, you can see this iron oxo vibronic structure, which is the D pi star FMO. It's about 12,000 wave numbers, which is 34 kcals per mole, but that's in the ground state. As you elongate the iron four oxo to get to the transition state for reactivity of H atom abstraction, it goes down below to this promotion energy for this transition goes below seven K cows per mole. And we also find the pi star FMO is much more polarized with basically 80% oxial character um, activating it for reactivity. And so this combination of a low promotion energy and a lot of oxyl character means the oxo pi is as reactive as the sigma FMO in reactivity. But the important point here is there's a different orientation dependence. The sigma star FMO is activated 
<clears throat> activator re for reactivity along the iron oxo bond, while the pi star FMO is activated for perpendicular reactivity to the iron oxo unit, which will now take to the uh, halogenase here B2. Okay, so this enzyme is an alpha ketoglutarate dependent enzyme that binds a halide, either chloride or bromide, to the iron. It reacts with oxygen to go to an iron oxo intermediate, which does H atom abstraction from a substrate. And in the case of the native substrate, L threonine, you get selective halogenation, while with non native substrates, you can get hydroxylation or halogenation or the mix, but native substrate, pure halogenation. Okay, so we managed to get really nice NRVS, nuclear resonance vibrational spectroscopic data on the iron oxo intermediate in CRB2 with both chloride bound, which is in green, and bromide bound, which is in red here. And I should say in nervous spectroscopy, we're using a synchrotron spring eight to do the nuclear Mossbauer transition at 14.4 keV. But with the synchrotron, we can scan up, up to a thousand wave numbers higher in energy and see vibrational side, bound, uh, side bands on the uh, nuclear transition. And from working up to data, what the nervous is showing us is the amount of iron motion, uh, the intensity is the amount of iron motion in a normal mode at a given vibrational energy. Okay, so we get this nice three peak pattern and one where the intensity shifts from the highest energy peak into the lowest energy peak when we go from chloride to bromide, which is a mass effect, but it's a mass effect shifting iron motion over the modes. Okay, and so we tried a number of possible structures for the CRB2 intermediate, and one reproduces the nervous state of the three peak pattern and the shift of intensity into the low energy mode. Uh, and that's this five coordinate structure it's trigonal bipyramidal, and it has the oxo iron along the effective C3 axis of the trigonal bipyramidal structure. And we got this by taking in now in the computer an alpha KG plus substrate bound five coordinate ferrocyte, reacting it with oxygen and getting this intermediate where the iron oxo is oriented perpendicular to the CH bond of the substrate. However, I've shown you that the iron oxo intermediate has this pi star FMO, which I'm visualizing here, low energy and available for H atom abstraction. It does it where the barrier consistent with the rate of H atom abstraction, and that gets us to a next intermediate here, which has the substrate radical you generate perpendicular to the hydroxy iron three uh, halide plane. And importantly, we can only get this type of structure with the iron oxo perpendicular to the CH bond of the substrate. And from this structure, we can rebound both halogenation and hydroxylation, which we've done on the next slide. Okay, uh, first hydroxylation is in red. It's fermodynamically more favored, as I've already mentioned, by about 12 kcals per mole. But the halogenation actually, which is in green here, actually has a lower barrier. And that's because it has a lower energy d pi orbital. This is now the frontier molecular orbitals for rebound, hydroxyl hydroxylation versus halogenation. The halogenation FMO, which is a d pi orbital along the allied iron bond, is four and a half kcals lower in energy than the d pi orbital oriented along the hydroxide iron bond for um, hydroxide rebound. Um, and uh, and this is a ligand field effect of the chloride versus the hydroxide, and a combination of this difference in front and in intrinsic barriers, along with the positioning of the radical relative to the FMO for overlap, leads to lower energy halogenation reaction coordinate. So the key point I want you to take from this is an iron oxo S of two intermediate can certainly do H atom abstraction along the oxo iron bond using the sigma star FMO, DZ squared, PZ sigma star, but the rebound can only do hydroxylation. The really nice thing about the iron oxo S of two uh, case is you have the, the ability to do H atom abstraction perpendicular to the oxo iron bond using the pi star FMO. And this is the, the mechanism of getting selectivity in this case, halogenation over the thermodynamically favored hydroxylation. And we're now taking this in a number of different directions. We're 
um, looking at the, uh, uh, how these FMOs lead to desaturation, the alpha ketoglutarate dependent enzymes. Also in the terrain, we want to see how you can react with a substrate that's very poorly oriented relative to the iron oxo bond that's formed in from the proxy terrain intermediate. Uh, we've also been taking these studies to the different non-cofactor dependent enzymes. Right now we're focusing on what controls extra versus intradial cleavage in the catechol dioxygenases. Um, we've also been taking these non-heme studies to heme studies, developing RICs, resonance and elastic X-ray scattering, to look at iron oxo intermediates in heme environments, which the spectroscopy we were talking about gets obscured by the porphyrin. Uh, we've been going from mononuclear to binuclear non-heme iron. We just had a study with Kiang on the nervous of intermediate Q and MMO. But what I want to finish my talk with today is the fact that we've been taking the same type of spectroscopy we've been developing for the enzyme systems, to, in, but in a site-selective way to look at metallozeolites that take methane to methanol. And you'll see how concepts from bioinorganic chemistry also come through nicely in metallozeolite catalysis. Okay, so we've looked at reduced ferrous sites in a series of different zeolites, and we find this high energy ligand field transition at 15,900 wave numbers is correlates with the presence of six membered silica rings containing two aluminum ions. And this band is important because we can correlate this experimentally with an empirical species called alpha iron which in the zeolite literature, alpha iron is activated by N2O to go to alpha oxygen. Indeed, this band goes into a new intermediate now with N2O. And then when you react alpha oxygen with methane, you go to methane, uh, methanol. And indeed, this is eliminated and methanol is produced. So we wanted to study these hot intermediates, alpha oxygen, alpha iron, in the presence of spectator iron sites. And we, want, we wanted to do this. We developed to do this by doing variable temperature, variable field, MCD, of the excited state of the intermediate to probe the ground state in the presence of other iron sites. Okay, and so from the VTVH MCD of alpha iron, um, without going through the details, it's mononuclear, it's got a quintet ground state, and it's got a positive fairly axial zero field splitting. And from correlating uh, these data with uh, KSPT2 calculations, we can assign it as a high spin ferrous in the square planar ligand field of fairly anionic oxygens because they bridge between alumina and silica ions in the six membered ring. The square planar high spin ferrous is really interesting MOS powers signal, which is in gray here, because it's high spin ferrous with a very small quadrupole splitting of 0.55 millimeters per second. Okay, this then uh, reacts with N2O with in a, what we've shown is an oxo transfer reaction, and we've trapped the intermediate in this to go to alpha oxygen. And red is its MOS power spectrum. So the low isomer shift says it's a feral intermediate, and we got NRVS data on this showing it has an extremely high iron oxo stretch. I can read this at 885 wave numbers. And finally, from variable temperature, variable field, MCD on alpha oxygen, it's got a quintet spin ground state. So oxo transfer to alpha iron, the square planar site gives you alpha oxygen, uh, the square pyramidal feral species with a quintet ground state. We then went to the computer and looked for the reactivity of this with methane. We find it has a very low barrier of only 4 kcals per mole, consistent with its ability to do uh, methane to methanol, 104 kcal per mole bond at room temperature. And this high reactivity, uh, we've shown, reflects an entatic state. Very important concept in bioinorganic chemistry, but now we're bringing it to a metallozeolite, where when we take this um, ferial, uh, square pyramidal ferrule species out of the zeolite. And if we geometry optimize it, the energy goes down and the structure distorts to have one of the uh, lattice oxygen go trans to the oxo. However, the zeolite constraint uh, precludes this distortion. It destabilizes the iron oxo, which leads to a strong OH bond and uh, contributing to the low barrier. And also the lack of a transaxial ligand gives a lot of oxyl iron free character in the FMO at the transition state, which is here. And it's only got 9% iron character, so a lot of oxyl. 
Okay, so finally, the last thing, and just about the right timing, is after you do H atom abstraction, you get a methyl radical and the spheric hydroxide. And so we've been using the zeolite lattice topology to control the outcome of the reaction. Okay, and so what we're going to do now is look at alpha oxygen, Mossbauer spectrum in black, the feral species, and we're going to look at its reaction with methane in two different zeolites. First one is called beta. It has these large 12 member ring channels for the zeolite. Uh, when you react this with methane, uh, the alpha oxygen goes to this red spectrum, which is all ferric. And if we go to low temperature and do magnetic Mossbauer, we have two equivalent high spin ferric species with similar spin Hamiltonian parameters. And more importantly, from resonance Raman, there are ferric hydroxide and a ferric methoxide species. So what's happening here in beta is after you do H atom abstraction in the 12 member channel, the methyl radical can escape. It's no barrier. It can do cage escape, react with another iron oxo and get the methoxide, which we see experimentally. And the key point here is in order to get this re-reduced for another reaction, you have to go to high temperature and heat at 700 degrees in a hydrogen atmosphere, which isn't the functional approach. Now let's contrast that to what we see with alpha oxygen. Again, the Mossbauer spectrum is in gray, uh, reacting with methane in Shabazite. Uh, where Shabazite has these pores with these eight member ring windows. Uh, and now if we react this with methane, we don't get to the broad ferric Mossbauer signal. Instead, we go back to alpha iron, which is a ferrous site capable of further turnover. And so the idea is in Shabazite, after you do the H atom extraction, there's a steric barrier of about five kcals per mole for the methyl radical to escape the cage. So in get, instead, uh, you get rebound hydroxylation to get to the methanol and an iron two uh, alpha iron site uh, capable of multiple turnovers, which we've also demonstrated experimentally. And I'll just say now our studies focus on taking these iron zeolites and trying to use them for methane abatement as uh, uh, from um, this uh, potent greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. Okay, so with that, I'm going to just acknowledge my present students doing the science, Jeff Babbitt, Story DeWeese, and Gus Braun. Jeff is doing intra versus extra diol dioxygenase. Dory's taking the um, iron oxo and the alpha KG enzymes and bringing it to the terran dependent enzymes where there's a big ligand difference. And Gus has been doing RICs on iron oxo and heme environments. Studies on the model were done with Larry K. The CRB2 protein came from the Krebs Bollinger group at Penn State. The metallozeolites uh, come from the cells Schoenheit group at Catholic University in, ben in Belgium. Um, the Ben Schneider figured out how to get uh, MCD and hot intermediates in these metallozeolites. He's just starting at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Hannah brought those studies to the uh, top <clears throat> topology studies of uh, beta and Shabazite that I mentioned. And Alex is uh, higher is now taking these studies to mononuclear versus binuclear copper sites, actually, where he's been showing as you change nuclearity you, uh, and the nuclearity can make a major contribution to the barrier for H atom abstraction. Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you about today. Thank you for your attention. All right, do we have any question on site first? Oh, here's Yuma actually has a question. So can you unmute on Zoom so that he can ask? I, I have a question from Osaka. Thank you very yep. much for your nice talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed your new journey to a solid catalyst field. And uh, I have a, a question. Uh, some catalyst people say uh, reactive species is iron three oxyl rather than yeah. uh, iron four oxide. But uh, yeah. based on your story, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're they're wrong. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, the data. Yeah, that's uh, there's just a lot of stuff in the literature. That's I, yes, that's because of a couple of EPR signals they see that mm -hmm. just don't correlate with the intermediate. Yeah, the ah. the yeah the the you know this is. It is an iron four oxo uh, species, but it is the, you know a quintet ground state, and the data we get, all of it is not this ferric oxyl stuff that you know. But there's a lot of 
we find them, you know, we, we, and the spectroscopy takes a long, that's a very good point. I mean, the spectroscopy mm -hmm. takes a long time to do, but once you've done it and sort and it has to be done site selectively because the problem with these zeolites is you got a whole range of different sites and you have to really mm -hmm. lock in on what signal correlates with reactivity. And until you go through that, there's a lot of proposals in the literature, but most of them really don't hold up. Okay. And uh, you know enzymatic system and the solid catalyst system both. Yes. So what can be the largest difference between those two? Yeah, that, well, an interesting question. I, there, I was trying to emphasize the similarities because, mm. you know, in, in bio and organic chemistry, we've come up, you know, we meaning the field has come up with this idea of an entatic state constraining the geometry on a metal site, activating it for reactivity. And also this idea of the protein cage preventing cage escape and enabling rebound. All of that we can do, we can do in the metallozeolites. Mm -hmm. So I want to emphasize that positive part, but I also want to emphasize the other side, which is the ligation is different. You have these you know, these bridging oxos, and, uh, you know, and it's important to have, you know, it's the alumina silica bridged oxos that are the ligands, which are really quite different than the carboxylate and histidine ligands we get in enzyme systems. And then right now we're trying to understand how those relate actually to the porphyrin ligands that you get in heme type of chemistry. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. That was very insightful, this question. The time is over, so Ed, you know, we'll let you go. And we're going to move to the second speaker. So please thank uh, Professor Solomon one more time. <laughs> Our next speaker is on site here. Uh, we have Professor Carl Brand. Uh, Professor Carl Brand studied her independent career in 1997 at University of Rochester. She's been a full professor since 2008, and also she's been Richard Eisenberg professor since 2021. Now she's serving as a, a chair of the department. She's also fellow of uh, American Association for the Advance of Science, and also she's an associate editor of JAX, and she also got numerous awards, so you can also look it up in the uh, uh, abstract book. Uh, please welcome Professor Carl Brand. All right, uh, let me see how this is working. All right, so thank you so much, Ki Young, for the introduction, and I want to thank SJ and uh, Wanu and Mihi for their efforts in organizing the symposium. It's really great to get back together again. It feels like a family reunion. I'm just so happy to, to be here and see all of you. Uh, so I'm going to be telling you about uh, some of my group's work in uh, developing um, artificial enzyme systems um, for reactions related to energy. All right. And, um, oops, okay, I got spotlight. Um, all right, so <laughs> uh, the, the systems that we're working with here um, are um, small, Thank you. Small biological catalysts that we're developing in order to take substrates and turn them into fuels. And an ultimate goal of this is to develop systems for artificial photosynthesis. So in this work, what we're doing is we are taking uh, um, photosensitizers, so uh, groups that will ab uh, absorb light, go into an excited state, and then transfer an electron to our catalyst. Um, and then um, the catalyst will take our substrate to a fuel. And then we also need some kind of electron donor for the system. So um, in our work, we are inspired by nature's systems for doing this kind of chemistry. So we look at, um, yeah, oh, there we go. I think I'm just figuring this out. All right. Um, so we have, um, uh, for example, photosystem two, which takes water, takes it to oxygen, and provides electrons and protons. So the you know, key role of photosystem two is really to provide those electrons that are needed in, um, in, in these reactions. And then, um, you know, in terms of fuel production, we also have um, hydrogenase and, um, and CO2 reducing enzyme CODH. So in our work, we're not trying to mimic the structure or active sites of these systems, but instead try to mimic their chemistry with relatively simple biomolecules. And our goals include doing this work in water and understanding the reaction in water, in particular thinking about proton transfer steps and how they occur in aqueous environment. 
All right, so I'm going to walk you through a few different examples of some of our chemistry um, using different catalysts and some different photosensitizers um, for this uh, chemistry. So our catalysts are, as I said, are not um, directly inspired by the uh, structure of the enzymes, but instead actually are inspired by the structure of some synthetic catalysts that have been known for some time to do proton reduction and also CO2 reduction. So, you know, for uh, decades we've known that cobalt porphyrins and other cobalt N4 and N5 systems are capable of, um, of catalytic proton reduction, as an example. And so we're just taking these kind of motifs now and putting them into a biomolecular environment, which gives us the opportunity to tune second sphere interactions um, and, and um, also um, gives us systems that are reliably soluble in water. All right, so first I will talk about some of our catalysts for proton reduction to H2. And the interest in this, of course, is that hydrogen is an energy-dense, carbon-free fuel. Um, but right now, um, nearly all hydrogen is made by steam reforming methane. So if you purchase hydrogen and put it into your hydrogen fuel cell car, you're, effective, you're still using a fossil fuel because that came from a fossil fuel. So we want to get hydrogen from aqueous protons instead. So as I said, our chemistry is inspired um, by nature's enzymes. Um, so one thing that we like to think about is how the proton actually gets to the catalyst. So in the enzymes, this is a little bit complicated because our active sites are buried. And so we need to think about um, moving the proton through the protein and then ultimately to a proton shuttling site um, right near the active site which I'm pointing out here. So in the, um, for example, in the di-iron hydrogenases, it's well known that that bridging ligand is critical for delivering that proton to the active site. And the positioning and presumably the pKa of that are important in um, generating the uh, remarkable efficiency and speed of this, of this enzyme. Okay. All right, so I'll show you how we're thinking about that concept with some of our catalysts. Uh, the first one is one that we developed and first reported in 2014. Um, and this is actually, a, an, an, again, a goal, an old bioinorganic motif. This is a cobalt MP11, so cobalt microperoxidase 11. So this is a proteolytic fragment of horsetochrome C, where we isolate an 11 merpeptide covalently attached to a porphyrin. Uh, we remove then the iron and replace it with cobalt, and that gives us a nice proton reduction catalyst. So um, we've been studying the system first electrochemically, so not thinking about light-driven chemistry, but just taking that, that last part of our system and the, the, delivering the electrons from the electrode. Um, so um, this system has been really nice for mechanistic studies, and one thing that we've been learning is the effect, again, of the proton donor on the reaction. So in these electrochemical um, studies here, um, I'm showing you our catalytic waves, so we don't get the kind of duck-shaped voltammograms you may be used to, but instead we have these irreversible processes which are um, indicative of catalysis. And the main properties of these to pay attention to are so the, the, the height of them, uh, the current, and that reflects uh, the rate of the reaction. And then also the position or the potential of these catalytic waves reflects a number of different properties um, of the reaction. So first thing you'll notice is, so here we're uh, uh, looking at our catalysis as a function of the pKa of the buffer. And we're doing this, though, all at a constant pH. So in these CV experiments, we make a very small amount of hydrogen, so we're not changing the bulk pH of the solution. And you'll see as we increase the pKa of the buffer, we get a fairly monotonic decrease in our catalytic current. So this is reflecting a slower reaction, even though we're at constant solution pH, as we decrease, as we increase that pKa of that donor. So that's reflecting that, that uh, pKa of that donor um, is having a, a direct effect on the rate of the reaction. The other factor that, that we've seen is we see shifts in the catalytic um, uh, potential of these systems. So we see two different things. So when we're working with relatively acidic buffers, we get a shift of the peak as we go to uh, more basic buffers. But then once we get beyond about pH, uh, pKa 7.5, sorry, pKa 7.5, we then no longer get a shift. So um, we shift our, our catalytic potential here for only the low pKa buffers. And what that tells us about the mechanism is that um, catalysis is fast. So this is a, called a kinetic shift of our voltammogram. So we're, we're consuming the protons very rapidly at the electrode as fast as the um, buffer acid diffuses to the electrode. And that gives you this, this shift. And what this suggests is that 
our first protonation step. So we are presuming we start with cobalt-2. We reduce it then to cobalt-1, and then we transfer a proton rapidly from the buffer. And that consumption of that is very fast. And so that means that the rate determining step is some, somewhere later in the reaction. But now when we go to the higher pKa buffers, we no longer have that kinetic shift. Instead, our reaction remains pinned at a particular potential, which you've assigned to the formal cobalt-2 to cobalt-1 potential. And so now what that means is that the transfer of the proton from that buffer acid is rate-limiting in the reaction. And so um, this, of course, makes sense logically that as we have a more basic uh, buffer, it's going to be more challenging to transfer that proton. And now the catalysis is, rate, is limited um, by that step. And so again, this really sort of reflects, looking back at the enzyme, the importance of that proton donor. Um, so we're not really positioning ours, we're relying on diffusion, but we're seeing how the pKa of that donor has a direct effect on the rate determining step of the reaction. All right, so the next catalyst that I want to uh, talk about is a, a mimochrome catalyst. So mimochrome stands for the mimic of a cytochrome. And these are synthetic mini protein catalysts that my collaborator Angela Lombardi makes. So this particular mimochrome consists of a cobalt deuteroporphyrin with two covalently attached peptides. So you get a, um, a distal, and so you have a proximal peptide on the bottom and then a distal on the top. And, um, the uh, proximal peptide provides an axial histidine, and the uh, pro uh, distal peptide just covers the top of the, uh, of the porphyrin. So it's, in a way, it's a nice comparison to the cobalt MP11, which has just that proximal peptide with that axial histidine. So here we can think about what happens now if we have some sort of structure over the other side of the porphyrin. And what we see is we get very different dependence on our buffer acid. So again, here we're doing these experiments all at a constant pH, but we're collecting our voltammograms over a range of pKa's of our buffer acids. And you'll see I'm you know, showing just a few examples here as we're going um, up in our pKa of our, of our acid here, we're getting a very large shift to negative potential. Now, if we do like we did with the cobalt MP11 and we plot our catalytic current as a function of our, um, our pKa, we don't really have any clear dependence. And so this is quite different from the other system where we saw that um, uh, decrease in rate as we increase the pKa. So what's going on? What's different with this system? So our, this and other analyses that are detailed in our paper I have here indicate that there's some step prior to that initial proton transfer that rim, limits the rate of the reaction. And what we believe that it is, is that in order to get efficient catalysis, we need to have contact between the acid and the active site of our, of our um, catalyst, and that top peptide needs to somehow loosen or open up in order to allow that proton donor um, to interact. So in order to test that hypothesis, um, we wanted to look at the effects of sterics of our proton donor on the reaction. And so we made a series of proton donors. I'm showing just a few of them here. So 1 and 1A um, are, are pipirazine uh, and pipirazine uh, uh, bisterbutyl. And then we have a, a series of morphylene derivatives. So these have similar pKa's to each other within each family, but increases in steric bulk. And when we collect our CVs of these, so on here is the pipirazine and the, and the derivative, you see that we get a big decrease in our catalytic current um, as we increase that bulk. And then similarly with the morpholine derivatives, we get a significant de decrease in our current as we make these more bulky. So this supports that hypothesis that the structure of the proton donor in this case is critical for determining the rate of the reaction. So the fact that we don't have that kinetic shift in the system, but we instead have a different earlier rate determining step also meant that we could analyze the effect of the pKa um, of, our, uh, of our donor on the reaction mechanism in a different way. And what we saw is that when we have a relatively acidic proton donor, we have a uh, one electron, two proton process that we see in our electrochemistry. That's consistent with the reaction mechanism where we transfer one electron to make a, a cobalt-1 formally, and then two protons to protonate the cobalt-1 to make the hydride, and then protonate the hydride to release H2. But when we move then to more basic donors, we switch to a different mechanism where we start with cobalt-1, uh, cobalt-2, reduce to cobalt-1, make the hydride, and then we have to reduce that by one more electron in order to make the system competent for proton protonation and release of hydrogen. 
All right. So next I'll move to our more structurally much more simple catalyst, uh, cobalt GGH. So this is a cobalt peptide. It's a um, metal binding motif that's been known for a long time in bioinorganic chemistry. So it consists of a cis uh, of a um, his, uh, gly gly his motif that we can bind metals. And um, seeing that it has this cobalt N4 sort of structure, um, we reason that it might act as a catalyst for proton reduction. So we see similar, uh, well, related, but slightly different effects on the rate um, of the reaction um, by the proton donor. So that's detailed in this study. I'm not going to go over that in this, in this talk today. But instead, I want to talk about now intramolecular proton transfer. So this system is relatively easy to modify. We're putting in different amino acids into those gly gly um, positions allows us to install an internal proton donor. So for example, the cobalt lice lice his motif puts these um, protonated amines nearby. And we can see how that affects the rate of our reaction. So in blue is the cobalt lice lice his, and in black is the cobalt gly gly his, and you'll see that now looking at this reaction in water, we have a huge uh, increase in our catalytic rate just by installing those lysines. Um, so this is done in the absence of buffer. So now we've built in an internal proton donor. So we were concerned that maybe there was some sort of charge effect on this reaction. And so we also compared this to the trimethyl lysine derivative. So these, we're now installing these, um, these amines, which are uh, positively charged, but no longer can provide a proton. And what we see now is that remarkably, that trimethyl lysine derivative looks really just like the gly gly his in terms of its uh, catalytic activity. And so it's uh, quite strong evidence for um, that um, role of that internal proton shuttle and enhancing activity in the lyse derivative. All right, so now um, I introduced uh, the concept of artificial photosynthesis at the beginning. So now I want to go to talking a little bit about installing these catalysts into systems where we can take light energy and convert it into fuel. So um, sort of our hydrogen atom uh, system for, for doing photochemistry is, of course, Rubipi, a uh, well-known photosensitizer. So when you um, photoexcite Rubipi, it becomes a stronger oxidant and reductant than the ground state. Um, our mechanistic studies of these systems all show that the reductive quenching pathway is a productive pathway for making hydrogen in our full systems. So that means we make the photoexcited ruthenium-2, then transfer an electron from our sacrificial electron donor, ascorbic acid, to make a highly reducing ruthenium-1, which then can activate our, our catalysis. So if we um, combine our, uh, our donor, uh, Rubipi, and cobalt GGH in solution, for example, um, we get this system here where um, we get hydrogen produced over time. It, the system lasts for about one to two days and then it levels off. We get a turnover number of about 2,000, which is fine, it's not great. Um, but our question that we had is what limits the activity of the system? So what we did is after 48 hours when the system levels off well, we would add back in components of this multi-component system to see if we can recover activity. So if we add more catalysts at that point, we get no increase in activity. So that tells us the catalyst is not limiting the reaction. Some other component is. But instead, if we add rubipi and ascorbate, we then really recover most of our activity again. So our catalyst is lasting. It's really outlasting rubipi. So rubipi is the weak link in this reaction. And so that means that we really should be looking at uh, different, uh, more robust uh, photo, uh, photosensitizers for these systems. And so this is where we moved to collaborating with my colleague Todd Krauss to use semiconductor nanocrystals or quantum dots as uh, donors for these systems. So we use uh, cadmium selenide, um, which we then cap with ligands in order to make it water soluble. So often we'll use um, MPA or captopropionic acid, or we'll use um, peptides that contain thiols like glutathione. So these semiconductor nanocrystals, they're about two to three nanometers big. Um, the, uh, their band gap depends upon both their composition and their size because they're quantum confined. And so uh, Todd's group makes really nice monodisperse uh, samples of these nanocrystals that absorb green light. And that um, conduction band is of um, high enough energy, uh, low enough potential in order to activate our catalyst. So these uh, systems also have intrinsic photocatalytic activity. So I'm showing you here that the quantum dot itself, even without a co-catalyst, can reduce protons to H2. All right, so, and 
in this study here, we showed exactly that. So we showed that if we take either the glutathione or the MPA cap quantum dots, um, shine green light on them, we get, um, we get hydrogen produced with turnover numbers ranging from about you know, 35,000 to 80,000. So these are now getting to be much more active and long-lasting systems for hydrogen production. So where this gets back to really the inorganic chemistry and bioinorganic chemistry, is the effect of an added uh, cobalt salt. So if we just add cobalt chloride to these systems, we get this really nice increase in activity. And now, especially with the cobalt, with the glutathione capped quantum dots, we get turnover numbers now exceeding 100,000 and photon to H2 quantum yields um, nearly 30%, which is really excellent. So what's going on? What is the cobalt doing? This is just cobalt chloride. So we had three different hypotheses for what the cobalt could be doing. So either it could be um, exchanging um, into the, the nanocrystal itself and forming a catalytic site on the nanocrystal, or it could be associating with the ligands on the nanocrystal, or it could be associating with ligands that dissociate from the nanocrystal. So we know that the ligands on the nanocrystal are somewhat labile, they're coming on and off, and when in solution they could potentially bind our cobalt. So um, doing a lot of careful analytical work, um, we determined that there is no cobalt at all detected associated with the cadmium selenide quantum dots. All of the, the cobalt that we add is in solution. And so our hypothesis is that cobalt is combining with ligands that dissociate from the quantum dots to form in situ a catalyst that then acts as a co-catalyst with our, with our quantum dots. So what does this catalyst look like? And that is the million dollar question. So what I'm showing you here is really an artist's rendition of what these sort of systems could look like because um, all I can tell you about them is they're highly labile, they're highly heterogeneous, and they also seem to be multimeric and oligomeric. So we can run um, size exclusion columns on these systems. Um, so we'll combine cobalt and glutathione, run size exclusion columns, and anyone who's worked with these systems knows that the coordination chemistry of glutathione is incredibly complicated and poorly defined. So we see a whole mixture of things with different activities, and we don't know exactly what they look like, but the spectroscopy is consistent with cobalt sulfur bonds, and the analysis is, is consistent with making some sort of cluster structures. So you see here, I'm showing how we can recapitulate this activity um, ex situ by combining cobalt and either glutathione or MPA and then go back to doing electrochemistry and we get these nice catalytic waves. So this confirms that these cobalt uh, ligand complexes are active for hydrogen production. All right, so we've now sort of evolved our artificial photosynthesis system here where we have these highly stable, highly active um, quantum dots as a photosensitizer and these self-assembling cobalt uh, peptide and other cobalt complexes as our catalyst. All right, so I um, go back to where I started. Um, I said we're looking at many enzymes for production of fuels. And uh, my group's primarily been focusing on proton reduction, but we also have been starting to work on some CO2 reduction as well. And I want to show you some of our initial results in that area. Um, so a number of our different catalysts do CO2 reduction as well as proton reduction. And today I'm going to focus on the cobalt MP11 system. So if we now take cobalt MP11, we run CV just under N2, um, we get that, that blue catalytic wave that I'm pointing out there. If we now exchange the atmosphere for CO2, you see we get this big burst in current. So we're getting now more catalytic activity. And it turns out that's reflecting both CO2 reduction to CO and proton reduction to H2. Um, so how much are we getting of each? Oh, and the other thing I'm going to note is that if we go to a little bit less negative potential, we also get an enhancement of current. And that's very promising because that's suggesting that there might be potential dependent activity that we can use to help control this reaction. All right, so um, in order to determine what products we have, we run controlled potential electrolysis experiments. So we'll put our, our catalyst um, under the desired conditions, add a particular potential, apply that potential, in this case for two hours, and then measure the uh, products that we get by gas chromatography. And I'll walk you through these results here. So first off, if we run our catalysis at our lower potential, minus 1.4 volts, um, under N2, we get mostly hydrogen and we get a little CO. The reason we're getting CO is in these experiments we're working in bicarbonate buffer, so we have a little bit of CO2 being made in solution. If, though, now we exchange the atmosphere for CO2, as you might expect, we now make more CO 
um, relative to the amount of H2. Still not great selectivity, but we're sort of seeing what we expect here. If we now um, go back to N2 and run these experiments at minus 1.2 volts, um, we get just a very tiny amount of hydrogen, really nothing above background. And again, that's what we expect based on the CV. But if we go to one, minus 1.2 volts under CO2, we now get really nice selective production of CO. And that 4% hydrogen is, is really just a, a effectively background um, activity. So um, we have this case where we're actually going to less forcing conditions, less negative potential, we're able to get quite selective production um, of CO. The other thing I'm going to point out is that we see changes in turnover number as a function of our applied potential. So first of all, we get turnover numbers, um, 3,000 and other conditions I'm not showing today, even higher. We're getting up to 12,000 or so turnover numbers. Um, and we think the reason that our turnover number is higher um, under less negative potential is we have less catalyst degradation. So why do we get this potential dependent dependence of our um, selectivity. So this is our mechanism. This is our proposed mechanism. So again, I'll remind you that we've assigned the cobalt 2,1 formal potential to be at about minus 1.4 volts. So what we think is happening is at minus 1.4 volts, we can make that cobalt 1, and then either we can add CO2 to it, that's the upper mechanism, or we can protonate it to make the metal hydride. And that then is a route to making H2. At minus 1.2 volts, we don't go to a low enough potential to make that formal cobalt-1 species. So then what happens is we think that we have CO2 addition to our catalyst coupled to electron transfer. And so that initiates catalysis without going through a, a metal hydride. And that's what allows us to get selectivity for CO2 reduction over proton reduction under those particular conditions. All right, so to wrap up, um, I've shown you how um, intramolecular and intermolecular proton delivery to our catalyst affects mechanism rate determining step um, and the uh, overall activity. Um, I showed you how we have now a system where we use quantum dots as photosensitizers and a system where we uh, uh, generate spontaneously these uh, cobalt complexes in solution that are very active for hydrogen production. And then finally, um, some of our uh, most recent results on CO2 reduction, where we see this um, high selectivity for CO2 reduction to CO, um, but dependent upon potential. OK, so with that, I want to thank my wonderful group. So um, shown here are my six graduate students out for dinner. Um, I want to point out Jiwon Han, who is a graduate of IWA and now my, the senior member of my group, and she's doing the, the nice metallopeptide work that, that I presented. Um, and uh, Jiwon is also a, just a fantastic mentor and just a, a great leader of, of my lab. So we, we just we love having her. Um, and I also want to thank um, the other students that I've highlighted here, especially Jose Alvarez Hernandez and Emily Edwards, very recent alums who have really led our electrochemical and photochemical studies. Um, finally, with that, I want to thank you and, and all the, orga the organizers for putting together this symposium. Thank you. And now it's time for questions. Any questions on site? Uh, nice presentation. Um, I have a two quick questions. One is about the pep, uh, the cobalt complex uh, sandwich with the two peptides. Do you see, do you see uh, any uh, assistance of uh, distal ligands that facilitate the proton transfer from the buffer? Do I see? I'm sorry. Could you repeat? Uh, do you that? think the distal ligands, any of the amino acids on the top of the cobalt complexes might facilitate the proton transfer from the buffer? Yeah, that's a great question. So we don't have any um, candidates in that peptide that's relatively hydrophobic. Um, but you can imagine that we're certainly interested in trying to, to build that kind of a pathway in there. And if we're successful with that, then we should see reactivity that's quite different from what we see where we you know, have to have that opening to get that donor in. We want to be able to deliver it more like the actual, the real enzymes do. So, yeah. And the second question is, do you see any like magnetic coupling between the cobalt, uh, two cobalt complex, uh, cobalt ions 
with the good ion. No, so we really don't have much characterization of that because it's so heterogeneous. You know, we run columns on that. We just get this big streak with varying catalytic activities for all of the fractions. And so we, we can't get a pure sample of that. Um, we're going to see what we can do if we can do more analysis of that system to try to learn more about it. So that was really literally an artist sketch of what it could look like. <laughs> but um, yeah, if anyone has ideas of how we might characterize a messy system like that, I'm happy to hear it. <laughs> following, the question, following the question, so is that, you know, like the, the, the your sketch that you showed us, <laughs> oh, is it only like in situ formed or can you actually, so like do you need like the quantum dot to create that one or? No, so we can make it ex situ as well. And we, so we can just combine the, the ligand and the cobalt, and we will get uh, um, an active complex. Oh, I see. Yeah. Thank you. I have a quick question. Uh, nice talk, Connor. And a quick question about the last, talk, uh, last uh, section. The, uh, you have a, a negative 1.2 volt uh, uh, for the CO2 reduction, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, negative 1.4 is uh, that's the uh, cobalt to 2 on copper. Have you ever detected any cobalt to CO compound uh, of oh. your system that uh, does it reveal more positive uh, uh, 2 on copper? Um, uh, cobalt so do we to make, CO compound, right? Yeah, so are, are we making a CO derivative? Um, you know, not, not that we've detected, um, but we haven't really looked much for intermediates, but that's something we're interested in, in trying to do. But we do turn it over well, so, you know, if CO is binding, it's coming off again. <laughs> um, but, um, no, it, but it, it's a good point. That's certainly a, a possible um, state that we could be making. Yeah. Any question? Any question? from the Zoom group. I actually have one last question. <laughs> so like how can you like tell apart or can you or how can you actually detect when you have this electron transfer from the second side instead of actually undergoing the you know the reduction because you know your last mechanism to explain the this you know uh, specificity of the CO formation. Yeah so um you know, we haven't detected or trapped intermediates. That's just our best proposal mm -hmm. for how we can get that differentiation based on potential. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that that cobalt 2-1 potential is at minus 1.4, and we know then, you know, mm -hmm. at higher potentials than that we can't make that, that species. And so, um, you know, coupling electron transfer mm -hmm. to CO2 binding was sort of the only way we could think to, to get there. I see, I see. Yeah. Well, that was cool. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Then please, you know, let's thank Professor Carl one more time. Thank you. We are three minutes earlier for the last talk, but I can see Nicola is so ready, so we can move on. <laughs> Hi, Nikolai. Uh, the third speaker of the session is Professor Nikolai Leonard. Um, uh, he started his uh, independent career at University of Michigan in 2006, and since 2016, he's been full professor in the same university. Uh, so far, we have seen O2 activation, H2 reduction, and CO2 reduction, and the final talk is going to be about NO reduction. Right, so please welcome Professor uh, uh, Nikolai Leonard. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kiong, for the nice introduction. And of course, thank you uh, to the organizers for putting together such a fantastic symposium. It is really uh, sad that I was not able to make it uh, come in person uh, for logistic reasons. Uh, I wish I would be there. Um, but uh, anyways, I'm trying to do my best um, to give a, a good presentation over Zoom. So I will tell you about our ongoing efforts to study the reaction mechanism of flavor the ion nitric oxide reductases using synthetic model complexes. So here is a short overview of my presentation. So first I will tell you a little bit about nitric oxide and then of course the enzymes um, that we're interested in, flavor the ion nitric oxide reductases. Uh, and then uh, go towards our model chemistry work, especially I will first highlight the semi-reduced pathway of NO reduction, which we discovered. And then the most recent result that we just published is looking at the distortion of the uh, uh, dimeric ion NO core and how that affects NN coupling and N2O formation. Uh, 
and then I will conclude my presentation. So first of all, a little bit of nitric oxide, uh, a little bit about nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a very important signaling molecule in humans and in mammals. It's involved in uh, nerve signal transduction in the brain and also in the control of blood pressure, which is shown here in this cartoon, right? So here we see a slice through an artery and the smooth muscle tissue here is contracted. So the uh, diameter of the artery is small. And then as nitric oxide is released from these endothelial cells into the smooth muscle tissue, uh, the muscle tissue relaxes and you can see the artery is, is dilating and that lowers your blood pressure. Um, and because nitric oxide is a very toxic molecule, uh, our body is able to do all this signaling at very low nanomolar concentrations where you know, we can safely handle nitric oxide. But at the same time, our body also makes use of the, the genus phase of nitric oxide, its toxicity, and uses it for immune defense, right? So for example, like in this cartoon, this macrophage here is able to now produce and release micromolar concentrations of nitric oxide to kill invading pathogens. And so nitric oxide is a very important um, immune defense agent, as I've also stated here. Um, but just like with man-made antibiotics, over time, some pathogens have found a way to deal with nitric oxide toxicity and to develop a defense strategy against nitric oxide. And for this purpose, they use the so-called flavored ion proteins. So flavored ion proteins were first discovered um, for their ability to reduce oxygen to water, but not in a metabolic, but really in a purely protective or scavenger function. And they're found, for example, in microanaerobes, and they're able to uh, scrub the, the cells of these microanaerobic bacteria from residual dioxygen by reducing it to water. But then in 2002, uh, Gardner was studying E. coli cells, and he was you know, exposing these E. coli cells to nitric oxide, and he found that under those conditions, these bacteria started to produce a flavodyne protein that then would go on and protect them from nitric oxide by reducing nitric oxide to nitrous oxide which is, of course, the classic NO reductase reaction that is also very important in the nitrogen cycle, and that is something we're also very interested in, but I'm not going to talk about it, um, but I'm sure uh, one of the next speakers, Kyle Lancaster, will, will talk about the nitrogen cycle uh, plentiful, so I'll leave that up to him. Um, and so um, these flavored ion proteins then, in summary, are all able to either reduce dioxygen or nitric oxide, but they can do this with different abilities. So usually the enzymes that are better at reducing O2 are worse at reducing NO and so on. And the enzymes that are dedicated to NO reduction then we call the flavodiene and NO reductases. So here's a picture of um, the active site of one of these enzymes. You can see here is a non-heme diion core. Here are the iron centers, and you can better see the coordination environment of the ion centers if you look at this chem draw representation here. So you can see there's a symmetric core. We have two histidines per ion center, two terminal carboxylates. There is a bridging carboxylate here, and then there's also a bridging hydroxide ligand in the active site. And of course, the, the name giver you know, for this class of enzymes are, uh, is this flavin cofactor here that sits right next to the active site. And of course, one of the big questions is how this Flavin cofactor here could be involved in catalysis, right? It's only about five to six angstroms away to the diion core here where the actual action is happening. Okay, so let's take a look at the overall mechanistic scheme, how this all works. So the enzyme is active in the reduced diaphoros form of the active site. And in the first step of the reaction, we bind two molecules of NO, one to each ion center to form this uh, diion dinitrosyl intermediate. And um, this was particularly studied here in this, uh, in this seminal paper by Don Kurtz and his group, where they used rapid free quench experiments and they were able to show that this intermediate here is formed before any N2O can be detected. So it is clear that in that reaction, we're going through this dinitrosyl intermediate. And at this point, I also want to introduce the famous Enemark Felton notation. So as some of you might know, nitric oxide is first of all, you know, an iconic, non-innocent ligand that can exist in free redox states. And you know, when you look at the transition metal and no complex, it is not exactly clear what the oxidation state is of the anode, what's the electron distribution. And also NO is able to make uh, very covalent bonds to transition metal centers. And so one way to kind of get around this ambiguity is to use Enemark Feldheim notation as an electron counting scheme where we just consider the iron NO unit 
as one covalent unit and we just count the number of valence electrons of that unit, right? So if I take an ion two, I have 60 electrons, here I am, and I take an O, I have one electron in the pi star orbitals that gives me seven valence electrons for this species. So I'm gonna call this an FDN of seven. And then I can also distinguish the spin state. And so when we, when we are in the world of non-heme ion, then oftentimes we're dealing with high spin as the spin state. So these will be high spin FDN of seven complexes. You can also see I indicated an electronic structure or electron distribution here for these species. And so this, of course, highlights the fact that NO is a non-innocent ligand, and when it binds to a non heme ion center, these species can be best described as ion-free NO minus type complexes, which was actually first discovered by Ed in the 1990s, so about 30 years ago now at this point. I hate to say that. <laughs> in any case, so we are here now, and how do we continue? So there are different ways how this reaction now could work. One of them is that this species is already catalytically competent, Right, and is able now to induce an N bond formation, make N2O, and we end up with the diaphoric form of the active site, which can then be reduced back down by the flavin, and we go back to the diaphorous form, and we can turn over again. Now, this is the pathway that was proposed also in Don Kurtz's paper, but one interesting observation is there are a number of these model complexes around, and they tend to be stable, right? And they tend to not undergo this reaction. And in just a couple of minutes, I'll show you yet another compound that is stable, and it cannot do this direct coupling pathway. So certainly from a you know, chemistry point of view, we've always asked the question whether this is really the only way um, that could go. And um, considering you know, we have this redox active flavin right next to the active site, one alternative would be that that flavin actually has a more active role in catalysis by reducing this initially formed intermediate by either one electron, right? So now making this mixed valent FeNO8, FeNO7 species, or potentially two electrons making a dimer of FeNO8, and then that this species is activated. And then from here, we can turn back around, release N2O, and then ultimately go back to the diaphoric form of the enzyme and turn back over. And so there are still you know, questions in the field um, especially for the more dedicated and no reductases, what actually the mechanism is. What we've done, of course, we established this semi-reduced pathway as one possibility um, of how that reaction could go, and this is what I want to talk about next. So it's about 10 years ago that my group started to look at flavor the iron and no reductases and you know, looking at model complexes to, to study that reactivity. And oh yeah, I should say, Look at this, you know, I call this a reactivity landscape, right? The reactivity landscape of dinuclear non environment and know what are the reactions that we can do and under what conditions from pathways, what are the intermediates of the reactions and so on, are all interesting things to study here as well. So if you look at this complex here, you might recognize this ligand. This is, we call this the BPMP ligand. This is a classic ligand in non in, 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 uh, in bioorganic chemistry, it has been used to model the ion systems, the copper systems. People have used this for nickel, manganese coordination chemistry, you know, and so on. It's essentially the equivalent of the TPA ligand for mononuclear transition metal complexes. And of course, here we started um, using this, this ligand system now to look at the no chemistry. And inspired by the enzyme, we also installed this one uh, bridging carboxylate here, either propionate or acetate. And then we bind to molecules of NO, right? And we make this dinitrosyl intermediate. And as I alluded to you previously, this species is also stable and we can crystallize it. And here is the crystal structure. So we also do not see uh, NN coupling and N2O formation from this complex directly. One of the things that is really special about this complex is that the two ion NO units are exactly coplanar. So the two NOs are right next to each other. The dihedral angle between the, the nitrogen ion, ion nitrogen is only six degrees, and you can see the NN distance here through space is only 2.8 angstroms. So the two NOs, they're looking right at each other, but still they're not, they're not doing anything. And what we, of course, explored then is you know, the potential role of the flavin for reactivity. And so if you go on now and reduce this complex by either one or two equivalents of reductant, you can actually now uh, induce N2O formation. You can see if we add the reductant, it takes about 60 seconds and we get 100% of quantitative n formation. So we can activate these dinitrosyl uh, species by 
one electron reduction, one electron is actually enough to induce the reaction, and then we get NTO formation. We can also look at this by spectral electrochemistry. We can make a solution of the complex, put this in a thin layer cell, use a mesh electrode then to reduce the compound and take IR spectra at the same time. And you can see this is now the NO stretching band in IR spectroscopy. And as we reduce, you can see this band's going away. And at the same time, you can see the product of the reaction N2O coming up in the IR spectrum. And what I particularly want to point out here is that there are no other NO-containing products, no other NO-containing complexes formed in that reaction, right? So this model complex here is able to cleanly make 100% N2O and no other side products are formed in the reaction. We also wanted to know how fast that reaction really is. And uh, for this purpose, then, I ended up sending one of my students to Germany to Professor Frank Meyer's lab at the University of Göttingen because he has a stop flow IR experiment or set up. So we could perform stop flow IR experiments, but you can see the data didn't really work. So um, the data set here in black is the control experiment where we take a solution of the complex and just shoot it against the solvent blank take the IR spectrum and you can see here is again our you know, NO stretching peak in the IR spectrum. And then the next experiment, you take that solution again and now shoot it against a solution of one equivalent of cobaltocene. And the first spectrum that you get is the spectrum in red. So all the NO complex is gone, all the N2O is already made and nothing happens afterwards. So the dead time of that instrument is about 150 milliseconds. So the whole reaction is done in 150 milliseconds and we could not do any kinetics um, unfortunately, by doing the stop flow experiment. But what that, of course, means is, you know, if you want to reduce NO to N2O, this, what we call semi-reduced pathway, is a very, very efficient way to do that. You use the ion complex, you bind two NOs, you reduce by one electron, and you have a very fast and efficient reaction. That, of course, is independent now of the question whether the enzyme uses this mechanism or not, but it is a very efficient catalytic process. We also wanted to see if the reaction is intramolecular, right? So do we really couple the two NOs in one complex together to make N2O? Or is there, you know, are two complexes coming together to do that reaction? And the way you can test this is by isotope scrambling. So we uh, mixed one equivalent of unlabeled complex and one equivalent of complex where the NO is 15N labeled, right? And if the reaction happens intramolecularly, all you get is unlabeled N2O and fully 15N labeled N2O. However, if there is isotope scrambling, so it's a bimolecular reaction, you will see, you know, that the isotopes become scrambled. Here's a control, this is a control experiment that shows the IR spectra of N2O gas and a fully 15N labeled N2O gas as a control. And then if we do the reaction with this mixture here, we get this IR spectrum here. This exactly corresponds to an overlay of D2 species. So there is no isotope scrambling which means that this is an intramolecular reaction. And indeed, we couple the two NOs in that one complex together to make, to make N2O in, in this reaction. Okay, so finally then, we look at the um, reaction product, right? So if you follow this semi-reduced pathway, reduced by one electron, the product of that reaction should be a mixed valent ion 2 ion 3 dimer which should be antiferromagnetically coupled and give an S equals one half EPR spectrum. And lo and behold, we are able to see that as shown here. This is the spectrum and here are simulations of, of those data. One interesting aspect of this is if you, so you see this intermediate when you run the reaction at minus 80 Celsius, right? So even at minus 80, you still get NO coupling and N2O formation. So the barrier of the reaction is really low in agreement with this very fast rate. And you can observe this intermediate. If you run the reaction at room temperature, the product is EPR silent, which is that spectrum here in red. That is when you run the reaction at room temperature. Okay, so this gets us to the following mechanistic picture. So again, we start off with our dinitrosyl model complex. We add one equivalent of cobaltocene at low temperature at minus 80, and we can observe the direct product of uh, N2O formation, which is this mixed valent uh, dimer here which is EPR active. However, if we either heat up that solution or run the reaction at room temperature, we observe an EPR silent species. Right? And we think that this species is actually a tetramer. And there's some evidence for this from recent work from Amit Majumdar's work. 
And what he was able to do, he uses a similar ligand system, not exactly the same ligand system that we have, but it's very similar. And he was able to crystallize the reaction product. And the reaction product is a tetramer. So the way you can think about this is that in this dimer here, you open up the oxo bridge, and then the oxo bridge bridges to another dimer, and you get two dimers coming together. They are now bridged by these two oxos, and that gives overall a tetramer that is EPR silent. And we were able to study this using Majumdar's ligand system, and that was published in, in 2020. So we think that a similar a thing happens here, and this is the reason why we observe when the reactions via room temperature this EPR silent species. We tried to crystallize the species as well, but all we crystallized was this diaphorous complex here. So there's a further decomposition, which creates this very stable diaphorous complex, and then a, a ferric product that we did not further characterize. But we did much more spectroscopy to show that at the end, you have 50% iron-2 and 50% iron-3 in that reaction mixture. Um, however, it is, uh, you know, the, the initial product is decomposed, and we could not structurally characterize it. In our, in our system. Okay, so that gets us back to our in, initial mechanistic scheme. And what I showed you is that we, using this complex here, we were able to establish now the semi-reduced pathway as a very efficient pathway for NO reduction to N2O by, you know, inducing the reaction by one electron reduction. Just as a little side story, um, we were also able to actually tune our complex to activate this direct coupling pathway. And for this purpose, we introduced these phenolate donors into the, into the ligand sphere, making the iron centers much more electron rich and really um, shifting the redox potentials of the diion core much more negative. And if you do this, you can actually activate this direct anion coupling pathway and you can take the diaphoric complex and go directly to make N2O and the diaphoric product. However, in this complex, the redox potentials are much more negative than what is observed in the enzyme, right? So the enzyme is somewhere in between these two model complexes that we have prepared. We kind of bracketed the enzyme now so we can show with more positive redox potentials. We need one electron to induce the reaction. If we go to more negative redox potentials, we can do it directly. And there is still the interesting question, what happens right when you write in between? And that is one of the questions that we're in investigating right now. But I don't want to dwell on this too much because I want to talk more about semi-reduction here and go now to the more recent results that we just published earlier this year. So here's again, this is the original compound that I just presented to you, right? Where we have these two iron NO units in the cis configuration. They are, they're they're coplanar, they're looking directly at each other and the dihedral angle is only about six degrees and then distance is about 2.8 angstroms. Now, one of my students, Amy Spielman, you know, got creative in the lab and uh, she decided one day, you know, just not to add this bridging carboxylate ligand here into the preparation of the complex. She just methylated the ligand with iron triflate and added NO and crystallized this. And that crystal structure here is shown on the right where we now have two monodentate triflates bound. Each iron here carries one of these triflates. The interesting part about this is that the, the iron core is now distorted. So the two, um, Iron NO units are no longer coplanar. They are rotated away from each other by a dihedral angle of about 50 degrees. And that increases the NN distance to about three angstroms. So, you know, it is a distortion of the core, but it's a relatively moderate distortion. However, if you look at N2O yields now, of course, the original compound just makes N2O and nothing else. But with this complex now, we get varying amounts of N2O. If you do this in dichromethane, you get about 60% after five minutes and you get another product that forms in that reaction. And what that is, I will tell you in just a minute. But by just this kind of moderate core distortion, we have now opened up another reaction channel that does not lead directly to N2O production. So once we have this discovered, we went on and made three derivatives of this complex with monodentate ligands. We have the original one with the triflate bound. We made one with one methylamidazole bound, again, as a monodentate ligand, and we made one compound with methanol. And the nice thing is that these complexes are distinct by their NO stretching frequencies, as you can see in the IR here. So the triflate compound shows the NO stretch at 1800 wave numbers. Uh, with one methylamidazole, you get this more broad NO stretching peak here at about 1750, 1760, and the methanol complex is right in between, which is that spectrum in red. So now if you want to know, you know, what is the other product that we're making, we can go back to do spectroelectrochemistry or we can 
do reductive chemistry and monitor this by our spectroscopy. And here's just one data set as example. This was done on the one methylamidazole adduct. So as I showed you before, this complex has a rather broad endostretching band, which is this broad feature here in solution. Right? And then if we add one equivalent of cobaltocene, we can see there is some N2O formation here and we get two new peaks, one at 1788 and one at 1715. And if you add two equivalents of cobaltocene or you add one and then another one, doesn't matter, you get to that spectrum in green where you now have one band at 1689 and one at 1632. And if you do a lot of iron and chemistry, then you know the signature here. This is the signature of dinitrosyl ion complexes, where the red one is the FeNO29 and the green one is the FeNO10 product. And so the new product that we form when we distort the iron core is actually dinitrosyl ion complexes. The other interesting aspect is that as I mentioned, we made three different complexes, but no matter which complex you use, we always get exactly the same DNA. And that means that this ligand X is no longer bound to the iron center that carries the two NO ligands, right? So the DNA does not have that ligand X bound anymore at the end of the reaction, because it doesn't matter which complex you use, you get the same species at the end. Okay, so then we looked at this a little more closer to see how the yields of N2O actually vary you know, as a function of the conditions. This is a bunch of data, so let me just, you know, guide you through this. So this was done in a non coordinating solvent, dichloromethane. And then the column in blue is the yield of N2O after five minutes. And then the column in red is the N2O if, if yield if we wait two more hours. So when we add the reductant, the reaction, the reduction reaction is immediate, right? As you shake your, your cuvette, the reaction already happens. And then you get a burst of N2O in the beginning, and then you get formation of this DNA. So after you know, a couple of minutes, all the starting material is gone. You have made some N2O and you made your DNA. But what you can see in this data is that between five minutes and two hours, you're actually making more N2O. And so that means that the DNA is actually able to produce N2O. And this, if you're not familiar with the air, this is actually something that is really unexpected because mononuclear dinitrosyl ion complexes do not make any N2O. You can put them in solution and they do nothing, right? And so somehow the product that we're generating here is actually able then from a DNIC to couple them and make more N2O over time, but that reaction is much slower than the initial burst of N2O that we get. You can see it also depends on what the ligand identity of X is and with this one methylimidazole ligand, which gives the most distorted core, we get the smallest amount of N2O after five minutes. And then actually we also get less um, after two hours. This is what happens with one equivalent of cobaltocene added. If we add two equivalents of cobaltocene, we make the FeNO210 complex, right? And the 10 complex is more stable than the nine. And correspondingly, when you add two equivalents of reductant, you get less N2O made from this reaction, especially in the initial data here after uh, five minutes. If you go to a coordinating solvent like acetonitrile and you do all this chemistry in acetonitrile, then you can just generally see that N2O yields are suppressed, right? In a, in a coordinating solvent, especially when you make the FeNO210 DNIC, you can see now that N2O yields are actually below about 10%. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff going here, right? And so the question now is can we actually figure out what is going on? So here's our first kind of rough mechanistic proposal to just start thinking about what's going on, right? So again, we start with our FeNO2 dimer here, our dinitrosyl dion complex. We add one electron and we make this mixed valent FeNO7, FeNO8 intermediate. And this intermediate has never been observed no matter what we've done, no matter what complex we use, even at minus 80, this species is so reactive that it cannot be observed directly, right? And in our original compound, where we have the, uh, the cis orientation of the two NOs, we just make N2O and that's all that happens. But if we now start to distort the core, we open up this other reaction channel and we have a competition now where after the reduction, some complex goes on to make N2O and the majority of the complex actually goes on to make these uh, dinitrosyl ion complexes, either the FeNO29 or if we add another equivalent of reductant, we make the FeNO210. And you can see what I indicated here is a structure where um, if we don't, if we cannot do NN coupling and N2O formation, what we propose happens is that one of the NO ligands 
migrates from one of the ion centers over to the other one, such that we have the DNIC now on one ion center and that's tethered to this non-heme high spin ion two center that is held by the ligand in close proximity to that DNIC. And that will become important a little bit later. So this is the overall proposal, at least initially, for that type of species that we could form. You also note that um, the phenolate here we propose is no longer coordinated to the uh, DNIC center. And yeah, and um, I'll show you in a second some EPR data that, that um, show that this is in fact the case. So here's a little summary because we have a lot of reactivity data to kind of, you know, uh, sort through this a little bit. So um, we can see that when we have the coplanar complex with the two ion and your units um, in this coplanar orientation, we get no dinitrocyl ion complexes. When we do just a moderate distortion of the core, now we make uh, some N2O and mostly DNICs. We can look at a situation where the DNIC is most stable and the DNIC is most stable when we use a coordinating solvent and we use two equivalents of cobaltocene. And then if we look at the N2O units after five minutes, you can see they are pretty, pretty low. So in fact, with just that small core distortion, the dinitrosy ion complexes are the main products of the reaction and the N2O production is greatly suppressed in the system. And we can also correlate this with the core distortion. So um, the complex of the one methylaminazole ligands bound is more distorted than the one with the triflate. And we think that this means that uh, the, the complex with the triflate gets slightly more um, N2O than the, the one with one methylaminazole. But you can see this is a pretty small effect, right? This is uh, only a couple of percent. So it does not make that big uh, of a difference anymore. At this point, the complex with the methanol bound is a little bit of an outlier it makes more N2O than it should make. And we think that's because methanol is a protic ligand. We, of course, run these reactions uh, completely water-free, but by using methanol, we're introducing a proton donor back into the system. And so we think that um, the methanol here is a little bit of an outlier because it can, it can make more N2O than it should based on the core distortion that we see in that crystal structure. Okay, so here's the EPR data, right? We know that FeNO29 complexes have a spin of S equals one half, and they usually give a quite isotropic EPR signal that's around 2.02 to 2.04. And we see the same thing in our spectrum. And so that directly shows that in our product, the DNIC ion is no longer bridged to the high spin ion two center. So the spins are essentially independent of each other. And we just observed the regular EPR spectrum of this FeNO29 DNIC here. And this is also confirmed by DFT calculations. So if you look at the DFT predicted structures, you can see indeed that the computations also predict that the bridge to that central phenolate breaks once one of the NOs moves over from one ion to the other. So once we have the DNIC here, you can see that distance goes up to about four angstroms. And this is the FeNO29, this is the FeNO210. So they have about both the same structure. The FeNO29 is five coordinate. So the amino group here is coordinated to the ion and the FeNO210 is four coordinates. So the distance between the ion and this amino group now becomes pretty long. And this is essentially a four coordinate side. And this is also in agreement with the vibrational data. Okay, so that gets us now then to, you know, a little more refined mechanism. Um, so again, we have after the initial reduction, we have this kinetic competition where we can make some N2O, but it's only about 10%. And most of the complex actually forms this initial DNIC, where we can either make this FeNO29 or the FeNO210, depending on whether we add one or two equivalents of reductant. And again, we propose that in this case, we have this kind of structure here. We have a DNIC, and then we have this high spin ion 2 center tethered to it. And we think that this is the key, right? Why these DNICs now can go on and make more N2O. As I mentioned before, this is, a, this is a really unusual feature, right? Normally, mononuclear DNICs do not make any N2O when you have them in solution. And so we think what happens is that uh, when we have these complexes in solution, that there's an equilibrium now where the NO can actually move back to the other ion center, and you go back to these kinds of structures, and this will be an equilibrium. But in this structure here, of course, we can go and make a small amount of N2O, right? Most of it is in this equilibrium. And so over time, these complexes are able to make more N2O, but they utilize this tethered high spin ion 2 center in order to do that. That is the proposal here. And that, of course, explains some of our observations, right? For example, 
the FeNO210 is more stable than the FeNO29. Correspondingly, the FeNO210 makes less N2O over time than the FeNO29. And then second, when the NO ligand migrates back to the other ion center, you have to replace this ligand X. So if X is a more strongly coordinating ligand, or you do this in the presence of a coordinating solvent, again, this equilibrium shifts to the DNIC side, away from um, this uh, the ion dinitrosine side, and you make less N2O over time. And so we think that um, these experimental observations can be explained um, by the donor or the, the, you know, the, the, the strength of X as a ligand and also having coordinating solvent present and the redox state of the DNIC. So this is our overall mechanistic uh, proposal for what is going on. Now we thought about if there is another way we can further prove that, right? Is there another way we can show that we need this tethered system in order to now for the DNIC to go on and make more N2O? And if you go back and, or you can actually look at this. We look at the structure here, of course, our proposal was that the bridge, the phenolate bridge to the DNIC is broken, which means that the DNIC is only coordinated by two pyridines and an amine, right? And so if we go back and look at the ligands here, the DNIC is only coordinated to this arm here, right? So why not now make a ligand system where we just use this and make that DNIC and then look at the reactivity of this complex, right? So we went on and then made the corresponding NO complex, which is shown here. And this is the crystal structure of this complex. Um, the, you can see here is a triflate bound. Here's the, here's the NO ligand in this structure. Okay, so we went on then and um, took this complex and reduced this by adding half a equivalent of cobaltosine. And you can see you're forming this nice large DNIC signal here. And, and, and on top of this, there is no N2O formation at all. And what's also very interesting is if you look at the vibrational frequencies here, you know, that you get for this DNIC, 1789 and 1713, this is almost identical to the vibrational data that we get for the dimer. So that really proves that, you know, in these dimeric DNICs, it is really just the two pyridines and the amine that is bound to the DNIC and not other part of the ligand because you get exactly the same DNIC with this small ligand system here. Of course, the most important question is, in this case now, we have a DNIC and a high spent ion 2 that are no longer tethered together, right? Are they going to be able to make any N2O? And of course, the answer is no, they are not. And this is shown in, in these data here. So... Right, so we can take our mononuclear complex and we add half of an equivalent of reductant, which corresponds to taking the dimer and adding one equivalent of reductant. It gives you an FeNO7 and FeNO8. We do our disproportionation, we get the FeNO29, DNIC, and we get one equivalent, but now of a free high spin ion 2 complex in solution, right? In this case, they're no longer tethered together. These are two individual complexes and they don't make any N2O. You can see here, this is a control experiment. This is the nice fat N2O signal we get from this uh, dimer with methanol bound. And then when we do this reaction, you can see there's absolutely no N2O formed. Even over two hours, the yield is zero. Do this with two electrons. We do the two electron reduction. We get the FeNO10 DNIC. We get again, one equivalent of just three high spin iron two complex in solution. And again, there's absolutely no N2O formation in this case. And right? so again, as shown here. And so we think that this chemical model that we made, you know, provides further support for the idea that indeed with our dimeric complexes, we're making these types of DNIC here where we have a DNIC center that has tethered to it this high spin ion 2 center and that in this particular situation now, the DNICs are actually able to make more N2O over this longer period of time, which as I said again, is a very unusual reaction. Okay, so let's sum up. Uh, some of the things that I showed you, I showed you we have a functional model system for these flavored the ion nitric oxide reductases. And this complex is able to produce quantitative amounts of N2O upon one electron reduction, which we call the semi-reduced pathway. And this is a very fast and efficient pathway to make N2O. Interestingly, if you just distort the ion NO2 core just a little bit, right? So going from a dihedral angle of zero to about 45 degrees, 50 degrees, you completely shut down into all formation, goes down to about 10%, and you make mostly DNICs now in an alternative reaction pathway. And we think that this really highlights the importance, right, of this bridging carboxylate ligand in the active site of the enzyme. And all flavored ion and no reductases, all flavored ion proteins, the bridging carboxylate is always conserved. And with the bridging carboxylate, it forces the two NOs to bind right next to each other 
And that enables an uncoupling and end to all formation. And this could also be an interesting feature that distinguishes flavodiene proteins that are primarily oxygen reducing versus the one that are primarily NO reducing, right? Because if you want to reduce NO, you have to bind two diatomics and hold them next to each other. But if you want to reduce oxygen, you just need to bind one in a bridging fashion between the ion centers. And there's a lot more flexibility in the structure in order to accomplish that, in order to bind oxygen and reduce it to water. Whereas for NO reduction, we have this very strict geometric requirement in order for that reaction to occur. So this is one of the conclusions that we drew here. And then I showed you, we formed this very interesting new type of a DNIC, a dinuclear DNIC, where we have a DNIC that is tethered to a high-spin ion 2 center. And the unusual feature of this is that it's able to make N2O slowly over you know, two hours. But in, in, depending on the conditions, we can get up to 100% N2O. Right? In the non-coordinating solvents, with one electron reduction for the triflate complex or the methanol complex, it actually produces 100% N2O after two hours. And yeah, I already said this. And then finally, this is also, you know, if you think about this again in the context of biology, an interesting observation. There are a number of transcription factors that are used in bacteria that sense N NO and they use um, ion sulfur clusters to do this. They, to zero, they use two ion two sulfur clusters to sense NO and when they bind NO, they form DNIX. And this is something that uh, has been studied a lot. But what is not known is how do you actually go back? So when the NO concentration goes down, can you actually go back to the iron sulfur cluster? And how do you get rid of the NO? Because it's pretty strongly bound, right? And so we just speculate that maybe N2O elimination is one way how this could be accomplished and how you could get rid of the NO in such a system. But of course, this is a purely speculation. Okay, so finally, I don't want to waste any more time. Um, I want to thank, of course, all of my students that have done the work um, I showed to you today. These are all now uh, former group members for Corey White and Haidong. And then Amy Spielman was the one who had the idea to crystallize the compound without the bridging carboxylate. And that, that kind of sparked that whole you know, second half of my talk, that study that we did. I thank uh, the funding agencies. And of course, I thank you all for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. I'm glad that I gave Nikolai three additional minutes because it's already four minutes. Yay. But <laughs> we have many questions actually. So let me start with the, you know, the audience from the chat you know, window because they asked first. So Yuma, can you go ahead first? Uh, Professor Soromo also have a question. So. Oh, OK. Oh, I, I missed it. OK. Soromo, can you unmute your mute? Oh, yeah, Nikolai, really nice talk. I, I was wondering in the, in the flavodiene pro enzymes, if you remove the flavin, will they do an N coupling and give N2O off without the extra electron from the flavin? Yeah, so there's one study from also Kurtz's group where they deflavinated the protein and it still makes about 50, 60% N2O. It's just a little bit slower. So it definitely shows that the enzyme is able to do that reaction in that direct coupling pathway. But one of the questions is now, um, so they of course studied an enzyme that is not so good at NO reduction. And it's an advantage because it makes the kinetics slower, right? So they studied an enzyme that's primarily O2 reducing. So you can still ask the question what you know, happens in the, in the dedicated NO reductases, but the experimental evidence so far indicates that the enzymes are able to couple NO without using that extra electron from the flavor. Yeah, thank you, Nicola. Mm -hmm. And you, Ma? Hey, thank you. Be beautiful talk. So I know that you also study kappa ion chemistry, right? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit? But uh, that the case, uh, kappa case, uh, they generate N2O and NO2 minus as the uh, product of the reduction of NO. But uh, your iron case cleanly only generate N2O. What can be the secret <laughs> why iron can have such a selective process? So uh, in the copper case, what you see is actually uh, NO disproportionation. Yes, right? yes, so yes. Three yes. NOs go to one NO2 and one N2O, and mm. NO2 is super oxidizing, so it will oxidize the copper one to copper two and make that copper two nitride uh -huh. complex that you, that you observe and N2O. So when okay. you look at the uh -huh. chemistry, you always have to be mindful of the possibility of this disproportionation reaction. There are other metal centers that can do this as well, right? Um, but it also means um, if you, um, 
if you count the numbers of NOs that you have, you don't get 100% N2O, right? Because in our reaction, we take two NOs, and for two NOs, we get one N2O, and that's what we call 100%. But if you do this proportionation, mm -hmm. you don't get that yield, right? You only get two-thirds as the maximum yield. So you can look at the yield, but you should also characterize your product to see if you make any uh, nitrite in, in okay. the process. Okay. Um, uh, and so, clear answer. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So that's something to always keep in mind when you look at the, at the chemistry. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. And Sean, next. Okay, Nicole, I made a very nice talk. Okay, so uh, for the last mononuclear uh, demic, did you, did you try to study its reactivity under uh, methanol? Okay, so that's the first question. Okay, the second question is that, so what is the driving force or let's say the mechanism for the NN bond formation during the conversion of NL into N2O? So we did not study the DNIC in methanol. We used the solvents that we had used for the uh, N2O generation studies, which is dichromethane and acetonitrile, and we only used those. So we did not look at that DNIC in methanol, whether this could, you know, maybe activate it. I don't know. That that's an interesting question. We we maybe should look at that whether a, a protic solvent could could enhance reactivity there. Um, so that was the first part of your question. Does can you can you tell me the second part again? I'm sorry. Okay. So so you see the the, the conversion of NL into N2O through the NN bond coupling. Yeah. Right. So but I'm curious about what is the driving force and mechanism for this kind of NN, NN bond coupling. Does that go through like the radical coupling? Yeah, so essentially the, the way to think about this is that you have a radical type coupling because you have, you know, two triplet NO minuses bound, uh, one in each ion center. And, you know, especially in the ground state, they're antifermatically coupled. So you have one and uh, spin up, one spin down. They can just come together and make an NM an bond. And that's a reductive coupling in that sense. So you end up making hyponitrite. You have to make an NM bond and make hyponitrite as the first intermediate. And then from there, this rearranges and then ultimately releases N2O and makes this oxo bridge core. The driving force ultimately comes from actually making N2O. So there's a small barrier for NN coupling and make that hyponitrite. But then once you cleave off N2O, right, there's a huge then thermodynamic uh, uh, push down in energy. So that's where you gain all your energy is at the end when N2O is released and you make the oxo bridge um, diaphoric core. That's the thermodynamic driving force of the reaction. Now, one of the interesting things, of course, is that nobody has been able so far to observe any intermediate of the reaction. Mm. So all I'm telling you is computational, right? Because either for the enzyme or, or model complexes, you see the NO complex, you add an electron, you don't see any intermediate, you just see N2O being formed extremely quickly. Um, and I mean, Don Kurtz and his group, they tried really, really hard with, you know, rapid freeze quench and everything on the enzyme, but they cannot observe any intermediate either. So it's still, you know, experimentally, it is still an open question what these intermediates are. But the computations say it's kind of hyponitrite-like species. All right. Okay, thank you. Hello. Mm -hmm. ah, great, Nicola. It's a great talk. I really enjoyed it. I was just wondering, so for forming of the dinitrosyl compound, the mechanism, what happens if you do not have any anion? Can you get access to that interesting di diamond core structure that you reported in one of your Angevante Shemi? Because there you won't oh, have the anions, and then maybe the NO can actually do the double bridging, and there you can get, even for such a case, you should be able to get the NN coupling preferentially. So I was thinking maybe you should Yeah, that is some, a possible, yeah. Yeah, Maybe yeah. Some so non-coordinating um, anions like such bulky anions uh, that don't coordinate just neutralize the charge, and there you shouldn't get any prevention of your N2O formation. Yeah, we have not tried that. That's a very interesting idea. So the the diamond core gets trapped because once you dimerize, the spin goes to low spin, mm -hmm. and it only happens with this particular ligand, the TPA, right? And that's why why it's trapped. But that is an interesting idea, you know, the, the DNIC could in fact attack the other ion center and form this kind of bridge structure. That is a, an interesting mechanistic alternative. That maybe is also in agreement with the experimental data that again, it depends on how strong the X is coordinated and whether the solvent is coordinating or not, how fast you can make N2O because something has to go back and coordinate to that, uh, to that 
non-heme ion center. But yeah, you're right. You could also make this kind of bridging structure. A very good idea. We should go back and try that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, lady, the time is quite over, so I'm going to end this session. Thank you. Uh, let's thank Professor Nikolai Leonard one more time. And I'd like to thank, thank all three speakers of the first session of today. Uh, we're going to have only six minutes of the break. I'm sorry about that. We're going to come back at 11 and then start the second session of the today. Thank you. Thank you, Nikolai. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>
So it is the time, so we are going to resume the morning session. Uh, my name is Yoon Baek, um, and it is my great, great pleasure to MC the rest of the session today. Um, so our first speaker is Professor Kyle Lancaster at Cornell University. Professor Kyle did his PhD with Professor Harry Gray at Caltech. Um, and then he moved to Cornell University for his postdoctoral research um, and worked for Professor Serena De Beer. So he started his independent career uh, at Cornell University in 2012. So I think in about a month or so, it will be his 10th uh, uh, group birthday. So congrats in advance. Um, so please welcome Professor Kyle Lancaster. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I want to thank Wan Wu and Mihi and Sung Jae. This has been a fantastic symposium. I'm honored to be included. Uh, having a great time in Korea, and you might not be able to get rid of me. I'm, I'm loving it here way too much. Um, all right, so I'll just uh, dig in immediately here if I figure out this technical wizardry. Okay, so uh, what I want to start by doing is introducing you to nature's inorganic chemists. These are chemo chemolithoautotrophs. These are organisms that basically live off of inorganic chemistry. Their carbon comes from carbonate, and their fuel comes from ammonia. Right? And so they can be divided into bacterial and archaeal ammonia oxidizing organisms. So examples of the bacterial, so this is kind of like the Drosophila for people who study biological ammonia oxidation. And then we have two examples, an aquatic and a soil archaean, and these were discovered in about 2005. Uh, so Nikolai alluded to the fact that I would be talking about the nitrogen cycle. And here, Nikolai, you can't have the nitrogen cycle without your cow picture. Um, and so, of course, inorganic chemists have put a tremendous amount of effort, uh, research effort, um, into understanding how we can fix nitrogen to supply the nutrients necessary for life, right? And that's largely a solved pro problem thanks to the Haber-Bosch process. About half the nitrogen atoms in your body have been through a Haber-Bosch reactor, all right? Um, now, being that that's a solved problem, Yun Ho nicely set us up, uh, set me up to talk about uh, the unbalanced nitrogen checkbook. We have so much nitrogen fixed into the, in, perfect, now I'm mobile. Um, we have so much nitrogen uh, fixed in the environment that what used to be a limiting nutrient is no longer limiting, and so organisms like our heroes, the ammonia oxidizing organisms, uh, are no longer suffering from a, uh, a lack of this nutrition, and so they can proliferate quite widely. All right, so this food then, that we, or rather this nutrient that we take up into our bodies is the chemical fuel for the ammonia oxidizing organisms that I introduced previously. They convert ammonium or ammonia to nitride and nitrate, right? And then the denitrification pathway ideally will restore that back into the atmosphere as benign dinitrogen, though if things go haywire, it will be released as N2O, which is a, a greenhouse gas. Now, the ability of organisms to proliferate because of all of this nitrogen, this is a little difficult to control, I feel like I'm playing a computer game, um, all of this ammonia that's, that's made it into the environment leads to problems like eutrophication, which Yun Ho uh, uh, again introduced to us. Eutrophication basically is um, the widespread growth of organisms like uh, algae um, in, in, in aquatic systems. And so you can see this very macroscopic phenomenon in the Great Lakes. I also like this slide because almost nobody knows where I'm from. Uh, Ithaca, New York is at the southern tip of a much smaller lake called Cayuga Lake um, that I like to point out. It's a fantastically beautiful part of uh, the United States and we grow tremendous white wine. Okay, um, so eutrophication is, is, is quite a large uh, problem and again it's, it's promoted largely due to the fact that these ammonia oxidizing organisms take a molecule that uh, has a particularly long dwell time in soil and it converts it to oxyanions. And because soil has a partially negative charge, these oxyanions don't have particularly long dwell times and that's how they run off into these bodies of water. All right? And so we'd like to understand how these organisms are carrying on their, their biochemistry so that we could develop inhibitors, say, uh, for these processes and have um, more control over our nitrogen management. Okay? So what I'm going to do is first talk about 
what we've done initially in understanding ammonia oxidation, and I'll also show you um, that we can draw a line that had been hypothesized but not really pinpointed um, between this nitrification process at the beginning here, the ammonia oxidation, and the release of N2O directly. Uh, and so in order to do that, I need to introduce the nuts and bolts of the nitrification pathway. Uh, so this is a rather outdated picture at this point, but this is what my group started with 10 years ago when we started uh, investigating this primary metabolism. Right, so nitrification proceeds by the entry of ammonia or ammonium into the periplasm of these organisms where it is selectively hydroxylated to hydroxylamine by an integral membrane enzyme ammonia monooxygenase, which is a distant cousin of the particulate methane monooxygenase we heard about from Professor Chan last night. Um, this enzyme, this is a cartoon here, it's never been purified in an active form, and this is something that my group is very actively working on, uh, trying to obtain and, and understand. Right? But if this initial step, this initial step we could really consider the glycolysis before feeding the actual fuel into the nitrogen equivalent of the TCA cycle. That fuel is hydroxylamine, and that's what I'm going to be spending uh, the lion's share of my time talking about. Hydroxylamine is then uh, operated upon by an enzyme hydroxylamine acetoreductase, which carries out a multi-electron, multi-proton oxidation to yield reducing equivalents, some to turn over the ammonium monooxygenase, and only about two net electrons go into the respiratory electron transport chain to allow these organisms to live. All right. So the prevailing view was then that hydroxylamine is the enzyme solely responsible for directly oxidizing hydroxylamine to the stoichiometric product of this metabolism, which is, which is nitrite. All right. So four electrons out, two go back, two go forward. Right? And so this is um, an awful lot of work, and it doesn't yield a tremendous amount of uh, free energy. In fact, you get about 75% the free energy from the six electron oxidation of a nitrogen and ammonia uh, that you would get from the four electron oxidation of a single carbon and sugar. So there's a reason why we, we live off of carbon-based fuels, and these organisms are really taking, taking the hard road. Okay, uh, We distilled this picture down to why we as inorganic chemists really like this metabolism, why we find it fascinating. We've got a base metal and a green oxidant affecting a very challenging selective hydroxylation of the 107 kcal per mole NH bond. And then we've got a fuel here that is ex potentially explosive. It's a bit of a hot potato. It's a potent nucleophile. It's a toxic species. Nevertheless, these organisms are able to tame it and selectively withdraw energy using, again, a base metal catalyst um, to, to yield the, the, the final product. I also point out here just a bit of an advertisement for my group. One thing that we're also interested in is fleshing out the archaeal pathway. All of what I'm going to talk to you about today concerns the bacterial ammonia oxidation pathway, um, which, again, we still have work to do to, to understand, but the archaeal pathway after ammonia monooxygenase is, is largely a black box. And these pathways are entirely challenging for the reasons that I alluded to previously. These organisms are really struggling to survive. Despite the fact that they're everywhere, they take forever to grow, and they grow to very low cell densities. And so it's very slow going to obtain material from native biomass. All right, so I'm going to focus on the chemistry of hydroxylamine as mediated by this enzyme, hydroxylamine acetoreductase. So really, this is the power plant for these cells. Hydroxylamine acetoreductase is a pretty complicated enzyme. Right? It is a homotrimer of octaheme subunits, of which seven of these hemes are coordinatively saturated C-type hemes that mediate electron transfer. And the eighth heme per subunit is this very peculiar, post-translationally modified heme called a heme P460 center, so named because of the maximum of its array absorption in the reduced form. Right? So you'll notice that in addition to the canonical C heme thioether linkages, we also have this double cross link from a tyrosine, right? and we have this severely distorted, ruffled porphyrin. Right? This is the site of catalysis. This is a unique type of porphyrin in that pretty much every other porphyrin, um, or rather this is, this is unique in that most porphyrins carry out their chemistry by, say, either mediating electron transfer or activating dioxygen. Um, this, to my knowledge, is the only heme cofactor that oxidizes its directly iron-bound substrate, right, hydroxylamine. Now, the difficulty in studying hydroxylamine acetoreductase directly is that there is no recombinant expression system, despite um, 
efforts by my group and, and, and several others. Um, but also spectroscopically, even if you're using an element selective technique like X-ray absorption spectroscopy or iron 57 Mussbauer spectroscopy, you still have one catalytic center that you care about nestled among seven that you don't, um, and it makes it very difficult to, to, to pull, um, pull this needle out of the haystack. But conveniently for us, these organisms, these ammonia oxidizing bacteria, also constitutively express a mono P460 enzyme called cytochrome P460 that in early studies was reported to carry out the same reaction, that is to say, hydroxylamine oxidation to nitrite. Right? And conveniently for us, this organism can be recombinantly expressed, and its crosslink, which is different and we're going to spend some time talking about, it's a lysine rather than the tyrosine comes out when you recombinantly express the, the protein. So you don't need any chaperones or accessory proteins beyond the typical cytochrome C maturation cassette. So John Caranto, whose work we heard about a little bit from Nikolai, he studied the flavodiiron enzymes with, um, with, um, when he was a PhD student. Uh, he was a postdoc in my lab. He's now at Central Florida. Avery Vilbert was one of my first graduate students. They set out to use this more convenient system to understand how nature selectively withdraws energy from, from hydroxylamine. Right? It's also a very pretty enzyme. I don't know how well this shows up, but it's a nice, beautiful British racing green, which offers some variety from the typical red cytochromes that we see. Okay. Um, so for all of our efforts, uh, what we found is that we could never actually make nitrite. And so we were concerned that maybe this, uh, this, this protein was not a suitable proxy for us for studying hydroxylamine acetoreductase because conventional wisdom said that, well, again, this is the enzyme that oxidizes hydroxylamine to nitrite. What we found in our initial mechanistic studies is that we solely produced N2O. So in our early work, we found that the ferric form of the enzyme, which is the operative resting state, binds hydroxylamine to make a stable iron hydroxylamine adduct. That's somewhat unusual in that hydroxylamine and iron uh, typically undergo disproportionation reactions. All right. Three electrons and three protons later, you arrive at an FENO6. So Nikolai introduced us to the nmr feltum notation. We view this really as an iron 2 NO plus on the basis of the around 1900 reciprocal centimeter stretching frequency of the NO. And then this undergoes nucleophilic attack by hydroxylamine in a rate determining step to liberate N2O. We traverse a ferrous uh, intermediate, which we um, have some evidence that forms, and then that undergoes very rapid oxidation to close the cycle. And we can shunt directly from the iron 3 to the uh, FeNO6 using nitric oxide. Right, so that really hasn't helped us, however, understand how these organisms are producing energy for the life, because again, remember, that in the first place, we have to direct two electrons back to the ammonia monooxygenase to enable it to turn over and hydroxylate the ammonia in the first place, right? And so now, if we are consuming two equivalents of hydroxylamine, despite it being four electron chemistry, that's only two electrons per hydroxylamine. And so con consequently, this is a futile cycle as far as the energetics are concerned for the organism, right? And so we have a bit of a question then, how do we establish net electron flow to allow these organisms to actually survive, right? And so we address this by revisiting the original conditions under which this chemistry was studied, right? We carried out our reactions in the glove box thinking, well, we can't have O2 around because if O2 participates in this chemistry, we're short-circuiting the respiratory electron transport chain, right? And that's, that's not going to give us insight into how these organisms are establishing electron flow. But the early studies that were carried out with hydroxylamine acetoreductase and cytochrome P460 were not so careful, and they did not exclude dioxygen um, from their reaction conditions. And so indeed, if oxygen is around, now you see nitrite being formed, although it is never stoichiometric with respect to the input hydroxylamine. All right? And so to try to understand better what was going on, all right, we considered that, well, maybe what's happening is that we are stopping at the FENO6, and NO is dissociating then from the FeNO6, and NO is, of course, well known to react with dioxygen to produce nitrite. And so the nitrite that was observed in the cytochrome P460 studies may not have actually been the enzymatic product, but rather a consequence of having oxygen around in this sort of adventitious reaction. 
Okay? So sure enough, if we scavenge nitric oxide using some reagent like catalase that reacts with NO in a, rate, um, in a diffusion controlled manner, we can completely abolish the formation of nitrite, hinting that nitric oxide is really the enzymatic product um, for, for at least cytochrome P460. That then prompted us then to think, well, this is really how we can establish a net electron flow is if we get to this critical FeNO6 intermediate and instead of allowing a second equivalent of hydroxylamine to come in and form the NN bond, if that NO falls off, now we've pulled three electrons out of hydroxylamine that yields one net electron for electron flow. And so we have this sort of yin and yang view of hydroxylamine chemistry at P460 centers. Right? If we go around this cycle here, you produce fuel, you produce net reducing equivalents for the organism, um, but if you go all the way around this entire pathway, it's a futile cycle that perhaps is used to mitigate hydroxylamine or nitric and or nitric oxide toxicity, allowing you to bleed off N2O as a harmless byproduct. Right? And so when we revisited the chemistry then of hydroxylamine acetoreductase, we found that this was indeed the case. Hydroxylamine acetoreductase, despite 40, 50 years of claims otherwise, does not make nitrite from hydroxylamine. Nitric oxide is an obligate intermediate in the nitrification pathway. So in addition to all of the various other roles that Nikolai introduced us to for nitric oxide, it's also a very important and central energetic currency in the nitrogen cycle. It participates in denitrification. It participates in nitrification as an obligate intermediate. It is involved in anaerobic ammonia oxidation or anamox chemistry as well. And so that makes some sense. You could view this as kind of a currency among the organisms that manage nitrogen because they're not living in isolation. They're living in, micro in, in um, microbial consortia. And so perhaps under certain conditions when oxygen is limiting or when ammonia is limiting, nitric oxide can be shuttled around between these organisms to ensure that they're constantly able to, to thrive. All right. And so we revise this picture to now include nitric oxide as an obligate intermediate in the chemistry, all right, which to us is, is pretty interesting, but we still haven't figured out really at this point how is the selectivity being achieved, right? how um, do we differentiate between the chemistry of cytochrome P460, which again is not involved in primary metabolism, but hydroxylamine acetoreductase, which is, and how is the architecture of the cofactor purpose towards actually driving this chemistry? It also invites the question, well, how is the nitrite actually being formed? Because the second oxygen does not come from O2. That's established by stable isotope mass spectrometry. And so there must be another enzyme that's squeezing that last electron out um, for, for respiration. And we're actively pursuing that in my lab as well. Okay. So what I want to focus then in, on is the key energetic question, right? How are we able to control the oxidation of a pretty wild substrate like hydroxylamine? Um, so if anyone might be a rockumentary um, uh, fan, this is an image from, this is Spinal Tap showing the spontaneous combustion of one of their drummers, right? When we eat a bowl of Wheaties, when we eat our breakfast in the morning, of course, we're just burning it within our body, but we do it in a controlled fashion so we don't go up in flames. Likewise, these organisms must do the same with, with hydroxylamine. Right? So again, just some, some, some figures here. Um, hydroxylamine releases a tremendous amount of energy, and typically its reactions with iron are of the kaboom variety where we release a bunch of gaseous products. But here again, we're just making nitric oxide. So how is the organism achieving that selectivity? All right. So this is a more complete picture after another year or two of work from Avery Vilbert in my lab, which added another intermediate, this ferrous nitrocele or FeNO7 intermediate. And so what I'm going to do is take us around this cycle and point out at the various key steps how the enzyme, at least cytochrome P460, is managing to achieve this selectivity and control over this hot potato substrate and try to make some illusions or try to get some insight into HAO, which, again, we cannot mutate, we cannot recombinantly express, though hopefully sometime we'll be able to, maybe for the 20th anniversary of my lab. Okay, 
So in the first step, I mentioned to you that iron and hydroxylamine, the fate of, this, um, of, of, of their meeting is typically a disproportionation reaction. It's typically violent decomposition of hydroxylamine. But you can make this very stable, persistent ferric hydroxylamine adduct, right, um, that only upon introduction of oxidants will it start to uh, undergo this catalysis. So how is that then being controlled? How is proton transfer being managed? Is that gatekeeping this reaction? All right. So one of the things we learned very early on, because we like to tinker with our metalloenzymes, of course, and because we could do mutagenesis, the elephant that had always been staring, us in the room, staring at us in the room is the heme-lysine crosslink of cytochrome P460. It's a very peculiar modification, and we, we figured it must have some functional uh, significance. So easy enough, we can remove it, Initially, we made a lysine to tyrosine mutation because we were trying to recapitulate the double crosslink of hydroxylamine acetoreductase. And so instead, what we're doing is we're making lemonade out of our lemons here by studying a crosslink deficient variant of cytochrome P460. All right? And if we um, carry out our chemistry with the crosslink deficient form of the enzyme, we can't get it to oxidize hydroxylamine at all. Right? We can make all of the various intermediates directly. We can add hydroxylamine, and we'll make a ferric hydroxylamine adduct. We can add NO to the ferrous or ferric forms of the enzyme and make those various intermediates. But we cannot actually observe oxidation, redox chemistry. Right? And so in trying to think about what is uh, responsible for that, initially, given my spectroscopic background, we were very focused on the electronic structure of the cofactor and how that could be modulated by the presence of the crosslink, presence or absence of the crosslink. So here, just to compare for you, again, I mentioned that the wild-type enzyme with the crosslink is a green protein. It's got a red-shifted and uh, intensity-diminished uh, Soray absorption feature, right, compared to the crosslink-deficient form of the enzyme here in red, which resembles your more canonical C-type cytochrome. Right? It has a slightly more rhombic EPR in the wild-type form of the enzyme, presumably because you've broken the symmetry by introducing that crosslink. You also have a more feature-rich resonance Raman spectrum, again, because of the descent in, in, in symmetry from adding that, that crosslink. Right? So spectroscopically, they're, they're distinct. Right? But if we really focus in on the important stuff, like what's going on at the iron, the presence or absence of the crosslink doesn't seem to matter all that much. The Musbauer spectra are pretty much identical, implying that the electron density at the iron hasn't changed, and that's borne out if you measure the reduction potentials for the ferric-ferrous couple. They're very negative, again, presumably due to the highly ruffled nature of the heme, which relocalizes electron density uh, to the iron. But functionally, it doesn't appear that, despite those sort of cosmetic changes, that the electronic structure of the iron is, is considerably um, altered when the crosslink is absent. So maybe it's not an electronic effect um, that's, that's governing this difference in reactivity. All right. So the crosslink also does not appear to be what's responsible for the highly ruffled nature of the porphyrin. So again, just to reintroduce us to what ruffling is, in blue we have um, atoms that are coming out of the screen at you. In gray, they're going into the screen, kind of resembles a Pringles potato chip. Right? And that ruffling is important for stabilizing that critical FeNO6 intermediate because heme FeNO6s typically undergo auto-reduction in, in more planar porphyrins. But in highly ruffled systems, those species can indeed persist. Right? And so we can make a stable FeNO6 without the crosslink. So it doesn't appear that the crosslink is required for the ruffled porphyrin either. Okay? So in considering the electronics, in an early crystal structure of cytochrome P460 from Nitrosomonas europea, this carbon here that um, has the cross-linked uh, lysine was originally assigned as an sp3 hybridized carbon, implying that we don't have a dibasic porphyrin. Right? We he have either a monobasic isoporphyrin or a tribasic fluorin, and of course that could be influencing the chemistry. Um, but Megan Smith, who was another early graduate student in my group, obtained a very high-resolution crystal structure of a cytochrome P460 from a different nitrosomonas species. And she found that, indeed, this carbon is flat as a board. It is still sp2 hybridized. This is still a, a dibasic porphyrin. So, so much for that electronic argument. 
But Megan was very keenly observant. She, she made a, a, a great observation, which is, you know, she was testing this new species, so she, of course, wanted to look at its catalytic activity. And much to her surprise, she found that this P460, despite being spectroscopically identical and largely structurally identical to the Europia variant, also does not oxidize hydroxylamine. It will make all of the intermediates, but it won't do anything with that iron hydroxylamine addict. And she pinpointed the origin of that behavior to one simple change in the secondary coordination sphere. In the AL212 variant of P460, we have an alanine in place of what is normally a glutamate residue. Right? And thinking that that could be, of course, very important, this would be a, could potentially serve as a proton relay for that hydroxylamine redox chemistry, she replaced the alanine with the glutamate, and sure enough, now we have a hydroxylamine oxidizing enzyme once more. And this is really cool. I love to teach about this in my bio and organic class because we always emphasize that the cofactor oftentimes is not sufficient to drive the chemistry, despite the fact that nature has put so much effort into building beautiful things like the iron molybdenum cofactor. The peptide is, of course, very important for enforcing the secondary coordination sphere around the cofactor. So despite the fact that you have a structurally identical porphyrin cofactor that is spectroscopically identical to an active enzyme, you have a dead protein unless you have this proton relay. Okay? Um, and it cannot just simply be a hydrogen bonding interaction. It must, in fact, be an ionizable residue because if we put glutamine in this position, we don't get activity either. All right? So structurally, we know, of course, that this thing can, uh, can reach. So uh, this is a quite flexible residue, but it is within distance of, of the substrate. And this is a key observation as well because this points out to what the real role of the heme lysine crosslink is. Right? It's not a matter of of the electronic structure effects that it is, that is, it is imbuing on the cofactor, but it's really just real estate, location, 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 right? If we don't have that crosslink, this porphyrin relaxes away from that glutamate residue and tenths of an angstrom distance, unlike an electron transfer where that's not going to make a tremendous difference, those are life or death in proton transfer. And so if this porphyrin cofactor is not sufficiently close to that carboxylate, you don't get any redox chemistry. So that, um, that, that proton transfer event really gates the redox, and it, it um, applies very precise control to this chemistry in the enzyme. Right, so this structure of a cross-link deficient variant was from a very recent graduate. I should include that she's a PhD, Dr. Rachel Coleman. All right. um, so other sort of focus on the cofactor. So if the crosslink is not enforcing that ruffling and it's really there to position that porphyrin close to that proton relay, well, the other things that are important are other hydrogen bonding interactions which contort the porphyrin and imbue that um, very important ruffling to the cofactor that enables the stabilization of that, of that FENO6. Um, and also this is going to come up again because this ruffling is also key to installing the crosslink in the first place. All right. So, in addition to positioning the cofactor close to that proton relay, the crosslink has another kind of subtle but important role as well, which is that when we traverse this FENO7, it is six coordinate. There's an axial histidine that is trans to uh, the substrate position. And if that histidine dissociates and we make a five coordinate FENO7, the enzyme dies. Right? That species cannot be oxidized even with something as potent as hexachloroiridate, and that, that NO takes forever to dissociate. So we need, in driving this chemistry, to make sure that we don't fall into this sink, into this trap, when we undergo the chemistry. And what we found is that if we remove the crosslink, right, or rather if we have the crosslink in place and we make the FENO7, the loss of the axial histidine is quite slow, and the redox can outcompete it. However, if we lose that ax or if we lose the crosslink, and we make the FENO7, we very rapidly deactivate to the five-coordinate form of the enzyme. So the crosslink is really serving us, and I'll skip all of this I-ring analysis, but really just point out that this key role here 
that this lysine, in addition to localizing the porphyrin close to the proton relay, is also a shackle to ensure that this histidine remains coordinated so that we do not fall into that trap. Okay? Now, finally, I've made a big deal about this crosslink, but many are probably wondering, well, how does nature install this thing in the first place? It's a pretty unusual, it's a pretty unusual modification. Right? And so um, this has become a pretty, uh, I would say, active area of research because we're finding newer and stranger non-canonical modifications to, to hemes. Um, and so we thought we would throw our hat in the ring to try to understand how this one particular post-translational modification uh, comes about. Um, and this is one of those cases of, well, you have students who, some students who are much braver than others because I suggested, well, maybe, just maybe this is an oxygen-dependent uh, process, but nobody in my group wanted to uh, undergo the pain of an anaerobic growth of, of the protein, but I had an undergrad here, Silas Farrow, who was like, yeah, how bad can it be? He found out that it was pretty bad, but nevertheless, he went ahead and did it. And when we grow cytochrome P460 in the absence of oxygen, sure enough, we get cross-link deficient proenzyme. And later, what we found is that, well, you know, we figured it was oxygen dependent, and we tried oxygen, and it took forever. But really, we found that this is a peroxide dependent process. So we can completely mature the enzyme to active uh, to its active form by adding peroxide, all right? And we can restore all of the spectroscopic features. When we do this, it's a nice isosbestic conversion. And so here we just see that in the absence of the crosslink, we have almost no activity and we can restore it to, to wild type with the, with the peroxide. And so that begs the question, well, well, how does this actually work? And it brings us back to the ruffling distortion of the porphyrin. Right? Because if we have a ruffled porphyrin, we have these mesocarbons that are susceptible to oxidative damage. This is how heme oxygenase enzymes degrade porphyrin so that they can recycle the iron. Um, so here's our putative mechanism. What we wind up doing is we bind peroxide, and we're agnostic about whether this is a hydroperoxo or a peroxo at this point, but that that will oxidatively damage this meso position of the porphyrin, and we have structural precedent for this, in fact, that these positions can undergo hydroxylation um, from, from early crystal structures of the Europia variant of the P460 enzyme, right? And then this, of course, can tautomerize to a ketone form, which can then undergo condensation with the nearby lysine to forge the CN bond, and then down we go towards the matured enzyme, right? And so we're still working on this. This would have been a fun animation, but I'm using a PDF here. Um, what we find is that we can indeed identify this first intermediate of binding the um, peroxo species. It forms within about a second, right, before we mature to the enzyme. We have some initial rapid freeze quench EPR data, suggesting that this is not really best formulated as a ferric um, peroxo, but rather a ferrous superoxo based on, um, based on literature precedent and the G values that we obtain from the EPR. Right? And so we're working now on trying to understand you know, how the subsequent steps proceed, but one thing I will point out is that if we abolish the ruffling distortion by, um, by modifying that hydrogen bonding network that I had introduced previously, um, we wind up getting enzyme out of the protein, or out of the organism, out of E. coli, that does not have the cross-link formed, right? And so it appears that that distortion in, that is imposed by that hydrogen bonding network to the propionates is essential for enabling this cross-link to be, to be formed. So it has the functional significance of enabling the FENO6 to form and be stable, but it also allows nature to forge that cross-link which positions the porphyrin close enough to that proton relay. So there's, this enzyme really is engineered like a Swiss watch in terms of all of these various, various features. All right, one of the last things I'll, I'll point out, um, and a, a key question that we're working to, to answer that brings us back to the initial part of the talk is, well, this is not a metabolic enzyme, but hydroxylamine oxidoreductase is because it releases NO rather than forming the NN bond and releasing N2O. So what differentiates these, these two enzymes, right? Why does one release NO and one allows N2O to be made? 
So Melissa Ballmeyer in my group, she's been looking at other residues in the secondary coordination sphere. Right, there's a capping phenylalanine that is uh, pretty much 100% conserved in the cytochrome P460 family. And what Melissa has found, in addition to the fact that if you remove this phenylalanine, the enzyme comes out without the crosslink, and we're still trying to understand that. Um, but this really controls the rate-limiting step of the, uh, of the catalytic cycle. If you remove this phenylalanine, right, what we find is that in the presence of oxygen, removing that phenylalanine allows us to make far more N2O rather than nitrite. Right, so you could think, okay, well, it's sterically restricting access of that second equivalent of hydroxylamine uh, to the NO. But we think that opening up the active site is what is going to promote the release of, of NO from the enzyme. Right, and so, um, but what we found, interestingly enough, is that it changes the rate determining step of the, um, of the catalytic cycle from uh, NN bond formation to rather that initial oxidation of, of the hydroxylamine. So by opening up that cavity, it's pretty intuitive. You enable more access to hydroxylamine to react with, um, with the NO. So we thought initially that by opening up that cavity, you'd have more competition at the porphyrin from solvent with, with NO, but that doesn't seem to be sufficient um, to, to promote the dissociation of NO and enabling you to have the um, uh, net flow of electrons. Okay? So I'm not sure where I am in time. I'm, like many of us, out of practice with talks. I think this is the second one I've given live since COVID. Um, but I'll just point us out to, again, this idea that this enzyme is, is just a, a beautiful feat of nature's engineering in that you know, every feature here has a functional significance. The hydrogen bonding network of, this, of these propionates enable the, uh, or rather keep the reduction potential low so that the chemistry can proceed um, via ferric type intermediates. The ruffling enables the production of that critical FeNO6 intermediate and, and keeps it stable, allows you to actually liberate NO. The ruffling also promotes the formation of this crosslink, which is absolutely vital to ensuring that you have appropriate secondary coordination, or rather, this proton relay in proximity to the, to the metal center. Right? The lysine also keeps the heme from doing um, uh, this deleterious histidine dissociation that's, that would shut down, shut down catalysis. Right. And so finally, I'll just, again, I acknowledge the folks in my group um, who have done work on P460 over the years, but this is my current group. We're a motley crew of synthetic chemists, uh, at, in addition to biochemists and, and spectroscopists, and we're having a lot of fun with the nitrogen cycle. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your great talk, Kyle. Um, and for the audience in this room, if you have any questions, just please raise your hand. He was first. <laughs> Kyle, excellent talk. I was just wondering uh, about your iron 3 peroxo versus iron 2 superoxide assignment. So how exactly can you differentiate them? So basically, the G value that you see, is it a radical base? That's all you want to say? It's, a, I mean, it's basically again, a superoxide? Just, this is coming from literature on, on model compounds. Um, where the ferric peroxo assignment is made when you have a, a, a G high of around 2.2, right? And so the assignment of, of the superoxo is based on this, you know, closer to free electron value of 2.0. So you had that on 2.1, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. 2.08, so. yeah. 2.08. And that's enough to say that it's a, it's a low spin iron 2 coupled to a superoxide radical. Again, this is, this is based on literature precedent. I would actually okay. like to get some proper vibrational data and do things can you, right. Can you do a MOS power on that? Uh, no. no. So the problem is um, these experiments are painful because we get almost none of this protein when we do these anaerobic growths. Mm -hmm. All right, and so pretty much one growth is you know, one kinetics experiment, and so this has taken us a, a very long time. Now, I think actually, uh, let me change my answer. The answer is not no, it's no with the anaerobic wild type enzyme that we've been working with, but some of Melissa's mutants that come out partially or cross-link deficient, uh, even in aerobic growth conditions, we can make a lot of those, and so yeah, we'll attack this thing mm -hmm. um, and, and figure out by Musbauer, figure out by Resonance Raman, and of course, 
you know, O18 isotope yeah, labeling exactly, yeah. what a better assignment is. But very that, it's very tentative based on the EPR. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Hi, Cara. Hi, Kyle. Great talk. Um, is it the low potential of the P460 heme that's responsible for suppressing the hydroxylamine uh, disproportionation? Uh, I, th I think really it's just the fact that you've got a sterically protected iron hydroxylamine addict, right? Because that, that disproportionation is a bimolecular process, but now this thing's nestled inside a protein active site, and so we're okay. Um, that, that's, that's my thought. But also, again, not having anywhere for the protons to go appears to be very important as well because again if we make sorry if we make the ferric uh, rockstar if we make the ferric hydroxylamine adduct again in the absence of that proton relay you can't touch it with any oxidant so okay. it's a dead dead species All right and then also i was wondering that the uh propionate that uh reaches underneath and uh to the the uh, proximal histidine is yep. it positioned to hydrogen bond with it and does it give that some histidinate character or is it not positioned it's it's not okay. uh, i have a, a line drawn there but it's it's a pretty severe angle and you have to be very generous to call that a hydrogen bond right what the the true hydrogen bond is to that tyrosine that you might remember was there okay. um, so we've made variants where we've gotten rid of those interactions but I don't, I don't think that the interaction with the histidine is important. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, because of time, we are gonna just move on to the next speaker. Please thank Kyle one more time. So our next speaker is Professor Jason Schur at um, Trinity University. Um, so Professor Jason did his PhD uh, at the University of Washington, and he had worked for Professor Julie Kovacs. And after that, he moved to Johns Hopkins University and joined uh, Professor Ken Carlin's group. Uh, so he started his independent career in 2004 uh, at the University of Nevada, and recently uh, he moved to Trinity University in 2018. So please welcome Professor Jason. Okay, um, so thank you to all the organizers. This has been a fantastic and fun few days, and I'm looking forward to uh, some more fun coming up. Um, but. Let's move on and talk about, <laughs> okay, Let, let's move on and talk about um, Nickel SOD. So um, before I go on, I'm going to thank the people who have done work on this. So um, modeling work that you're going to see was performed by, um, whoa, by, wow, this is crazy, okay, by um, Brenna Keegan. Um, enzymatic work that you're going to see at the end of the talk was performed by Katie, Daniel, Alex, Augie, Kate, all led by a po former postdoc, Abby, and some of the computational work that you're going to see was performed by Dovidas. So, um, probably don't need to go into extensive um, detail on the fact that superoxide is highly toxic. And because it's highly toxic, organisms have evolved pathways to degrade it before it can cause extensive cellular damage. Most commonly utilized are the superoxide dismutases. There are five classes, the copper zinc, copper, manganese, iron, and nickel SOD, which contains nickel. Um, all of these enzymes disproportionate superoxide by using a redox active um, metal cofactor. Uh, so for example, copper, SOD will utilize a copper one and copper two redox couple to facilitate this disproportionation reaction. Nickel SOD um, is found primarily in aquatic bacteria. Um, it is found in solution as a homohexamer. Each monomer is a four alpha helical bundle with the nickel site found at the end terminus. All residues to nickel are found within this peptide binding loop here. Um, so let's see. Come on there. Whoa. Right there, that loop guy. Um, we're going to try to avoid using the laser pointer because I can't make it work. So um, in the reduced form, um, nickel is poised as a low spin nickel 2. Um, it's coordinated by the N-terminal amine, the amidate from cis-2, and sulfurs from cis-2 and cis-6. 
Upon oxidation to the nickel-3 form, the axial imidazole will associate with that nickel-3 center. Um, some of the key features of this nickel SOD active site involve these protonated coordinated cystinates. And this was known um, in the early 2000s by work done by Ed's group, um, where they noticed that in the um, sulfur K edge spectrum, the sulfur 1S to LUMO transition is blue shifted into the edge. And this is a characteristic feature of a protonated coordinated cystinate. Um, other characteristic features um, are a shortening of that nickel sulfur bond length upon protonation. We'll go into that. Um, and these are also quite basic sulfurs. The pKa's of these um, protons are in the range of about eight and a half up to as high as 10. What we've been interested in is whether or not these protonated coordinated cystinates have any role in nickel SOD catalysis, because you can think of a number of different roles that these might be playing. Um, these could be participating in proton coupled electron transfer pathways, proton transfer simply at do, participating in acid base chemistry, and these could also be fine tuning the electronic structure of that nickel site, poising this. Hold your position, thank you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, could also be priming this um, nickel site for reactivity. Um, my group has been actively involved in nickel SOD chemistry for a number of years now, and most of the work that we've been involved with is um, taking advantage of the fact that all of your coordinating residues found within the first six residues from the end terminus. So, we prepare these short peptides. These make um, uh, nickel-based metallopeptide mimics of the enzyme. Um, these can reproduce the physical and structural properties of nickel SOD. Um, these support uh, protonation of these coordinated cystinates. Um, and what we found is that this um, proton attached to that cystinate sulfur is intimately involved in the catalytic disproportionation mechanism of superoxide affected by these metallopeptides. So we've proposed that this is involved in a proton coupled electron transfer reaction where the superoxide will bind into this tight hydrogen bonding pocket. Um, a lot of kinetic studies, computational studies, theoretical analyses went into pinning down this mechanism, and unfortunately it has absolutely no relevance at all to the actual enzyme. Um, one of some key pieces of evidence that it's not involved in the enzymatic mechanism, first structurally superoxide can't access that part of the um, active site in the enzyme itself, and also the HDKIEs are cons inconsistent with that type of mechanism. So, we reasoned that we could construct metallopeptide-based mimics that might more accurately reproduce the actual structure of nickel SOD. Um, we prepared a large number of different metallopeptides. These all coordinate nickel in a coordination environment that's reminiscent of nickel SOD, and absolutely none of these new peptides are catalytically active. So they offer no advantage over the previous systems we've been studying. We turn to small model compounds. There's a number of different small model compounds that can support stable protonation at thiolates. These were also not a very fruitful um, avenue of investigation. Um, just these, from an electronic structure standpoint, don't look anything like nickel SOD itself. So more out of desperation than anything else, we turn towards computational methods. And the computational methods that we use, in addition to typical electronic structure um, calculations that we would typically see, also involve some valence bond theory and some analysis of the electron topology. So first, we need to define the active site. So here's our minimum active site model for the computational mimic. It involves some outer sphere hydrogen bonding interactions. Um, we find, if we calculate pKa's, that cis-6 is more basic than cis-2. 
So the acidity of the proton attached to cis-6 is about 10 and a half to 11. The acidity of the one attached to cis-2 is just under 9. In the reduced state, we propose that both of those cystinate sulfurs are protonated, while upon oxidation, we propose that we lose the cis-2 proton. This is based on a comparison of the computational spectroscopic data with experimental, especially the nice match of the sulfur K-edge spectra. When we look at other protonated forms, we find that we don't get a good match on that sulfur K-edge, and that's our key piece of evidence for protonation of those sulfurs. So what we're going to do first is we're going to look to see how um, sulfur protonation is going to fundamentally alter the nickel-sulfur bonding. We're first going to look at ab initio valence bond theory. So valence bond theory offers a localized view of bonding using atom-centered orbitals and the interaction of electrons described by those orbitals. Um, because valence bond theory is a non-orthogonal theory, you have to consider every single valence bond configuration in the theory. There's a lot of different valence bond configurations you can think of. For F2, this, there would be over 4,000 different ones that you would have to consider. Fortunately, most of these don't contribute to the overall valence bond wave function, and we can focus in on primarily the um, bond forming interactions. So we can think of our covalent form and our two ionic forms. We treat these orbitals that are involved in bond formation explicitly, treat all the spectator orbitals in a quasi-MO fashion. To add in an extra degree of freedom, we can allow these orbitals to breathe upon moving the electrons in response to increased or decreased electron-electron repulsion. This is breathing orbital valence bond theory. Um, just to point out, this is an incredibly costly computational method. It's more expensive than a couple cluster calculations. Because of this, we have to keep our models small. So here is a description of the models that we have to use for valence bond theory. These are large for a valence bond calculation. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the covalent and ionic wave functions as we go and systematically protonate that sulfur. In the unprotonated form, we find that the ionic configuration with the lone pair on the sulfur atom dominates the overall valence bond wave function. As we protonate, we start to increase the covalent component of that wave function. So this becomes a more covalent nickel sulfur bond as you protonate that sulfur. And then when you protonate both, both are more covalent. So the covalent wave function becomes dominant. Another way to think about this is that nickel sulfur covalency is being turned on by protonation events. We can understand this. We can also understand why we're getting this contraction in bond length upon protonation. If we look at the major electron-electron interactions on the sulfur and the nickel center. So, we have um, the two sigma-type orbitals that form the nickel-sulfur bond, as well as lone pairs on the nickel, and two lone pairs on the sulfur, one a P-based lone pair and one an S-based lone pair. So here's our nickel-sulfur um, bond-forming orbitals, the 3P sigma and a 3D sigma-type orbitals. These are the ones that are overlapping to form the covalent bond. These are the relevant lone pairs, and the key lone pair that's driving covalency is this particular sulfur-based lone pair right there. So when you have this unprotonated because of a large degree of electron repulsion between the sulfur 3p pi and the sulfur 3p or 3s sigma, what this does is this localizes this sulfur so that it's oriented along that nickel-sulfur bond. That causes a huge amount of electron-electron repulsion when you want to localize two electrons to form that nickel-sulfur sigma-type bond. When you protonate, that orbital is allowed to expand out. You reduce electron-electron repulsion along the nickel-sulfur vector, 
And this allows for better overlap because of the reduction in electron-electron repulsion. Hence, you're turning on covalency and shortening that bond. So it's the expansion of that sulfur 3S sigma lone pair that's driving covalency. This is opposite of what had previously been assumed, where it had been assumed that it was the reduction of the nickel sulfur pi pi electron repulsion that was driving this upon protonation. We can see this enhancement in covalency if we look at the energies of the covalent wave function versus the overall valence bond wave function. In the unprotonated case, the covalent wave function is higher in energy than the bond dissociation state. All of your energy in bond formation is being driven by resonance stabilization, resonance energy between your ionic and covalent forms. This is eliminated when you protonate. It's a covalent bond. You can also see this if you look at a DFT calculation and look at the electron localization function where you start to see an increase in localized electron density as you protonate. So um, we're also seeing this enhancement in covalency um, from DFT calculations as well as the valence bond calculations. So what I'm going to show is that this reduction in electron-electron repulsion is doing more than just driving covalency. To do this, we have to turn to in situ electronegativity or electronegativity of atoms and molecules. Electronegativity is one of these concepts that, in a qualitative sense, it's a simple concept to understand, but quantitatively it's difficult, hence the large number of electronegativity scales. So here we have Pauline and Allen electronegativities. More recently developed electronegativity by Rahm and Hoffman is this ground state average valence um, electronegativity scale. It's similar to the Allen electronegativity scale, and it has units of EV per electron. The question is, what happens when we take isolated atoms, form bonds, what happens to the electronegativities of these atoms once we get them into a molecule? because that's going to dictate properties of how this molecule will behave and react. Um, recently, Rom, when looking at one form of an energy decomposition analysis, realized that part of one term contained an electronegativity for the molecule, this chi r term, so the electronegativity at any position in a molecule. And this is something that you can easily get from a molecular orbital calculation. Just by summing together all of the um, electron densities for your individual filled orbitals, multiplying those by the energy, and then dividing that by the overall electron density of the molecule. This is unfortunately not an easy function to partition into individual atoms within molecules. So the gradient of this function isn't well behaved. You can't partition this into atomic basins. What Rom realized, though, is that if you just look at the numerator in that term, that you can generate something called an electron energy density, which is readily partitioned into atomic basins. So what we can do is we can do a standard quantum theory of atoms in molecules analysis. We can integrate over our atomic basins, integrate that electron energy density, integrate the, um, the overall electron density, divide the two, and you can get your electronegativity for an atom and a molecule. In order to make this comparable to experimental data, you compare this to some standard and then um, use the reference data that's been determined experimentally. And when you do this, you can calculate electronegativities of atoms and molecules. So for example, in CO, you find that the carbon is highly electronegative. That makes sense with its behavior. So for example, CO is a pi acid at carbon. So it makes sense. We ran into a problem, though, when trying to apply this to heavy elements. So in the case of a heavy element, 
the core will completely dominate this overall function. Because of this, small little errors in the core region get translated into huge errors in the overall electronegativity. We got around this by realizing that most of the electronegativity differences are being communicated to that valence region. So if we only focus on the valence orbitals and the valence electrons, we can calculate the electronegativity and we get values that are in line with those that have been reported previously. So going through, we're going to look at the influence of protonation on the electronegativity of the nickel and the sulfur atoms. First, Rom showed that there's a linear relationship between pKa and the electronegativity of a hydrogen atom in a molecule. When we apply this, we get values that make sense with other calculations and with experimental data. So this is giving us um, experimentally verifiable results. When you have all of your atoms, all of your sulfur atoms unprotonated, we find that the one with the lowest electronegativity is the sulfur that's trans to the amidate. That implies that that's going to be your most basic sulfur atom, which is what it is. When you protonate, the other sulfur atom becomes more basic. When you protonate there, what you see is that both sulfur atoms, their electronegativities are increased, but not as much as that nickel center. Upon protonation, you see this nice systematic increase in the electronegativity of that nickel atom. This is due to this reduction in pi pi repulsion. What we're in essence doing is we're stabilizing the electrons at that nickel center. In addition, we're making this nickel center far more electronegative. Another way to think about that is we're priming this nickel center to behave as a Lewis acid. So it's going to want to coordinate Lewis bases. We can see this if we look at the, um, um, the free energy associated with binding superoxide to different protonation states. Without those cysteinate sulfurs protonated, superoxide coordination is very uphill. When we protonate one of those sulfur atoms, it's only uphill by about 20 kcals per mole. If we protonate both, it's only uphill by about 9 kcals per mole. So we're priming this nickel site to bind superoxide as we protonate those sulfur atoms. What I'm going to show, though, is that in order to drive reduction, we need to have this cis-2 sulfur deprotonated. Okay? But first, let's go through and look at the interactions that are going to um, correspond to superoxide reduction by this nickel-2 site. Okay, so as we go across and we protonate that sulfur atom in an MO type point of view, we're taking this non-bonding nickel 3DZ squared. Protonation turns on covalency, so it forces that nickel 3DZ squared up higher in energy. Protonating twice enhances the electronegativity at that nickel center and drives down the energy of that nickel 3DZ squared just slightly. So this is why we need that deprotonation. So here, um, just highlighting that, we activate and then we deactivate a little bit. If we look at the interaction between superoxide and the nickel-based orbitals, unprotonated superoxide behaves as a pseudohalide because it's um, the oxygen pi star type orbitals are higher in energy than the nickel-based orbitals. When you protonate, that 3D squared gets driven up in energy, so electron transfer into superoxide is downhill. Um, so protonation is driving reduction. Not only is it driving coordination of superoxide, it's driving reduction of superoxide. So if we look at superoxide coordinating and the bond order of superoxide to our various protonation states, what we find, once again, OO bond order of one and a half. When it's unprotonated, it's not being reduced. You have one protonation is becoming a full or peroxide. 
when you have two protonations that's somewhere between a peroxide and a superoxide. So, and it's because of that stabilization of that 3dz squared. Um, this is an enzyme that operates at the diffusion limit. 9 kcals per mole to generate an intermediate seems a bit high for something like that. So let's see if we can lower that energy by adding in some outer sphere interactions. So what we're going to do is add in this peptide tail and this tyrosine 9 residue into our model. And when we do that, we dramatically stabilize this superoxide or this um, superoxide peroxo type intermediate because now we can extensively hydrogen bond in to that superoxide to stabilize it. So we're stabilizing that superoxide through hydrogen bonding interactions. Um, that doesn't, the tail isn't really affecting the reduction, so we have a bond order of about 1.2 when both are protonated. When we deprotonate, this drives the overall reaction downhill by about 12 kcals per mole, and we get a proton transfer from that tyrosine to the super, or to the peroxo ligand forming a hydroperoxide. Um, so <coughs> this um, what we're going to find is that this water molecule that I've also included in this computational model is helping drive this proton transfer reaction. So here, as we saw with the uh, minimized computational model, we get a full reduction of that superoxide to the peroxide. That water molecule drives a proton transfer reaction. If we remove that from our computational model, we get a hydrogen atom transfer instead. So um, here with cis-2, cis-6 protonated, um, when we look at proton transfer here, so what we're interested in is exactly how can we move protons from the sulfur atoms and form this um, overall reaction. What I have highlighted here in pink is this cis-2 type proton that is involved in, that becomes deprotonated. If we allow a geometry optimization to take place with that pink hydrogen atom moved closer to the cis-6 sulfur, what we find is an overall rearrangement of all the protons at this site. So the cis-6 proton goes up to the amine, an amine proton goes up to the tyrosine oxygen, and the tyrosine proton goes to the superoxide. This implies that we have a mechanism that looks like this. So cis-2 proton movement initiates reduction of the superoxide, which then initiates proton shuffling around so that we can move from cis-2 to cis-6, cis-6 to the amine, the amine to tyrosine, and tyrosine to the peroxide. If Y9 is involved in this proton shuttling mechanism, this is something that we can probe experimentally. So we can make a bunch of mutants. So here, we're going to make some Y9 mutants, compare that to wild-type activity, when we eliminate the ability of that Y9 residue to shuttle protons, we cut away all activity. If we add in acidic residues, or residues that can behave in proton transfer, we recover activity. Threonine turns out to be a highly active mutant, and we suspect that it's because it's forming a nice water binding pocket near that peroxo. This is something that we're currently trying to conform, conform, confirm ah, words. Um, the uh, Y9W mutant is also active and we invoke water as a potential important proton transfer ligand in that case as well. So to summarize, um, protonation appears to be priming this active site to both um, reduce superoxide and bind superoxide. It's through modulation of that nickel sulfur covalency. Um, we think that that Y9 residue is a key residue in a proton transfer relay and that water is also aiding in driving reactivity. 
And with that, I thank you and we'll take any questions you might have. Any questions? Oh yeah, we do have one over Zoom. Um, you, Ma, please, uh, can you just unmute yourself and just go ahead? Okay. Thank you very much for your great talk. So uh, you explained the protonation effect based on the pi electron repartition between the thyroid ligand and the eco center. Mm -hmm. And uh, same, um, is it the very characteristics for sulfur? And uh, it's hard to see when we have uh, oxygen ligand. How do you think? Um, so that you won't see that type of an effect with an oxygen ligand. Those two P's yes, are yes. far too contracted in, in order to behave as an effective um, base. Mm -hmm. So totally different. Yes, yeah. And uh, what about uh, when we have a maceration of the sarpa? Ah, uh, you also, so in, in um, square planar low spin nickel two compounds, when you methylate that sulfur, you also see a bond contraction. So similar effect yes. yeah. takes place. Yeah. Okay. So we have a SH group. You, we can switch on and switch off by having a protonation and deprotonation. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, if there is no more question, uh, let's thank Professor Jason one more time. Um, and our next speaker, and actually the last speaker of the morning session, um, is my dear senior colleague, Professor Giyong Park at KAIST. So Professor Giyong did uh, her graduate work uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Brunold Group. And then after that, she moved to the West Coast and joined the Ed Solomons Group um, at Stanford University. After that, she came back to South Korea and started her independent career in 2014. So please welcome Professor Giyong Park. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I'd like to also thank all the speakers, organizers, and students for making this wonderful symposium. I guess we all miss this fun gathering over the COVID years, so it's very meaningful. And Personally, I think this is my first time actually doing the talk in front of the real audience after the COVID. Um, like two years ago, uh, when we all at hometown, I guess on the last CAST symposium, Bioinorganic Chemistry, I um, talked about this oxygenation of organo, organo nickel complex for the first time. So while preparing the slides uh, this time, I could see that, you know, what type of the progresses we could make. So, all right, I'd like to first thank uh, these students. Uh, Su Young Guan, Wuyo Liu, uh, Ji Sun Lee are the ones who made all those progresses. So I'd like to thank them first before heading to the talk. Although in, in this audience, I, don't, I do know that like, you know, not much of the explanation is required for auto activation, but like for those of the students and on the YouTube, you know, I'd like to kind of explain a little bit. Um, when I first learned the word autoactivation in my grad school, what I wondered was actually why is it called autoactivation instead of just calling it as autoutilization or autoreduction? Because, you know, it's a cheap and effective uh, oxidizing agent, so it's, you know, its usage is definitely desired. Uh, and it seems kind of natural because you can see that the combustion all the time, but, but you know, after learning the, all the processes, I realized that yes, actually, it's not so easy kinetically to induce this, you know, utilization. Uh, and it's good, right? Otherwise, we're going to be all on the fire, right? So um, there are, you know, enzymes that actually require to activate O2 and thus can utilize O2. And there are two different classes of the O2 utilizing, O2 activating enzymes. One is that oxidases. You know, <laughs> I think I have to move to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> one, the one class is the oxidases. There, the oxygen. How can I get used to this? <laughs> All right, there the oxygen is just the electron donor. 
and thus, you know, the, these enzymes take up the electron from the O2 and then transfer that electron to the substrate, and the substrate ends up being oxidized. This one, just the, so, so O2 here is just the oxidant, meaning they're just taking the electrons. While the oxygenases, though, uh, among those in the two oxygen atoms, one or the two atoms can be actually uh, incorporated into the substrate. So this can actually make more of the fruitful, diverse chemistry, so I think it's more fun. And in order to do so, though, think about, thinking about you know, how, to, how to transfer the oxygen atom itself, we actually have to cleave off the O1, meaning that we need to uh, deliver four electrons uh, to reduce the O2, and also in a very controlled way, we have to form these diverse oxygenated intermediate, and when this you know, one of these oxygen is incorporated to the substrate, then we call it as oxygenases. So my talk is going to be about how we can utilize O2 for you know, metallic systems. As I said, it's a cheap and, you know, and, and also benign you know, oxidizing agent, so why not using it? But the, there's a reason why it's not so easy. There are, uh, although there are, not, there are not many examples, but I could find several limited examples, especially I'm going to talk about the nickel system, so let me focus on the group 10 organometallic systems. Majority of them, when they utilize the O2, how the O2 is utilized is just like uh, oxidases, meaning that the group 10 metal center can work as just uh, uh, oxidase, oxidases in active site, meaning that O2 can come in, for example, here, and the palladium zero can be oxidized to palladium two, and then this uh, higher valent, uh, not the higher valent, the higher oxidation state, palladium can induce the reaction, uh, such as the oxidation of the substrate. Those are the one of the majority of them. So meaning that it's not really that the uh, organometallic system cannot induce the O2 reduction. It can do, depending on its oxidation state, but majority of them, instead of cleaving off the O1 completely and then incorporate the oxygen, many of them leaving as just the, you know, making the just O2 oxidant. Although it's very limited, but there are limited numbers of the system showing that the, the, this, you know, uh, group 10 system can actually perform the oxygenase reaction. So, for example, in these systems here, uh, you can see that a lot of them end up making the hydroxylations. But here, what I want to point out is that unlike, you know, how, you know, you know what enzymes do in these, you know, uh, synthetic systems, uh, the pressure of the O2 has to be very high, like 15 atm or the 1 atm, or the temperature condition is very high, over 100 Celsius. So meaning that it can do, but you have to be very lucky out, you know, to get some homogeneous reaction because it requires a very harsh condition. So the question for me is that after learning all those auto activation in the enzymatic system, how actually we can make the better auto utilization these in the group 10 system. And so I have to keep thinking about like, you know, what, which of the step can be the most, you know, hard step. Uh, number one, if you think about the auto activation in the first step is that you know, you know, there has to be electron transfer. And if you think about four electron transfer from O2 to the all the way to the water, the hardest step is the first step. So making the superoxide is harder, and afterwards, the second and the third force can coming in. So the question is, you know, whether the metal center has a low enough reduction potential in order to carry out this in the first oxidation. And another thing, another, another part that we have to also consider is that whether this first electron transfer is going to happen in an inner sphere manner or an outer sphere manner. If it's inner sphere manner, then we likely to, you know, grab this in you know, ROS as just some ligand, and then we may have some, you know, control over the reaction. But if it just loses that, you know, superoxide, then superoxide can actually cause random uh, reactions, and thus probably we're going to lose some uh, control over the reaction. Meaning the homogeneity may not be the, may not may not be good. Once this first electron happens and electron transfer happens, then when you think about the second electron transfer, if you look at the, this potential over here, over here, the second electron transfer likely be more, uh, more favored than the first one. So you can actually prepare the peroxide, but the question is that which one is going to provide an electron? So if the metal center is the one that provides both of the electrons for the first two electron transfers, then what it means is that the metal center can actually afford the higher valent oxygen state, and thus you know, it can actually provide the two electrons to the O2. Or it may require another electron sources, so you may have to provide electron sources at the right moment. And at the end, after forming this peroxide, now to completely cleave off the O bond and then perform the oxygenation, now what we have to do is that we have to provide the two electrons 
into the high energy sigma star and more of the peroxide, and it definitely also recurs two electron at the same time, good potential. So the question again comes down in, in a way that you know what's going to pro, you know which of the side of the which of the side of the uh, complex will provide an electron, or when are you going to provide a good exogenous electrons? And this, you know, what I all learn is from the all biological system, uh, thanks to the Professor Ray, you know, cleaning up with this in a great, you know, uh, summary figure. You can actually see that how the nature uh, recruits the four electron in a very controlled way. If there are two metal centers in the enzymatic system, then all the way up to the oxo from the O2, four electrons can be all recruited from the metal center because each of the metal center can undergo two one electron oxidations. And if the high valence state is you know, uh, good, you know, good enough to do so, then you can go all the way to the B. B smu oxo intermediate there. Or, you know, if the each of the side provides one electron, you can also make the peroxo intermediate. But what I want to point, point out is that in order to cleave off the O1 completely, each of the metal sides can provide a two electron. And then without having any exogenous electron transfer, uh, you can actually uh, activate O2 into the complete, into the full level. Sorry about but if, if there's only one metal center, so if the reaction happens in a mononuclear manner, then one metal side can only provide up to the two electrons, so we need a two electron extra sources. So in the enzymatic system, those two electrons are either coming from the substrate or the cofactor. So if you think about you know, you know, what examples we have for the auto activation in the nickel system, though, um, most of the time in the ambient condition, nickel stays as a divalent state. But in majority of the systems with the inorganic ligands, the nickel 2 is not usually good for providing one electron to O2. So in many cases, what happens here is that you know, if you reduce nickel with the additional uh, chemical uh, reducing agents, then now the nickel 1 can transfer the electron to the O2. And then you can either form, if it's, a, if it's a happening in a binuclear way, then each of the nickel 1 center can provide a two electron, and then you can form bismuth oxo nickel 3 dimeric uh, species. Or if it's happening in a monomeric way, then it's not the oxo, it's going to stop at the peroxo side, and then the nuclear center becomes a plus 3 oxygen state. Or if it's in a binuclear manner, you also can form the nickel 2 with the peroxo ligand. Meaning that, you know, you need to start from the nickel 1. But then can you, what can you do with the nickel 2? The other way is that you first reduce your O2 and then utilize just re already reduced O2 source, which is a hydrogen peroxide. So, thanks to you know many of the uh, you know many of the researchers in this audience, we do know that the nickel two can uh, react with the hydrogen peroxide and create this you know diverse uh, configurational uh, structures for, with the oxygenated uh, 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 oxygenated moieties. But what I want to point out is that. Unlike those, you know, like general just an uh, amine ligands, when you, once you do have the carbon ligands, the situation is a little bit different. There are many examples showing that. For example, in this example, palladium-2, the group 10 system with the methyl group, can react with the O2. What happens here is that the, uh, the metal site becomes in the oxidized state, but it cannot go all the way to the cleave of the O1. So it stops at the higher, uh, high valence oxygen state after transferring to electron, but from the high valence state, it can undergo the reductive elimination and produces methane. The other example here is this, uh, again, the palladium system. Now, the, uh, instead of methyl, it has uh, the cyclone neophyl carbon ligands. In the presence of the O2 and the water, it can either do the hydroxylation or you can start from the hydrogen peroxide. At room temperature, you can perform the hydroxylation. When it comes to the nickel dose, so here's the difference is the nickel in this system does have the cyclone neophyll ligand here. Uh, and then it does have this treacherous dentate ancillary ligand. Then it does react with the O2 at room, uh, it's at the 70 Celsius and with the 10% of the uh, water. But the problem is that if you look at the, I mean, it's good that it can react, but if you look at the product-wise, it actually shows quite diverse uh, product distributions here. You can either form majority of them, many of them can undergo just reductive elimination, or some of them can just pick up the proton and come out as tertiary benzene, or there can be the hydroxylations as well, or you know, there, after the oxygen take up, if it's in undergo the reductive elimination, you can actually create the uh, organic species with the oxygenated part. So what here these examples show is that 
with the carbon ligand at the divalent state, this you know, group 10 system actually can transfer the electron to O2 and thus start the reaction. Then the question is that how can you make it better? Right? So if, if it was based on the lessons from the nature, what matters is that how you're going to manage your activation pathway, so, and thus we follow this reaction. Earlier, you know, when we studied this in the nickel cyclone your full system uh, uh, with the either bidentate, uh, bidentate ancillary ligand and tridentate ancillary ligands, uh, upon uh, using either one or the two electron oxidant, what we also learn is that we can form the nickel three or we can form the nickel four as well. So you may ask, you know, is it really the nickel four? Uh, if you look at the, this in you know, a KH you know, position compared to the one electron oxidized species, it does have uh, more uh, higher effective nuclear charge. So I call it as its oxidation based on the metal center. At the same time, what you also can see is that uh, upon further oxidations now with the nickel center and then the carbon has a very good covalency and thus in this, you can actually check this in the increased covalency in the increased pre etch intensity in the uh, spectrum. And at the same time, this higher oxidation state in the species were quite stable, <laughs> surprisingly. So that what you can see here is that, you know, the way of its decaying is the reductive elimination and some of them actually show very slow rate, meaning that you know, we can actually access the higher oxygen state and even it can be stable enough to do the sum of the reactions. So when we actually compare the measured reductant potential of these species and known tabulated potential for the uh, O2 reduction, what we found out is that yes, uh, uh, if you compare the 3 to 2 and then you know, uh, O2 to the superoxide reduction potential, indeed it can be favorable reaction. So you can see that either using the tridentate ligand or the bidentate ligand, all of them were actually favorable reaction and at the same time, Furthermore, if there's a second electron transfer going all the way to the nickel four, just based on the tabulated value saying that we can actually make the good two electron transfer and forming the nickel four. Again, one more time, I want to point out that this is distinguishable compared to the inorganic complexes. If you look at the distabulated value on the right hand side, for example, if you just use just a regular amine ligand such as a TMC, then in order to make it react with the O2, you can see the certainly see that the, you know, in order to make that reduction potential long enough, you have to actually go all the way to the nickel two to the nickel one. Uh, and you know, if you just want to start the reaction from the divalent, you can, you can actually compare the values and see that it's not going to work. But in the presence of the carbon ligand, actually certainly the reduction potential for this system was way lower than the inorganic system. And we could learn that you know, it's, it's really the, because of the good sigma donation from the carbon ligand. So based on this you know, uh, frontier molecular orbital, first of all, what you can see here is that these are the electrons going to be transferred to the substrate and you can see that in the left hand side is the carbon uh, based system and on the right hand side is the TMC system and you can see that certainly the electron energy level has been way increased in the presence of the carbon ligand and also if you look at the composition of the D sigma star MO here for the inorganic system, it's still metal-based, but you can see that even with the carbon, it's almost inverted, right? Almost, meaning that because of this strong sigma donation, uh, uh, donation interaction from the carbon, you can actually raise up the uh, uh, energy level of the D energy, D electron uh, energy level, and thus you can actually more easily provide an electron to the O2. So based on this whole, you know, idea, we tested out, you know, the ones that we had. Not only just the cyclone neophyll system, when you actually have some diversities in the, you know, system, as long as you do have the carbon ligand, in general, we found that they are all reactive toward to the O2. So you can see that within the second scale or within the mini scale, they all react with the O2, showing that, yes, in the presence of the carbon ligand, the divalent group 10 system can indeed react with the O2 very nicely. So we follow this reaction first you know, with the bidentate ligand system. Upon exposed to the O2, what we could see is that here the blood line is the reactant, and then the reactant, you can see that upon the exposure to the O2, it decreases out, and at the same time afterwards, some new species are growing in. If you actually follow this kinetics of the, this reaction, you can see that at least there are three more, three, more than three steps involved, because very fast decay happens and a little bit of the slow decay, and then you can see that some new species are generated. So we follow this reaction in a titrated way so, this to, so that you know, we can see the stoichiometry of the reaction. When we just added a 1.1 equivalence of the O2 uh, step by step, what we found out interestingly is that the reaction happens here 
with the 0.5 equivalence, meaning that the stoichiometry of this reaction between the organometallic system O2 is a 2 to 1, so it's a binuclear reaction. Unlike this bidentate ligand system, this, you know, tridentate ligand system, in the nickel 2 it's, a tri it's not tridentate, but we expect it to become tridentate upon the oxidation. Well, but with this in the extra uh, uh, pyridine system, what we found out is that it does also react with the O2 very fast manner. But the difference here is that in the BP, we could see that the new species are growing in, while in this tridentate system, it just decays out, and then we didn't see anything growing in. It. And at the same time, when we measure when we did the titration of the, this reaction, we also found out that in this case now it's a one-to-one -one stoichiometric ratio, saying that in the, in the, on, with the bidentate uh, BP ligand, it's, it reacts with the O2 like in a binuclear manner, while with the trispiridine system, you can see that it actually uh, reacts with the O2 in a mononuclear manner. First, let me, let me follow that this in a binuclear reaction of the BP system. What we found out is that the final absorption, absorption spectrum of the, this reaction well matches with the, this separately synthesized species that has the oxygen on it. Meaning that here, so, so you can use N2O and then you know, separately synthesize it and then we measure the absorption spectrum and then compare to the final spectrum of the O2 reaction and we found that it matches out and also it matches with the NMR. And also when we look at the uh, mass spectrometer, uh, spectrometer data with the 1602 and 1802, and you can see that it has a good shift, saying that in this binuclear reaction indeed was the oxygenation reaction. So there was a complete uh, activation of the O2, and O has been inserted into the carbon ligands. We also could check this you know, incorporation of the oxygen from the isotope labeling from the Raman, showing that yes, in this, this, this you know, uh, oxygen is coming from the O2. We try to get rid of the water as much as possible. We try to get, you know, be very, very possible. And we, we were very careful, but you never know. That's why I think this labeling experiment was very important. Right, so we follow this reaction to see you know, what intermediate can exist along the pathway because we are based on already the room temperature kinetics, we know that there can be more than three steps. And here in the first, you know, we follow the reaction at negative 90 Celsius. We first check the titration again at the low temperature and saying that it's a really a, a two to one <coughs> reaction even at the low temperature. So meaning that from the first step, it's a two to one reaction. And interestingly, what we found out is that at minus negative, at minus 90 Celsius, uh, we found this intermediate with the, this new, sp new spectrum over here. Uh, you know, that spectrum uh, stays up until like negative 40-ish. And we can lower the temperature in the NMR, and then you know, we can actually measure the NMR, and what we found out is that this intermediate is diamagnetic intermediate. And this diamagnetic intermediate, once you're upon, you know, uh, uh, raising the temperature about negative 10 Celsius, and it started to decay out, and it forms the final product, nickel, uh, the oxygenated species, we call it as OC, we call, uh, the OC species has been uh, produced. And on top of that, what we also tried is to start from the, this intermediate low temperature and then we shoot the laser in and see what happened. Because in the earlier study, that what we learned is that in the high valence system, when the light provides the energy enough to induce the charge transfer from the ligand to the metal, here the ligand is either carbon or the oxygen, such as just on, that's the sub -sub substances that undergoes the reductive elimination, then yes, the light can induce the uh, uh, reductive elimination. We tried it and we found out that we actually can generate the OC species. What it indicates though is that it implies that this intermediate already does have the oxo level uh, oxygen. Because if it's a peroxide, then you know, it's not going to be the one step reaction for the reductive elimination. So we thought about you know, possibility, it's, it, it, this intermediate is formed in a binuclear manner and it's a diamagnetic, so then both sides can be either nickel four or it can be the nickel three sides, anti-ferromagnetic couples. So the question is, you know, which of these intermediate is the one that we are looking at? So we measured the uh, resonance trauma and what we found out is that there's no O bond anymore in this intermediate and what you can see here is that uh, uh, at, we do have uh, stretches at 570, and upon the labeling, it goes down to the 558. If you compare to the other known uh, oxygenated intermediates from the synthetic species, so here this is a nickel-3 with the bismuo system, and the known uh, nickel-O stretch is already almost above 600, meaning that 
if it's really oxo level, then I would expect that it's going to be the nickel four with the opis muon. Then I would expect higher uh, energy stretches. But what we found out is that it does have actually quite low energies in order to call it as a nickel four oxo species. We checked out uh, our solvents, so we used the acetone solvent here, so either using the H solvent, D solvent, the same reaction, but you can find out the actual spectra are different, meaning that upon changing the, the H to the deuterium of the solvent, it actually downships, meaning that this intermediate already picks, picked up the you know, hydrogen atom from the uh, solvent, and then it does have this hydroxyl moiety. So in order to explain this diamagnetic property and also the resonance Raman, we think this intermediate does have one oxo and one hydroxo uh, bridges, and both of the metal sites are, has been reduced to the nickel three, nickel three oxygen state. So we follow that the, the, the reaction coordinate in order to produce this you know, intermediate. And surprisingly, when we just use and when we use this computer to follow the reaction, the first O2 reaction as expected, it was okay. So it was <coughs> it was down here, reaction with very small barrier. Once you do the first electron transfer from the nickel to the O2, then you form the nickel three superoxo. But also what can do is that it can actually change its conformation from endon to the cydon without costing much of the energy. That's the one of the basic difference that we can expect between the BP system and trisperidyl system because this one does have one extra coordination, open coordination side, and thus the, the sporoxide side can actually change its uh, conformation from endon to the cytone. And once it happens then, now the second um, uh, molecule, second nickel-2 system come in and provide this electron to the superoxo, then it can form the nickel-3 peroxide. And then the fact that we actually see the already cleave of the O bond, what it means is that you know, we expect that on the way it forms a uh, nickel four bismuth. And when we follow this reaction coordinate, actually you can see that the barrier involved in this O bond cleave was very minor which is consistent with the earlier known examples, starting from the nickel one and then reacts with the O2 and goes, uh, going all the way to the nickel three dimer with the bismuth. Uh, earlier, earlier systems also show that from uh, cyan peroxo to the uh, bismuth conversion uh, involves only very small minor uh, 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 energy barrier. Meaning that once you do have the peroxide in a cyan manner, then it's easy to cleave off the O1. And starting from that, is, it does it re can it really uh, uh, perform the HAT? We saw that in the uh, resonance Roman, so I calculated out, and you can see that starting from that high valence, you know, oxidation state, actually, indeed, it can actually perform the HAT from acetone with very small barrier calculated. Then now, what we also can think of is that the next step, we saw that there was oxygenation. But here I want to point out is that we start from the two nickel complex and reacts with the one equivalence of the O2, then only one of the nickel side was converted to the nickel OC. So it's a monooxygenases and the other nickel species, you know, cannot take up the oxygen. We wanted to understand that why, and after uh, learning from the regional Saraman, everything makes sense. Because here, only one of the oxygen sites stay as oxo and the other one stay as hydroxo. Then now if you think about, form, you know, incorporation of oxygen to the carbon, that's the reductive elimination. And if you think about the energy required for the reductive elimination from the oxo moiety and the other one is from the hydroxide, Starting from the hydroxide and then going and providing the electron to the nickel center, that's going to require more energy for the internal charge transfer compared to the oxomoiety. So oxomoiety first undergoes reductive elimination while the hydroxide couldn't, at least at this low temperature. And uh, along the reaction, we always had like a, a one-tenth hour of the nickel species uh, always end up forming the CC bond formation, the reductive elimination uh, products from the, just the high valence species. I think that that's happening earlier in this, earlier in this step, uh, because uh, it, it, after the first electron transfer, if the spore oxide can come off, then it can undergo the reductive elimination quickly at a high valence state with a very limited number of the coordination site. 
All right, so that was the, uh, there was the BP system showing that if we utilize both nickel sites in a binuclear manner, then we can actually activate the O2 all the way to the oxal level in a very easy way. Unfortunately, we couldn't block the HAT from the solvent, but once we can kind of get the you know, one oxygen available, then that actually undergoes the incorporation into the carbon, and thus we can actually quite form good homogeneity in the products. But how about the, this in a trispiritual system? We saw that at room temperature, it just decays it just decays out on the top right, right? Uh, uh, but if you follow the, when you follow this reaction at low temperature, instead of decaying out, what we can also actually see is that there is a growth of the absorption band at low temperature, meaning that it does form some oxygenated intermediates. And this intermediate is stable up to the like, negative 50, 40 Celsius-ish, and so we can measure, we can try out the NMR, and you can see that it, it is diamagnetic intermediate. And this diamagnetic intermediate, if you, look, uh, if you raise the temperature up to minus 30, then it started to decay out. And as it decays out, what it does is that it forms more of the paramagnetic species. So in an EPR way, also in the MCD way, what you can see here is that absorption band decays out. We can, we can have the growth of the paramagnetic species, which is a spin of one half system. So showing that it does form some intermediate, and it dec uh, then that intermediate is a diamagnetic, but upon the, its decay, it forms some paramagnetic species, but at the end, what we can see in the EPR is quite heterogeneous. So it forms just a heterogeneous paramagnetic final products, which we don't understand. Uh, so then first of all, what's this diamagnetic uh, intermediate, uh, starting from the one-to-one -one reaction between the nickel and the O2? The possibility is that it may stay as just a nickel-2, or it may be the nickel-4, right? So, or it can be the nickel-3 that does have anti-ferro coupling with the superoxide. So what can be the, what, what, which of these species is going to be the one that we are looking at? For this system, just like the other you know, system that we tested out, when we just use the laser, see whether that it induces any of the reaction, then we couldn't make any of the reproduce, we, we couldn't make any of the good products out of it, saying that this may not be the actually also level. We measured the resonance Raman on this you know, uh, absorption band that nearly grew, grew in, and what we found out is that it does have actually very good O stretching vibration. What you can see here is that with the 1602 uh, uh, species, that's the, in red, um, uh, we can see that the two big vibrational features in uh, 940 and about 910, which matches with the peroxide, and upon labeling with this 1802, you can see that now it shifts now to the 870 and 886. Just in case, we also checked out the possibility of having any changes with the different you know, solvents. So when we use the deuterated solvent, in this case, there was no shift at all. Right, then in what we can learn from the resonance Raman is that this is a peroxo intermediate. Then now it comes down to the what type of the combination is you know, feasible. So it's a diamagnetic and it's already two electron reduced. Then is it going to be the nickel four peroxo species? Or this peroxide is already incorporated into the uh, carbon moiety, and thus is it, is it the nickel 2 alkyl peroxide intermediate? So, two possibilities we consider with the DFT calculations. One thing that I want to point out is that we do have quite abnormally huge Roman intensity for this peroxide, and also it's not one band. Right, so if it's just a regular for me, uh, regular, you know, if it's a two separate species, then upon the labeling, you're going to expect that they both ship in a similar way. But what we see here is that the, the, the energy separation between the two bands are actually different with the 1602 and 1802, meaning that it's likely to have some mechanical coupling in a Fermi doubly way. Then now if you look at the two models over here, when it does have the nickel-4 and then the peroxide moiety, then peroxide is quite isolated. So you're going to see only of the one O bond stretch. And it's predicted to be the 970. And the other one, the alkyl peroxide, though, is that when peroxide is right next to the uh, benzene ring, then around this energy range, what we do have is that there's a trigonal in-plane bending motion of the benzene ring, which does involve really high uh, Raman intensity. So it doesn't have to be even enhanced. So in combination with the, this motion, then we can have the two uh, uh, OO stretching modes uh, 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 computed in the DFT. I don't like the values. It's kind of like underestimated. That's something we are about the long-range corrected basis. Set. So we are still in the middle of the looking for the right method to uh, reproduce our data. But another thing that we can check out is that also the TDDFT. What we learn in this in the kinetic data here is that 
Here is that. All right. So starting from the nickel-2 species and upon exposure to the O2, you can see that actually the absorption grew in. So we expect that this intermediate to have absorption that in intensity-wise comparable to the starting material. So here in the TDDFT, bottom right, the black lines are the predicted you know, spectrum for the reactant. And on the top, for the nickel-4 peroxide, you can expect that it's going to have very small uh, absorption intensity. While if it stays as a nickel-2, then this transition is just a simply metal to the period in CT, so it's going to have pretty comparable intensity. So we think that the intermediate that we're looking at is porox alkyl peroxyl species. All right, after knowing this, so we can see that after the electron transfer from the nickel to the O2, indeed it can form good peroxyl intermediate, but the, the, the thing is that it's decay. When, it, when, when we let it just the decay, then it didn't put, it, it didn't create much of the homogeneous uh, products. But what we learn from the biological system is that from the peroxide, you need extra electrons. And you know, if the metal center cannot do, then you can utilize other electron sources. So we try to reroute this reaction. So unlike just letting it sit there, we first form the uh, intermediate, the alkyl peroxyl intermediate. Right, so that's what we learn. But there, at the low temperature, we added electron and proton sources, such as a hydroquinone. And then what we do is that we let it just, you know, uh, acidify further so that we can only see the diamagnetic uh, species in the NMR. And what we found out is that about 70% of the hydroxyl group on the sp2 position and about 20% of the hydroxylation on the sp3 position. So then meaning that based on these products, what we can see is that although we majorly see in the resonance drama, well, the, I think what we majorly see is that this first species here with the peroxide you know, uh, bound to the uh, phenyl group, but we may, we may have some of the amount you know, existing just like looking like this. And they do have quite similar energy in calculations. And in the presence of the extra electron and the proton, then now we can fill up the electron in the sigma star of the peroxide and this we can cleave off the O bond. And also after the bond cleavage, oxygen is not going to be alone, it can pick up the proton and then it can become hydroxide or the water and then just let, let the, the reaction go, then what you end up having here is that just oxidative species we expect and upon the uh, acidification, then we can uh, de demetylate and then we end up getting this uh, um, alcoholysis. So to conclude, what we learn is that ancillary ligand actually, okay, number one, organic nickel system at the divalent oxygen state, you can react with O2. And depending on the ancillary ligand, if it's just a bidental ligand, then it, can, it has a chance of undergoing the binuclear reaction. Then you can actually make uh, this uh, um, diamond core intermediate. And if we're lucky enough, then we could get rid of the HAT, but we couldn't, and thus we end up getting 50% of oxygenated uh, products. But if you do use tridental ligand in this system, for example, after the first electron transfer, probably the super, at the, from the superoxide level, we expect that it can actually undergo just bond formation with the carbon because nickel carbon bond is pretty uh, weak. Then you can form this uh, a peroxide level intermediate. If you reroute this reaction by providing extra electron and proton at the right condition, then you can actually uh, end up getting about 90% about the uh, hydroxylated uh, species. So it matters, you know, which either mononuclear or binuclear pathway we take. All right, so it, again, I'd like to thank my students, and also I'd like to thank uh, my fund agents, and most, mostly I'd like to thank you for paying attention. So any questions for ki -Yong? Yes. Very nice talk. I was just wondering for the first part of your compound where you have a binuclear mechanism, where do you have considered the, the intermediate as, a, as an asymmetric protonated, like one oxo and one hydroxo? Why not bis hydroxo species? Mm, very good point. If it's a bis hydroxo, then I think still 5,7 is too high for it. So if it's a bis hydroxo, I think I would expect to see the resonance drama like 400 ish, 300. 80-ish something. So based on the calculated energy, uh, based on the observed energy in the resonance trauma, I think only one of the moiety is protonated. And also based on the known reductive elimination uh, 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 reactivity from hydroxide to the carbon is kind of hard. So uh, usually in most cases in the mononuclear manner, it requires like, a, like high temperature, like 80 Celsius. But in this case, it's all happening at minus 30, like 20-ish. So I think it's also level. That's but if the nickel-4, I think, 
it would do the hydrogen abstraction, the both ones very fast. And we have a bis hydroxocopa 2 species, which shows a vibration around, around 570. Bis hydroxo with the nickel 3 or nickel 4? No, we have a copper, dicopper 2. It's a that, copper 2, right? And that's high, still very high, and your nickel 3. So I don't know if you should expect for a bis hydroxide nickel 3 so low as you expect. Uh, maybe it, it can be in that. Maybe it's worth considering if it's a bis hydroxide species. Mm. And for your second part, maybe one way to check that if you think that the the phenyl vibrations have some, it couples. So maybe it would be good to deuterate the CH bonds of the phenyl group and then see if the vibration uh, shifts. We have very limited skills for the synthesis. So <laughs> we use cyclonium from uh, Moere from just the Greenyard agents. The deuterated Greenyard agents, I don't think we can find it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry okay. about that. Very nice talk. Thank very you. nice chemistry. OK, so very interesting. So. The second part, so you proposed the uh, nickel 3 superoxo intermediate species, but most uh, organometallic compound auto insertion directly occurs. So, do you have any evidence to? No superoxo. Yeah. Superoxo we haven't seen. So, already at ne negative 90, I think it's already alkyl peroxo. So, we don't have any evidence for that. Just uh, on, in the way of forming the alkyl peroxo, is it going to be the nickel 4 peroxo undergoing the reductive elimination to form the alkyl peroxide, or is it going to stay as a nickel 3 superoxide and then doing just the you know, radical recombination? I think the later, later part is a more you know, easier way okay. you can think of. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, um, uh, I have the same question as uh, Carol asked about uh, the nickel hydroxo that uh, just based on the region's Raman, so you said that that's about 500 nanometer. You cannot exclude the possibility of the nickel-3 uh, hydroxyl because in some cases, the, the metal O in a metal hydroxyl that appears around the 600. So uh, that's so I, I still do prefer one of the side is just protonating in terms of the two ways. Number one is that all the computations we have performed, and actually if you think about the conformations, where to put the CC, there are 12 conformers, and we tested out all of them. And with the two protons, no way to get the 570. That's number one. And number two, starting from the hydroxide, can we make the OC coupling either using the light or at the very low temperature? I don't think so. So that's one of the, the biggest reasons for that is that the reactivity. And also we happen to get always two to one to one stereochemistry. So two nickel, one or two, and only one of the nickel side comes out as oxygenated. So based on that reactivity, I think you know, what makes sense is more of the oxygen hydrox. Um, okay. So yeah. we are running a little bit late, so I think it is time to wrap up it here. Uh, this session is very popular, so we actually got many, many questions over Zoom. I feel bad um, that we can't really take all the questions for her. Um, so please thank Professor Giyong again, um, and thank to all the morning speakers this session. Um, so this is the end of the second session this morning. Um, so this is finally lunch time. So after you enjoy lunch, uh, we will resume our afternoon session uh, at 2 p.m. So please come back to this room by 2 p.m. after the lunch. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the lunch, and uh, let's uh, get back to the uh, our next session. Uh, the next session is in session number three, uh, Biomimetic Catalysis. I'm the chair of the session, uh, Yun Ho Lee from uh, Seoul National University. Uh, we have uh, three uh, uh, speakers, and the first speaker is uh, sitting next to me, and uh, Professor Carol Lay, and uh, he did a PhD at the Max Planck Institute, M MPI, a Chemical Energy Conversion, majoring in bioinorganic chemistry. And then after he received the PhD, he went to the America uh, for doing his uh, postdoctoral work at the University of Minnesota. And then after the uh, postdoc, he returned, uh, went back to the Germany and uh, got uh, his uh, independent career at the uh, Humboldt University at uh, Berlin. And since the, uh, since the 19, uh, 2009, uh, he has been uh, working in there. Uh, uh, 2016, he promoted to the professor at the uh, Humboldt University. Uh, uh, for the, uh, his uh, independent career, he has been uh, wonderfully contributed to the metal oxo chemistry, and today he's going to tell us about the small molecule activation at transition metal centers, structure function correlations. Uh, please uh, uh, join me to welcome uh, Caroline. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Ian Ho, for the kind introduction. I would, before I start, I would really like to thank the thank the organizing committee, so uh, Wan Wu, Mihi, and Seung Jae for involving me or including me amongst these eminent speakers. I hope I will be able to keep the expectations. In particular, I might have enjoyed too much yesterday, and I'm, I'm, please excuse me if I'm a bit shaky today during my talk. So, Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, small molecule activation, uh, but preferably today because it's a dioxygen activation. We do lots of small molecule activation, but today I will mainly concentrate on uh, dioxygen. Now, the main study that I'm going to talk about today is this paper that came out uh, last year about a tetrahedral um, oxoiron 4 complex. Now, although this is not about O2 activation, which will come later, uh, during the later part of my talk, this is an intermediate relevant to the O2 activation. Now, why is the uh, tetrahedral? Uh, Ed Solomon today uh, in the talk introduced to us about this uh, enzyme taurine dioxygenase. Um, it has, uh, and one of the reactive intermediates is this iron 4 oxo species, and it, it, it is known that it activates uh, taurine uh, to form the oxidized taurine or the hydroxylated taurine and goes back to the iron 2 state, which then activates O2 and the catalytic cycle. So this intermediate has actually been trapped uh, by the group of Karsten. Krebs and uh, Martin Bollinger by, uh, by rapid freeze quench technique. I hope I do not need to introduce this technique to this audience. Uh, it has been characterized by MOS power studies, which, which confirms uh, it has a plus four oxidation state. And the mechanism, you start with an iron two enzyme or active side. There's an alpha ketoglutarate, which is used as the co-substrate. Um, then it binds dioxygen to form the iron-3 superoxide species, uh, which then undergoes an oxidative decarboxylation to release this intermediate J, and which then performs the CH bond hydroxylation reaction. Uh, now, as I told you, it has been uh, characterized by various spectroscopic studies like, uh, like MOS power and magnetic MOS power, which confirms it as an iron-4 oxidation state and a spin state of S equal to 2. Uh, resonance Raman studies show that it has a terminal oxo group, uh, and the UVVs uh, absorption spectrum shows an extinction uh, absorption maximum at 318 nanometer. Now, uh, Ed Solomon has done some uh, nervous spectroscopy on this, and on that basis, they proposed a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. Now, the absorption spectrum is in solution phase, and the uh, the, the ANARVA spectrum has been done actually under frozen conditions. So we were, one, and, and one of the things that we found out that there have been many 
uh, model complexes uh, that have been synthesized for this iron oxo. So these are the many octahedral complexes that have been synthesized, and these are the trigonal bipyramidal complexes, S equal to 2, that have been synthesized from our group, from Wanu, from Larry K, uh, Miguel Costas, there are many, and Ma Frank Meyer has recently contributed, Peter Comba, David Goldberg. So there have been around now more than 70 or 80 examples of such terminal metal oxo complexes. Uh, and what has been found out that none of them can actually reproduce the absorption spectrum. Yeah, and so, so this is intermediate J here, which shows an extension at the absorption maximum at 318 nanometer. Uh, in octahedral complexes, it's way off. It shows intense transitions, which are DD excited or the ligand field excited states from an S equal to one iron four in the 700 to 1100 nanometer region. And then there's this trigonal bipyramidal geometry, which, which is close to the intermediate J, but it is still quite, uh, quite blue shifted. Uh, or rather red shifted relative to that of what has been found for the enzyme. So one of the things that we considered, uh, can, can the absorption spectrum be actually be explained in terms of a tetrahedral geometry? So this has been never considered before. Uh, so, but there were no examples of a uh, tetrahedral iron oxo complex. We got interested, how can you generate, uh, how can we generate such a species? So, and, and we got, to know about this um, nice ligand system that Chris Carboro, so he started in his academic career and before he moved to the industry career, he synthesized this ligand. So we thought that, okay, so this would be a nice starting point to actually uh, reach this pseudo-tetrahedral geometry. And indeed, uh, when we put the iron complex there, we could see that it has this uh, pseudo-tetrahedral or the tetrahedral geometry that we are looking for. So we had the starting complex. As I told you, I'm not going to, I'm going to talk about O2 activation later, but the intermediate that we generated, uh, okay, before that we characterized that by MOS power spectroscopy, we had a very clean MOS power that we have a tetrahedral high spin iron two species that we generated here. Because it showed this characteristic uh, isomer shift and quadruple splitting typical of high spin iron two. So now, how to generate this uh, species? We also characterize this by various other methods like uh, 1H NMR, which shows it's paramagnetic, consistent with its uh, high spin state. We do it some fluorine NMR that showed some equilibrium. So the trifflet uh, seems to be in thermal equilibrium. Once it's bound, once it's not, um, we could see a temperature dependence of the fluorine NMR, which corresponds to the bound uh, trifflet. So, but we generated the intermediate, so this is the starting compound, which is almost colorless, um, the iron two state. Then we put a strong oxidant like iodose or benzene. We get this intermediate, uh, which is deep yellow, and we can at minus 90 degrees, and we can see that it decays uh, still at minus 90, but still we had enough half-life of this compound to characterize it by various um, spectroscopic methods. The first thing we did, uh, was the MOS power spectroscopy, so we can clearly see that the isomer shift has gone down significantly consistent with the iron uh, plus four oxidation state. In the resonance Raman, we saw a band, um, this is the black corresponds to the O16, the red corresponds to the O18. We could see a band around 802 wave numbers which shifted by around 30 wave numbers upon O18 leveling. Interesting was this UV vis band, which is 356, which is already significantly uh, redshifted, and it was approaching close to what has been observed for the enzymatic intermediate. Uh, the next thing, however, what is the spin state? So generally to understand the spin state or to determine the spin state, experimentally you apply a magnetic field at the MOS power spectra, and depending on the splitting you get an idea of the spin state. But this seemed to be a very unique case where we could do simulation of both uh, of the magnetic features or the splitting with both an S equal to two and S equal to one uh, ground state. The problem was it showed in both cases and, oops, okay, <laughs> this is really like a computer game, which I'm terrible at. Uh, it showed some uh, non-axial uh, hyperfine splitting tensor, 
um, which is very unusual because generally for iron four oxo species you see an axial hyperfine tensor and this non-axial uh, it made it very difficult uh, the magnetic parameters insensitive of the spin state so the magnetic MOS power was not helpful for us to determine the spin state so we had to depend um, on other spectroscopic techniques so first thing we did is the x-ray absorption spectroscopy which Okay, I don't. Okay, here, here we are back. Uh, where the pre H transition showed two transitions correspond to the alpha and beta dz square uh, orbitals, which are split by the spin polarization, which is only observed in the S equal to st two state. So the X ray absorption spectroscopy kind of uh, showed us that it has um, an S equal to two state. And and from the x apps we could also see um, a short iron oxygen distance at 1.66 and three iron nitrogen distance at 2.06 uh, corresponding to the tetrahedral geometry. We also did some, uh, some determination of the magnetic field um, of the, or the effect uh, of the, uh, how did, by the, we applied Evans method and we found a uh, a magnetic moment of 4.50 consistent with the S equal to 2 ground state of the compound. Uh, in the DFT calculations, we found out that, uh, however, if we just consider only the energy, uh, the S equal to 1 state is lowest in energy, although it differs only by 0.32 kcals per mole. But if we go to the free energy, the S equal to 2 state becomes the lowest energy. But w one thing that we found out that the three states, the low spin, the intermediate spin, and the high spin, they are almost of the same energy. So they are very close. And we indeed found that depending, as I will show you, that in a tetrahedral geometry, the spin states, a small changes can lead to stabilization of one or the other ground state. Uh, and, and there are calculated parameters could successfully reproduce um, the experimentally determined uh, distances in terms of the iron oxygen distance or the iron nitrogen distances. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that we realized is that uh, the iron oxygen bond is a bit tilted, uh, and there is another example of an iron oxo tilt complex in an iron species which was reported in 2018. But in our case, the dz square orbital is located quite high up in energy. And this is kind of different than the very similar system, a tetrahedral cobalt oxo species, which comes from the Andersons group, which is also pseudo tetrahedral. And he finds out that the dz square orbital is extremely low lying in energy so that he stabilizes a low spin cobalt 3. So if we consider this splitting, we should have expected an S equal to 1 for an iron 4 oxo. In our case, we have an S equal to 2. And very recently, almost at the same time, uh, the group of Jana Reutova, they presented an iron 4 oxo species in the gas phase and they had actually a low spin iron force oxo species in a pseudo tetrahedral geometry. So in pseudo tetrahedral you stabilize S equal to 0, S equal to 1 and in the gas phase you go to S equal to uh, or in our case we had an S equal to 2 state. So the spin state seemed to be something which we do not understand what controls the ground state in this interesting uh, pseudo tetrahedral geometry. This is something which we are looking at. We are now trying to characterize the species in cooperation with Jana Reutova in the solution state and we, we see if, if the spin state in the ground and the gas phase, they differ. They have mainly done the infrared spectroscopy and depending, based on the infrared spectroscopy, they have assigned the, the ground state to be uh, S equal to zero because in that case, the pi star orbitals remain completely empty, which gives rise to a huge or one of the highest iron oxo stretch that has ever been reported for this kind of species of 961. Okay, so how does this now compare to tau d? We see we are very close. So many of the parameters actually match very well. So this is the enzymatic system. And here we are with our pseudo tetrahedral system. So we are only now differ by 2,500 wave numbers in terms of the absorption spectrum. Um, the iron oxygen uh, distance is quite uh, matching. The iron oxygen vibration, they are quite close. Uh, they differ 
a bit in terms of the isomer shift, but the quadruple splitting is quite uh, close, and also the pre and age energy. We have some in contrast to the actual tensor for the hyperfine, we have kind of a non-axial tensor for the hyperfine splitting. The origin of this is also not known at this point, which we are trying to understand. Now, what about the reactivity of the species? So we had this uh, pseudo-tetrahedral oxo-iron-4. We wanted to check the reactivity. So these are the two most reactive compounds that are known uh, in the literature. One comes from Wanunam. Uh, he reported that in 2011, and the other from the group of Larry K. We found some, some contradictory reactivity. So in one case, like for cyclohexadiene or dihydroanthracene, in our compound is less reactive uh, than that of the two more rea most reactive compounds. But in case of two other substrates, ethylbenzene or toluene, we found out our compound is more reactive than that of these two compounds. So what's going on? So why do this, uh, depending on the substrate, the reactivity pattern changes? We also found out uh, that for one set of substrates, like that um, of ethylbenzene, we, we, we measured a very large kinetic acid of effect of 53, which is similar to the large kinetic acid effect that has been observed for tau D, uh, for the taurine oxidation. In contrast, if we go now to, the, to, to a weaker substrate like dihydroanthrocene, we saw a much lower kinetic acid of effect of 2.14. So now, this kinetic difference, drastic changes in the kinetic acid of effect told us that there must be some different mechanisms that are going on depending on the substrate. So we did now measure uh, the kinetic acid of effect for various substrates, and we found two different groups. Uh, basically, that for DHA and xanthine, we have lower kinetic acid of effects of 1.3 to 2.1, but for toluene, 1,4-cyclohexadiene, or ethylbenzene, we have very large kinetic acid of effect. And this is also observed that the two mechanisms are involved when we plot the rate constant with that of the bond dissociation energy of the substrate, we see that we, we find two different trends that are going on, one for the xanthine and the fluorine is shown in red, which shows a low kinetic acid of effect, the other, the rest of the groups which are characterized by the large kinetic acid of effect. So what's going on? So basically, uh, we also did some correlation with that of the pKa or the ionization energy, and we couldn't find any, any correlation with that of pKa, but in terms of ionization energy, we saw some nice correlation. But again, two different, two different trends or two different lines for the energies. So, Basically, we do hydrogen atom transfer reactivity. You can do um, a concerted uh, H-atom abstraction where the proton and the electron are taken from, uh, are transferred at the same time. Or you can do a first electron transfer and it's then proton transfer in an uncoupled process. Or you can do in the shown in the gray, the proton transfer and then electron transfer in another uncoupled process. But what we think is that uh, we have two different mechanisms here going on. First, the concerted proton coupled electron transfer, and here we have the asynchronous, uh, where the electron transfer and proton transfer are separated. Now, how, how can you differentiate these two mechanisms? Sashan Shaik has showed that if you have a tunneling mechanism, which is generally taking place for the hydrogen atom uh, abstraction reaction. These are characterized by large kinetic acid of effect of greater than seven. But if you have uh, no tunneling, if you, the proton transfer and the electron transfer are separated, then they are characterized generally by the semi-classical kinetic acid of effect, which are generally lower, less than seven. So based on that, so how to explain this trend? So if you are oxidizing a CH bond, and these are the iron oxygen, you can either put the electron into the dz square orbital, then you follow the sigma pathway, or you can put the electron in the pi, uh, in the dxc or the dyz orbital, where you follow the pi pathway for the reactivity. So we observe two different kinds of substrate here, uh, which vary in terms of sterics, one containing the benzylic groups, and the other having this um, aromatic macrocyclic. You can see that uh, the substrates containing the benzylic groups can actually approach, can transfer its electrons to the dz square orbital, and it can 
approach the iron oxygen linearly, uh, and in doing that, it does not experience any kind of steric repulsion with that um, of the iron oxo backbone. In contrast, in contrast, if we, okay. Okay. Maybe there's no battery anymore? Or? Um, in contrast, if we, if we go to the other substrate, ah, it's back again, we're containing the macrocyclic um, aromatic, you see that both in the sigma and the pi pathway, you, you ex experience considerable repulsion. And we think that we have two different kind of substrates so when the approach is allowed, you do a concerted proton coupled electron transfer or a hydrogen to atom transfer reaction. And when the sterics do not allow the approach of this, you do first an electron transfer and then which is followed by the proton transfer. And this asynchronous process is, uh, is characterized by a low kinetic isotope effect and the synchronous uh, is characterized by a large kinetic isotope effect. Okay. So with this, now I need to go to, want to go to the second part of my talk, um, which is about dioxygen activation. Now, Professor Park already and Professor Solomon also introduced to us uh, about the different ways that you can actually activate dioxygen. Uh, at a mononuclear iron center, you need protons or electrons because you convert the iron two to iron four. You change the oxidation state by two electrons. So you need additional protons and electrons to, to actually uh, form the iron 4 oxo species from dioxygen via mononuclear mechanism. For the dinuclear mechanism, there are two metal centers which donates two electrons each, and so you do not need any additional proton or electrons to achieve this uh, uh, splitting of the oxygen-oxygen bond. Now, we, I, I would like to show that this mononuclear versus dinuclear mechanism is also very... Uh, very much dependent on the extent of secondary interactions or the hydrogen bonding interactions. So a lot of studies have been done on the tetrametal cyclam uh, ligand system, this macrocyclic ligand system. So professor, the group of Professor Nam or many of the organizers, Mihi is involved, Jay, Jay, Ho, Jay is also had been working on that, and lots of studies have shown that you can actually generate this iron 4 oxo species starting from the iron 2, either reacting that with iodosobenzene or with dioxygen in presence of protons and electrons to do that. There have been other studies done, so you can also take the iron 2, you react that with hydrogen peroxide, you form the peroxo species, which in presence of proton gives rise to the hydroperoxide and eventually iron 4 oxo. Yeah. You can also do the substitution, the axial substitution with various anionic ligands. Now what we found out, that by replacing the, the methyl groups of this uh, tetramethyl cyclam ligand with hydrogen, you change the chemistry completely. Because that introduces some hydrogen bonding interaction, which, which makes some very novel chemistry uh, in the field of dioxygen activation. Now one thing that we found out previously to us thought that this kind of secondary amine groups are very unstable in presence of a strongly oxidizing iron four center. And that's why uh, all the studies concentrated on the methylated cyclam ligand. But what we found out that these hydrogen atoms may have an extensive role to play in the O2 activation. And we could find out that the iron 4 oxo is actually so stable you can act finally crystal you can crystallize this and it's room temperature stable and it's stable like a rock. It doesn't do much chemistry, even in the presence of NH groups. So that was kind of contradictory to what was believed before that high valent iron 4 cannot be stabilized by secondary amine, you need tertiary amine. Most importantly, what we found out that in contrast to the methylated analog, you don't need here additional protons or electrons to go to the iron 4 oxo. You just need dioxygen and it goes to the iron 4 oxo species. We characterize this oxo iron 4 species by mass power, by, by resonance Raman. We saw a band at 842 which shifted by 36 wave number um, upon O18 leveling. So what's going on? We looked into the mechanism of the species 
and we found out that there's another intermediate that is involved. So we start with the black, which is the starting iron 2 compound. When we bubble oxygen, it forms this green species, and then the green species in a very clean way shifts to the, to the blue species, which is the iron 4 oxo species. Um, we could figure out, so we characterized the, iron, uh, the green species by various spectroscopic method, and we found that the, that the age, or the, the age actually lies in between the starting iron 2 and the iron 4 species. In resonance Raman spectroscopy, we saw a vibration at 1147 wave numbers, which upon O18 leveling moved within the, in, uh, under the solvent band. And most importantly, the resonance, uh, the MOS power spectroscopy, uh, gave us, and here magnetic MOS power was extremely helpful for us to show that it's actually a diamagnetic compound, and here it contains an iron-3 low spin, which is antiferromagnetically coupled to the superoxide radical. So what we form uh, in the reaction of iron-2 and dioxygen is an iron-3 superoxide species, which then uh, ails the iron-4 oxo species. I mean, direct reaction of iron-2 with oxygen is very rare, to give uh, a stable intermediate. We heard, uh, heard the talk of Professor Lee um, yesterday where, where he spoke about this iron-3 superoxide species. But in this case, the superoxide species further uh, goes to the high valent iron-4 oxo, and you do not need any additional protons or electrons. So we looked into the mechanism into more details. So basically, what we found out is that why the superoxide is stable, because this NH bond points towards the superoxide, and it forms a strong hydrogen bonding. And the stabilization of the superoxide by the hydrogen bonding makes this compound actually reactive with oxygen. So we can consider it very similar to the picket fence model uh, that was known a uh, long time back in the porphyrin in chemistry. And we see a similar kind of interaction that stabilizes an iron-3 superoxide uh, in, in the, uh, the non-heme chemistry very similar to the porphyrin chemistry that was reported before. We found out that in, in favor of this hydrogen bonding, we, we did some, uh, established some kinetic isotope effect, so we, we uh, deuterated the ligand, the cyclam ligand, and we found out that we see a kinetic isotope effect for the rate of generation of 1.24, which is consistent with a weak hydrogen bonding interaction, and, and that uh, has its effect on the rate of formation. And, and this also consists at the moment we change the hydrogen with a methyl group, the reactivity with O2 stops completely. You need additional protons and electrons to make it react. So the hydrogen here really plays some vital role in, in controlling the reaction with dioxygen and taking it further to the oxo group. Uh, in fact, this hydrogen bonding, we have this uh, belief that to achieve higher reactivity, you need to achieve higher oxidation state of the metal. This is not the case. We find out that, in fact, the superoxide is more reactive in terms of the oxygen atom transfer as compared to that of the iron oxo species. The iron oxo species actually acts as a thermodynamic sink in this reactivity. And we saw that in terms of oxygen transfer to, uh, to triphenylphosphine, the superoxide species performs that uh, at four to five orders of magnitude faster than that of the iron oxo species. And that makes the iron oxo st species stable because it transfers one of the oxygen atom to triphenylphosphine and then moves to the iron oxo. Yeah. So the superoxide is actually, although it has a lower um, oxidation state and iron three, it's a, it, it shows higher reactivity. And I think the higher reactivity is again initiated by these hydrogen bonding effects. Uh, so, so basically what's happening when we have a, a methylated cyclam ligand, we see a direct, uh, the, the, for the activation of oxygen, you, where there's no hydrogen bonding interaction, you need additional protons and electrons to generate the iron for oxo species. In case of when we move to the High up to the cyclam ligand with NH groups, the hydrogen bonding interactions actually provide stability to the superoxide. So the superoxide is in kind of an equilibrium with that of the starting iron 2 species, and then the superoxide reacts with the second molecule of iron 2 to generate two molecules of iron 4 oxo. 
So it's basically, although it's a mononuclear compound, it undergoes a binuclear mechanism very similar to what we have seen for soluble methane monooxygen. And so two molecules, two iron, they activate dioxygen to form this iron for oxo species. In our case, it's initiated, it's inspired by hydrogen bonding effects of the secondary interaction. So what proof we have, we found out that the rate of formation of the iron oxo is inversely proportional to the oxygen. So more oxygen we add, that it becomes slower. So this is the rate curve shows the rate of formation in presence of air, which has 20% of oxygen, and the blue shows the rate of formation of the iron oxo, which is like 100% in pure oxygen, 100% oxygen, and we see that more oxygen we add, the rate of the reaction becomes slower. So more oxygen we add the equilibrium, the first equilibrium sh shifts more towards the superoxide, and then the superoxide doesn't have enough iron 2 to react to it to generate the iron 4 oxo. So basically, we see an inverse correlation. So when we add more oxygen, the rate of the reaction decreases. So that was a very good proof that we have a bimolecular mechanism, uh, and you form the superoxide, and it's the higher reactivity of the superoxide which actually takes the chemistry towards the iron 4 oxo formation in a very unique mechanism. And, and what we also found out that if we have the cyclam, the isomers there, we can actually generate two different isomers. And these isomers can have different hydrogen bonding interactions, and that affects the chemistry. If we have a cis isomer, it reacts with O2 and it generates the iron 4 oxo. If we have, sorry, if we have a trans isomer where the two binding sites are trans to each other, um, what we have spoken about today uh, or seen today, and I don't have time to, to talk about the other isomer, which is the cis isomer involving the same ligand system where the two free binding sites or the labile sites are actually in cis conformation to each other. In this conformation, the hydrogen bonding interaction is not effective, and what we have found out that this compound does not react with O2. Rather, it reacts with hydrogen peroxide, uh, and what we have found out that it's an excellent catalyst for regioselective epoxidation reaction. And the trans compound, uh, the catalyst does not show any catalytic efficiency. It does the typical Fenton's reaction. So the orientation of the labile site affects the hydrogen bonding interaction, and that affects the kind of uh, the, the catalytic efficiency of these compounds. Okay, uh, and also what we found out, the reactivity of this iron 4 oxo, whether it's a cis or with the trans, so if you start with the cis iron 2, you do the hydrogen peroxide reaction, you generate the cis iron 4 oxo, you start with the trans, you do O2, and you generate the trans iron 4 oxo species, and they show some drastic reactivity. The cis is extremely reactive, extremely uh, unstable, it's stable only at low temperature, the trans is extremely stable, it's stable at room temperature, and the cis is an effective catalyst for epoxidation reaction, the trans is not. And here we have shown also the cis performs these hydrogen bonding interactions. And we could crystallize the species, okay? Okay, so what we are doing in our group, we try to do, uh, try to understand the dioxygen uh, mechanism or the water activation mechanism. Both involves very similar intermediates like metal oxo, super oxos. Uh, we try to address many unanswered questions in biology. There are many reviews that we have written uh, together with Wanu and together with Nikolai Leonard. Uh, so in this field, so if you are interested, you are welcome to, uh, to read this. Um, I would like to thank my group. The main work was done basically uh, Dustin Kass for the iron chemistry. Uh, by the way, as you can see, I'm so much inspired by, oops. Uh, also, sorry, uh, I would also like to thank the collaborators. Uh, so, Wanu Nam, uh, we, I didn't have chance to speak about the work that's are going on in our group. And also Nikolai Leonard, uh, we have some exciting chemistry going on and the students, especially Disha, and also from the group of Nikolai Leonard, Virginia, uh, and also the other collaborators for the various spectroscopic methods for the funding. I'm thankful to DFG and the Heisenberg professorship that allowed me to stay in Germany. Uh, and thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much.
Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, we have a couple of minutes to, to have some question and answer. No? Maybe one? Yeah. Is there any question? Professor Joe? Okay, very nice talk, as usual. So, the last part, is that the iron-3 suplex are doing the oxygen atom transfer to the iron-2 center, or bridging peroxide is formed and breaking all bond? Which one is the real mechanism? No, we, we think it's iron-3 superoxide transferring it to the iron-2. And that we can actually model if we put a triphenyl phosphine, then we form triphenyl phosphine oxide and iron-4 oxo. So it's, it's doing the oxygen atom transfer uh, to the second um, iron that is coming. So it may actually involve like a peroxide intermediate, uh, which, is, uh, which is very metastable, but we have not been able to trap that intermediate so far. But in the case of the TMC, Charlie, is, that is the case of the nickel, but they proposed the transperoxal intermediate species, right? Uh, in case of the nickel, nickel. But you, do you form the bismuth oxo nickel four? No, right? You no. just you stop at the peroxide so intermediate. They propose just uh, making the superoxo and then another nickel one is coming. Coming up. and yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. So your mm -hmm. system is different. Uh, I think it's it's the same. Uh, the question is which intermediate is more stable? Where do you hit the? Uh, hit the, yeah. in terms of thermodynamics, the stability, and the stability is controlled by secondary interactions, and also the, the equatorial donation. Okay. So I think when you replace the methyl group with the NH, you stabilize, you donate more electron mm -hmm. uh, in the equatorial plane, and that makes the higher valence states more stable, and that's why the iron-4 is the thermodynamic sink there. You do, it I doesn't know. show much reactivity. In other cases, the iron-4 is actually the more reactive intermediate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, looks you. like a Professor Wei Chen Lee has a question. Yeah. Hello. Hey, hello. Did Hi. you hear me? Hi. Nice to meet you. Very nice talk. Yeah, so, thank you very uh, much. I have two simple questions for you. Uh, you told us that the dioxin binding is probably equilibrium. Did you try to bubble uh, dinitrogen back and see whether the uh, dioxin is reverse bind? Um, yeah, we tried that. Uh, it's in equilibrium, but I think the superoxide is extremely unstable. So we get back the iron too, but not qua qua quantitatively. We get only 10 oh. to 15 percent. So in fact, it's not so easy to trap the superoxide. Uh, it needs some kind of very good synthetic hand the student had to <laughs> actually isolate that in good yield for all the spectroscopic measurements. Okay, yeah. so besides the oxygen atom transfer reaction for your superoxo, did you see the uh, hydrogen atom transfer reaction? Yeah, those are, it, it actually does very interesting chemistry. We, it is also an intermediate right now for O2 reduction completely all the way to water. Uh, so oh. that's going on, that's coming up, and also it does uh, hydrogen atom transfer uh, reactivity with various CH bond substrates. So most importantly, it's more reactive than the iron four state, yeah, which is kind oh, of nice. un unexpected, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Good to know that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think uh, let's uh, please join me to thank to Professor Carol Ray for his uh, nice talk. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next speaker. Um, the next speaker is Professor Jae Hung Jo uh, from uh, UNIST, Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology. He did a PhD from Kanazawa University and he went to US uh, for uh, Uni University of Delaware for his uh, postdoc and returned to Korea 2007 uh, working with Professor Wononami in Iwa Umas University and then he uh, uh, start his independent career uh, from 2012 in the Digest and the Daegu. Uh, and then he relocated his laboratory to the UNIST uh, 2020. And uh, today he's going to talk about the uh, oxygen chemistry. Okay. <laughs> okay, please join me to uh, join the, to welcome Professor Joe. Okay. Thank you, you know, very kind introduction, and I'd like to thank Professor Wonunam and Sungje and Mihi for organizing this wonderful symposium. So today I'm going to talk about the reaction intermediates and the aldehyde deformulation and the nitrate activations. So 
many people mentioned about these catalytic cycles, and we know the fatty species, real active species for the CH bond activation. About this mechanism, we quite understand. First, uh, the hydrogen atom abstraction occurs, and then rebound gives the alcohol product. But comparing to this, other uh, intermediate species, marabinding supoxo, peroxo, and hydroperoxo, often mentioned in the nucleophilic mm -hmm. reaction during the aldehyde deformulation reactions. So we propose that first the nucleophilic attack occurs to the carbonyl center delta plus and forming the, this proxy hemester intermediate species. And we propose O bond and the CC bond cleavage gives the deformulated product. But comparing to the electrophilic reactions, so H atom abstractions, this uh, intermediate proxy hemester species is uh, not well understood because nobody can successfully uh, characterize or isolate this species. So in this talk, I'm going to talk, focus on this proxy hemester intermediate species. We thought this one shows the, from the metal one, two, three, four, five. So they can get the five-membered ring, and they can, could be stabilized in that uh, structures. So we adopted the two, I mean, two pyridine systems. So we incorporated central matter ions, transition matters here, so we can see the nice cis binding site, and further we can control the strategy and the electronic effect for this reaction intermediates. So previously, we reported a uh, very unique reactivity, the forming the matter cobalt-3 peroxide species, and which react with nitriles, some kind of the OO insertion to the triple bond of uh, CN, and giving the hydroximato complexes. So at that time, we proposed several uh, possible reaction, uh, reaction mechanisms, but Actually, we do not, did not understand the real mechanisms. And recently, we uh, trapped proxy immediate complexes during the reaction by using the secondary metal ions. And then this one is going back to the hydroximate complexes. So for the first part, uh, I'm going to focus on the, this type of the proxy immediate complexes and to understand the reaction mechanisms. And very recently, we also uh, successfully isolate and trap and characterize the proxy hemiaster intermediate species using the cobalt binding peroxide species in the aldehyde deformulation reactions. And then we can understand how this reaction occurs and how this one is decomposed to the deformulated product. So first, let me talk about the nitrate activations. So nitriles are used as extensively in the synthetic chemistry due to their chemical uh, versatility. So it can convert it to the carboxylic acid, amide, amine, aldehyde, and ketones. But the problem is that this C and triple bond is really strong, so we uh, need very harsh conditions, strong acid, base, or pressures. Comparing to this, in the nature, uh, we have the nitrile activation uh, enzyme, two types of the enzyme. One is nitrilase is directly converted to this CN triple bond to the carboxylate, and nitrile hydratase converts this one to the amide, and amidase converted to the carboxylic acid. And in the active site of the nitrile hydratase, people proposed the cobalt-3 hydroxyspecies reaction intermediate and theoretical uh, result shows the nucleophilic attack of the hydroxide to the carbonyl center give the amide. So as many researchers focused on the mononuclear uh, metal binding hydroxide species including Julie Kovac and uh, Andy Borovic, and if this one is really doing the nucleophilic attack, uh, so I think Hydroperoxol also doing the nucleophilic attack. So there is one example, the so palladium hydroperoxol doing the uh, activation of the nitriles. And if you are following the, this trend, so the 
nuclear felicity is much increased to the cobalt uh, metal binding peroxide species because OH and OH has only one negative charges, but the peroxide has two negative charges. So previously, we made the cobalt binding peroxide species and we tested the nitriles and nicely is converted to the hydroxamato complexes. So after the publication of that in the JAX paper 2017, so uh, two years later, we got the one uh, email from the Muki back at KAIST. So he mentioned to our surprise, our computer models predict a very different uh, mechanism than when you had uh, speculated on your JAX paper. So he mentioned, I'm wrong. Yeah, that's okay. So months later, I got a, another email from the other theoretical calculator, Professor Wang at CAS China. And he also mentioned the similar things inspired by your remarkable experimental research work. We carried out the DFT mechanistic study to understand how the peroxide ligand is broken to activate nitrates. So uh, it's very nice things. The two theoretical calculators uh, independently worked for me. I didn't ask, but they give the same results to me. Uh, it's very nice. Yeah. Double check. Yeah, let me share that result. So Muki mentioned. So in the previous Jack's paper, I proposed two things. One is this cobalt peroxide doing the directory nucleophilic attack to the, this uh, cyanide uh, CN triple bond, and giving that pathway gives the around the 33 k more. It's too high, so it's not possible. And the second thing is all over the cleavage occurs, and then it's inserted into the triple bond like a pericyclic mechanisms. First part is 25 kcalpomer, it's okay, but the next step gonna be the 36 kcalpomer, so it's not possible. That's why it takes time, and he proposed new things. That is the black line, so this pathway shows the first the uh, side on binding, ring opening occurs, and end on binding species, and this vacant site is occupied with the nitriles, and then the nucleophilic attack from this superoxo to the carbonyl center gives the, this type of the proxy imidator intermediate species, and the all bond cleavage, and switching gives the final product. So when we saw this uh, reaction mechanism, it was very uh, very interesting because um, a year ago when he shared this reaction uh, mechanisms, uh, that means 2018, my student wrote me the disk crystal structure. Uh, exactly shows the peroxide have the binding to the carbonyl center and the nitrile. So it's exactly the same structure with this one. One difference is the this nitrogen is protonated. So what he did is he wanted to facilitate this uh, distinct reactivity. So he added the Lewis acid to facilitate this reaction and accidentally he trapped the new intermediate species, peroxide binding one. So let me show you what he did. So we proposed the two uh, main hypotheses. One is the nitrate activation may be affected by the additives such as Lewis acids as is often observed in the biomimetic studies. And the other one is peroxo cobalt complex is able to interact with Lewis acid, which may facilitate the nitrate activations. So what he did is the, just uh, without the secondary, met uh, secondary metal ions, this peroxo converted to the hydroximate complexes in the presence of the Lewis acid is converted to the proxy imidato complex, and then trading some chemicals, we can convert this one to the hydroximate complex. So comparing to the previous ones, so when we use the secondary metal ions, we can observe a totally different color change. So without the metal ion, this one changes to the brown, showing this red spectrum. And in the presence of the secondary metal ions, the color change occurs to the yellowish green, and then the spectrum is, looks quite different from this one. And as we wanted, 
the reaction is actually facilitated. It's not the exactly same reaction, so we cannot compare the directory, but by comparing the half-life time, so 10 times faster reactivity occurs. And then ESIMS clearly shows two different species, and the 18 labeling experiment also matches well, so both the species containing the oxygen unit. And the crystal structure shows the, yep, uh, yeah, it looks totally different, but some people say it looks the same, right? Because uh, it's depend, uh, based on the electron density, it's very hard to differentiate oxygen and the nitrogen. So if we switch it, this one is the nitrogen and this one is oxygen, it's gonna be the same structures. But frankly to say, we uh, also assigned that one and uh, running the structure, but our value is increased and further uh, based on the Fourier trans map, we have the, we found the H atom uh, electron density, so we can assign this one in the proxy immediate complex. And then uh, we are interested in the, this one is uh, converted to other species, so uh, after the isolation of this proxy intermediate species, we add it base, so by the deprotonation, we can see the nice conversion of the hydrocimato complexes. And the ESIMS also clearly shows that this species is converted to the hydroximato complexes. So conversion is also occurs. And then we are interested in the kinetics to understand the reaction mechanisms. So we added uh, lots of uh, astonitries. And then we can see the secondary kinetics. And uh, negative delta is the value. And even in the Hamet plot using the benzonitrile, uh, we can get uh, that, we, we, we can imagine this one is the bimolecular mechanism. And this Hamet value shows 0 0.14, so which means it's not the electrophilic reaction and the nucleophilic reaction, it's uh, some different pathways occurs. And then we change the Reese acidity, so from the zinc to the ethereum, so when we increase the Reese acidity, we can see the facilitated reactivity. And we are also interested in the much stronger uh, Reese acid, so we also added the scandium, aluminum, and the proton. At that case, uh, different things happen, so uh, using the secondary metal ion, weaker than the ethereum, so from the zinc to the ethereum, we can see the yellowish green color that is assigned over to the proxy immediate complexes. But in the case of the strong Reese acid, scandium, aluminum, and uh, proton, then we can see the new band is generated at the UV visible spectrum. So we can assign that that is uh, OOH species, cobalt hydroperoxide species. It's reasonable, strong H is directly interact with this peroxide species. So based on the resonance Raman, we can get the nicely shifted band OOH, 18 OOH, and OOD spectrum in both cases. So we can assign that, that is the cobalt-3 hydroperoxide species. So based on all these kinetic studies, so we can propose the reaction mechanism. The first uh, weak Lewis acid, we can convert it to this type of the intermediate species, and then the attack of uh, the carbonyl coupling gives this uh, proxy immediate intermediate species. But in the case of the strong Reese acid, this goes to the hydroperoxide species, and it's not converted to the proxy immediate species. But so far, we do not clearly understand it's really not converted to this one, or this one hydroperoxide species is really unstable, so it's just and minus 20 or 40 degrees Celsius, just natural decay occurs, so no chance to convert to that one. So we do not clearly understand the point. And then I asked the uh, calculation in the presence of secondary metal ions, so Muki worked really, um, his student worked really hard, and I can get the very complicated reaction mechanisms. So it's, uh, yeah, just looking like a IR spectrum, yeah many waves here, so this red line is without the secondary metal ions, mechanism is a little bit different, but you can focus on the first part, 
in the presence of the secondary metal ion, the first step is the rate determining step. So the ring opening and the carbon and uh, nitrate insertion part is uh, uh, the rate determining steps. And then uh, we also uh, checked the hydro peroxide species formation and the peroxide imidate peroxide species based on the pKa value. So two different pathways occurs depending on the pKa values. And then finally, uh, we would like to know so why we trapped this reaction intermediate using the secondary metal ions. So as you can see here, peroxide imidate form. So if there is no proton here, so OO bond cleaves gives this uh, sequential intramolecular electron migrations using these free two uh, electrons. But in the case of the protonations, that pathway is blocked, so it's stabilized. So without the matter uh, uh, proton, this species is really unstable, but in, by the protonation, we can trap successfully this intermediate species, and we understand how the formation occurs. So uh, conclusion of the first part is uh, by trapping this reaction intermediate species by the protonation using the secondary metal ion, uh, we can successfully understand how we can form this reaction intermediate and then further we understand how we can convert this one to the final product. So this work done by uh, my PhD student, Kyung Min Kim. So let's move on to the second part. So uh, we are talking about the aldehyde deformulation reactions. So usually metal binding peroxide species is the active for that kind of the reactions. And many people propose the nucleophilic attack, as I mentioned, of the peroxide species gives the peroxy acetal intermediate species. And then the OO bond and CC bond cleavage gives the deformulated product. But recently, uh, some researchers proposed uh, this peroxide species doing the H atom abstraction of this alpha proton, and then this intermediate species rearranges to the final product. Uh, yeah, so it's, there is some debate what is the real active uh, intermediate species. The problem is nobody can see this type of the proxy hemiaster intermediate species, so we would like to see and trap this intermediate species. So our trap, uh, our, our, our strategy is the cis binding site of our system can stabilize the proxy hemiaster species by forming a five-membered ring, as probably possible, and the isolation of the intermediate provide key uh, mechanistic insight into the formation and the aldehyde deformulation reactions. So what we did is we isolate uh, cobalt peroxide species using the, this type of the three amine, two, uh, three amine one pyridine systems, and we react with aldehyde, uh, two PPA, two propion aldehyde species. And then uh, reaction is occurs, reaction work. So we first time thought, so aldehyde deformulation occurs, but by measuring the ESI mass, interestingly, most major species are assignable to the peroxide species. That's very interesting, reaction is work, reaction happens, something's happened, but the, uh, we can get the almost this intermediate species at the final stage which means maybe some type of the intermediate species generated and if the reaction equilibrium is left-sided, then we can assign, uh, we can get uh, this intermediate species and then we can see very small amount of the other uh, peaks at the ESIMS, which is assignable to, so it's 40, uh, 41, no, no. So exactly uh, peroxide plus uh, acetonitrile uh, mass numbers. So we uh, propose maybe the, some type of the reaction intermediate is trapped uh, in these reactions. Okay, then we uh, try to isolate this reaction intermediate species and uh, very 
interestingly, my, my student can isolate this one, and then he measured the UV visible spectrum. So isolated one is the black spectrum, and then incubation for several minutes is going back to the red spectrum, which is assignable to the Perox species. That means this intermediate species going back to the Perox species, isolation means without the excess amount of the 2PPA, so reaction equilibrium goes to the left side. So we calculate the K EQ value, that is 288, so which means it's quite uh, left uh, equilibrium state. And then we uh, measured NMR spectrum for this isolated species. As you can see here, it's very complicated. So we uh, try to characterize this one. So as I mentioned, this species is equilibrium state with the left two species. So it's all the mixture of that one. But good thing is we can have the isolated the peroxide species and the uh, substrate so we can eliminate all other things and the left thing is the green band, green peaks, something here and one characteristic point of the peaks is here around the 5 to 6 ppm we can assign over two that is the proton of the, this one and the, that one. So using the heteronuclear single quantum coherence method uh, we can see the couple of the HA here, showing here, and yeah. So uh, using the COGE method, uh, we can fully assign about this NMR spectrum of uh, proxy hemiaster intermediate species. And we can see the characteristic band for this species at here and uh, this one, all the other species around 10 ppm. So Depending on the times, we can measure the also the shift of the spectrum. So as incubating this uh, intermediate species, we can see the growth of the 2PPA aldehyde band, which means it's going back to the left side, and decrease of the, this characteristic band, which means it goes to the left side. And then we are interested in the further characterization. Uh, so in the ESI mass spectrum, it's very small amount, but we can see uh, intermediate band here. So we asked the Professor Yana Roithova what she can do is she can uh, tagging this small amount of the mass number and she can measuring the IR spectrum in situ. So what she found is she can found uh, isotope shift value for the, this carbonyl CO vibration energy here. So this result means something's different. So far we proposed nucleophilia attack of the peroxide species to the carbonyl center, then no way to shift of this CO bond. But her result shows this CO bond is isotope change occurs. So we followed all the possible uh, isotope labeling experiment, but yeah, result shows, uh, so most people propose nucleophilic attack gives the, this type of the proxy intermediate species, but at that case, this CO bond never changed isotopically. But uh, based on the new result, based on the IRPD, uh, this 18 shift occurs, which means we propose new mechanisms. So OO bond cleavage and the insertion of the CO bond, we call that is carbonyl insertion pathway. And in that case, uh, we can see the CO uh, exchange labeling results. So this one is the, after the isolation, uh, we try to, this one is really uh, active species for the aldehyde deformulation product, so we decompose this one. But as I mentioned, this one itself is the equilibrium state is going to the left side, so isolation and decompose gives always the cobalt peroxide species. 
So what we did is we add the excess amount of 2PPA with isolated this intermediate species. Then increasing the temperature, we can see the final product. So formate observed and deformulated product with 80, 30, 83 percent. So, uh, so far I mentioned about the aldehyde deformulation reaction with this 2PPA reaction. And we also tested the CCA and the alkyl aldehyde, all species converted to this type of the proxy intermediate species. Well, we confirmed it with the proton NMR, CSI mass, and the UV visible spectroscopic method. So finally, we would like to test other uh, substrate chloride species. So we tested this reaction. Similarly, we can get the pobenzoic acid form intermediate species. But the HAME plus shows definitely different positive values, 3.2. So in this case, something different happens. So uh, we also measured IRPD spectrum. At that case, we cannot see the chemical uh, exchange for this uh, CO bond. In this case, this type of the nucleophilic attack and so in that case, we can see the uh, isotope labeling exchange spectrum for this year. So we are also uh, carefully following the isotope labeling experiment results. Then we uh, propose, so in the case of the chloride binding uh, intermediate species, uh, this species is a very good living group chloride. So just the nucleophilic attack occurs to forming the similar type of the pobenzoate complexes. But in other aldehyde species, all the carbonyl insertion pathway occurs to give the proxy hemiester intermediate species. So uh, using the cis binding site during the aldehyde deformulation reactions, we can successfully trap this intermediate species. Actually, we can isolate these species, and by isolating, that we understand the reaction is uh, equilibrated on the left side, and in the presence of excess amount of the substrate, this one is com compacted to the already formulated uh, product. Is. So uh, what we can understand so far is previously most people proposed the uh, nucleophilic reaction pathway to give the proxy amyaster species, but in this case, at least using the symmetric binding matter peroxide species, we found another reaction mechanism. So that is the OCO insertion pathway uh, to give the similar type of the proxy amyaster intermediate species. So so far, we understand how this reaction is occurs, and nowadays my students are interested in the, how this. Uh, intermediate species break bro broken to the final product. So I would like to thank all the, my collaborators and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Uh, I have a quick question. Huh? Did I tell you? Have you ever tried to add uh, isocyanide? Iso isocyanide instead of yeah, I tried. I tried. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Apogen, right? So yeah. it might give you the yeah. No. Yeah. Same. At, at the Same at the room temperature, when we add the uh, isocyanide, just peroxide is kicked out. At the oh. very low temperature, we add some intermediate species is observed, but in 10 seconds, at minus 80 degree, that's decomposed. So so far, we, we we do not know what it is. Yeah. Okay. Oh, many questions, of course. Yeah, Professor on now. Yeah. Okay. Professor Nam. Yeah. Yeah, very nice talk. Thank you. I have uh, two quick questions. The first is, what is the, the uh, rate determining step in uh, the nitrile oxidation by your cobalt pooxo? You're proposing that the O bond cleavage to form the, the dioxo species. But uh, the DFT shows that uh, the O bond cleavage is that the rate determining step, right? But ah. uh, did, did you see that the concentration effect? Okay, so your question is the aldehyde, no, 
nitrate activation case yes. with the release acid or without the without, release acid? Uh, without, so uh, without the release acid, acid the all bond cleavage is the reaction, uh, rate determining step. But do, did you see that the concentration effect in experimentally, in your experiment? So as you use, so I, I cannot see that spectrum, but anyway, the reaction, the DFT reaction coordinate shows all the equilibrium state, the pre, pre steps, and the final step is the rate determining step at is the orb on the cleavage. So we cannot see at that case concentration effect. All so, we can observe is the starting material. So you don't see that the concentration effect no, in no. your experiment? We didn't try, actually, yeah. C. Okay. So, which means concentration for what? For of your substrate. The decay of your oxo species. I think you have to see that the concentration effect. But the DFT proposed that the all bond cleavage, the energy is that uh, very high. And that is the uh, determining. State. I read your paper because uh -huh. I was curious about uh -huh. this before. Uh -huh. so. Okay, so of course we can see the astronitary concentration effect. Right. That, that means the second order kinetics. Right, yeah, that yeah. is the second order. Yeah. So which is different from the DFT. Yep. The, yep. The so as I mentioned, so all the previous version of the reaction coordinate is the, on the left side, but is all the equilibrium state. At that case, we can see the, so in the case of the rate determining step, if that is separated, then we cannot see the concentration effect, but then we can see the just, uh, just previous step of the LDS. But at that case, in this case, we cannot see that species because all the equilibrium state. So then we can see the concentration effect. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, talk to you thank you. Uh, Carol Ray. Very nice, very nice talk here. Thank you. Um, I was wondering for this intermediate, this acyl paroxo that you did with Iana, this uh, IRPD experiments, right, uh -huh, in the uh -huh. gas phase. Mm -hmm. So the mass is actually tiny. So that, that may s tell you that this is, may not be the uh, major species in solution. Actually, I do not understand this effect. Has, do you know if anything has been done which has been characterized also in the solution as well as in the gas phase? My problem is, can you actually translate the solution chemistry to gas phase? So what you see in the gas phase, is it actually in solution? Because you ionize them, you put additional energy. Uh, so can you actually compare the two? Has there any comparison been made where the same species has been characterized in the solution and in the gas phase, Good and question. they are yeah. shown to be yeah. the same? Yeah, basically we can st we think the it's both species the same, but we compare the exactly the peroxide species. We have the resonance Raman spectrum, and we also have the IRPD spectrum. So at that case, of course, different uh, all vibration uh, shift occurs, uh, not shift uh, vibration detection occurs. So usually, the, in the solution state, resonance Raman 850 is the all vibration, but in the case of the IRPD we observed much higher one, 900 something. Because so that means you form a new species, right? Uh, no, it's the same species. Because uh, the gas phase, there is no extra interaction with the solvent. So it's increased the uh, vibration energies. And okay. also the solution state, all the NMR spectrum is the solution state. So we pretty much sure that is the proxy hemiaster intermediate species, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Uh, very inspiring talk. Uh, let's thank to the Professor Joe to his uh, nice talk. Okay, and uh, uh, the last speaker of this session uh, is Professor Louis Kao. Is he in online? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure, please. And uh, before his talk, let me briefly introduce him. And he did a PhD from Emory University 2008. And then he did uh, MIT, uh, the postdoctoral work at the uh, MIT in uh, 2009 and 2000 until 11. And in 2011, he uh, returned to the China uh, the, for his uh, independent career, uh, starting from the Lemin University. And, and currently, he is in the Sh uh, Shanik uh, Normal University. And uh, he's going to tell us about the metal propane chemistry. Uh, Professor Kao there? Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, would you put the slide on the screen, please? Yes, I have put. 
Can you see my slides? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, we can see it. Okay, please. Okay. Call. Okay, so first I would like to thank the organizer to give us an opportunity uh, to uh, meet each other online or in person. And also I would like to thank Professor Wang Lang for the uh, invitation. Uh, next, I would like to present our recent results on uh, using metaporphyrins as catalysts for uh, small molecule activation reactions. So I think uh, there's no need for me to, uh, to talk about why we need to do energy research. Uh, but from the, chemi from the chemistry, the, the energy conversion and the storage can be uh, considered as uh, electron, electron transfer. For example, by using sunlight or electro uh, electric energy, if we can extract electron from a low energy state to higher energy state, then we can store the, the energy in the chemical forms. For example, if we can extract electrons from water and uh, by uh, combining with uh, proton, then we generate hydrogen. If we combine with CO2, we can generate CO, methane, and uh, other uh, vinyl added chemicals. So nature uses this strategy to uh, store energy. For example, uh, photosynthesis. By using photosynthesis to uh, water, was, uh, water is oxidized to O2 and generates protons and uh, electrons, which are finally used for CO2 fixation to generate hydrocarbons. So this reaction has been used by nature to uh, uh, store sunlight energy and provide biomass uh, for us. As inspired by nature, uh, we can also use uh, sunlight energy or electric energy to, sleep, to split water to uh, O2 and H2. And this process we can call store energy process. Uh, on the other hand, if O2 and H2 are combined in a few cells, then it can, this reaction can generate electric power. So in this circle, uh, by storing and using energy, there's no carbon uh, involved. From this uh, cycle, there are four uh, fundamental chemical reactions, oxygen erosion, hydrogen erosion, uh, O2 reduction, and the hydrogen oxidation reactions. So in our group, we focus on the OER, HER, and the OR reactions. We try to uh, develop uh, efficient catalysts for these three reactions. And more importantly, we are trying to uh, understand uh, the uh, reaction mechanisms. So uh, in overview, we think uh, the, the, the hydrogen, hydrogen, and all bond formation processes is very, are very important uh, for the water splitting. Uh, for photoelectro and photoelectrocatalytic water splitting, all these kind of uh, catalytic processes we require to form hydrogen, hydrogen, and the all bond. From a thermodynamic point of view, uh, the bond formation processes. Uh, uh, involves uh, electron transfer. So it is, uh, uh, it, it involves uh, energy change. It is the basis of our energy conversion processes. From the dynamic point of view, these all these uh, bond formation processes are concerted with atom electron transfer and, uh, uh, proton, uh, and the electron transfer in a concerted manner. So it usually they are connected very slow. So from both thermodynamic and dynamic point of view, understanding these uh, bond formation processes uh, is quite important. In general, people think uh, for, for hydrogen hydrogen bond formation, people think hydride is a key intermediate. There are two possible ways to form the hydrogen hydrogen bond. One is a heat electric or protonic uh, pathway. The other one is the homolytic pathway. Uh, we can also call it a biomolecular coupling of two uh, metal hydrides to form uh, uh, the hydrogen. 
So all bond formation are uh, also two, uh, usually uh, two uh, proposed mechanisms. One is the water nuclear attack. Uh, the water attacks the uh, metal oxo species to form an oil bond. It is a two electron processes. And also two uh, metal oxo can com combine or coupling to form the oil bond, uh, which is the uh, one electron uh, processes. Although this uh, mechanism has been proposed in literature, but few, have the, a few of examples have been uh, demonstrated in literature to uh, confirm this uh, formation processes experimentally. So we are interested in to understand these uh, bond formation processes by using a uh, metal phosphorine as a model catalyst, and we use uh, electric tendencies. The reason we choose uh, metal phosphorine as the model catalyst is because they, are, they have no unstable structures, and also they have rich spectroscopy features. Uh, for these features uh, enable us to uh, estimate key intermediates and also to identify these uh, intermediates during uh, catalysis. The reason we use electric catalysis is because it can give us quick springing of catalysts and also by controlling the uh, potentials used, we can synthesize these intermediates in a controllable manner. So by using this metaporphyrin uh, electric catalysis, combine these two together, we are uh, interested in to elucidate these reaction mechanisms. And on the basis of elucidating these reaction mechanisms, we are trying to control these reaction pathways, to control the hydrogen, hydrogen, and all bond formation processes. And on the basis of these uh, studies, we're trying to finally optimize uh, the molecular uh, electric catalysis to realize, in, uh, to realize efficient hydrogen and oxygen evolution reactions. So the first part is uh, hydrogen hydrogen bond formation. So in 2016, our group and uh, the Soros group have independently uh, studied the hydrogen evolution reaction by nickel porphyrins. So we both, we, uh, both of us have demonstrated that one electron reduced nickel porphyrin are uh, is the active uh, catalytic active species for hydrogen evolution reaction. However, in their studies, they suggest that the protonation occurs at the meso carbon atoms, uh, which is based on the, uh, uh, computational, uh, computational studies. However, in our studies, we propose that the protonation actually occurs at the uh, nickels nickel uh, atom to form a nickel three hydride intermediate. And we also calculate the hydrogen hydrogen uh, bond formation through a homolytic uh, pathway. The activation energy barrier is only 3.7 uh, kK per mole, as you can see uh, from uh, in this structure. So for the same uh, nickel porphyrin catalysis, there are two different uh, reaction pathways. In order to identify which one is actually uh, involved in the catalysis, the best way is to isolate the key intermediates. So we spend years to uh, trying to figure out whether this nickel three hydride is actually involved in the catalysis. However, as you can as you can see, the rate determinant step as we determined in this study, is the protonation of nickel one species. So once you formed the nickel three hydride, this, this species will spontaneously quickly react with each other to form the hydrogen hydrogen bond and evolve the H2. So in order to stabilize this uh, key intermediate, we designed two molecules. In the first molecule, we uh, installed a bulky substituent at the author position of the missile final group. Because of the steric hindrance, this uh, final group cannot rotate uh, easily. So there are four isomers. 
We isolate, we used and we isolate this alpha, beta alpha isomer for this study. As you can see, if this isomer is this species form the nickel three hydride, either on side or uh, downside of the porphyrin ring, because of the large steric hindrance of the uh, the of the, the porphyrin uh, backbone, then it will block the homolytic hydrogen hydrogen bond formation processes. In, uh, on the other hand, if we uh, install the bulky group on the parallel collision, as you can see, then there is no or there is a very small steric hindrance on each side of the porphyrin ring. So this species, if form the liquid three hydride, then they can uh, undergo the homolytic hydrogen hydrogen bond formation. That's what we proposed. So we synthesized this uh, species, these two uh, liquid porphyrins, and the, fortunately, we can grow crystal structure of this alpha beta alpha beta isomer. As you can see, the bulky group have the uh, upside and the downside are retention. And uh, as you can see from the space dining uh, uh, diagram, the porphyrin, the center is sterically protected. We first examined the uh, electrocatalytic hydrogen evolution uh, features. As you can see, uh, complex one and the complex two have very similar uh, electrochemical behaviors, but they behave very differently for electrocatalytic hydrogen evolution. As you can see, by adding TFA as the proton source, complex one will have its uh, we we'll have the uh, catalytic wave well behind the first uh, electron, uh, first uh, one electron wave by uh, 200 millivolts. However, for complex two and complex three, complex three has the, the uh, methyl group uh, instead of the tributyl group. For these two, uh, species, uh, two complexes, as you can see by adding TFA, the uh, catalytic wave is uh, starts as the first reduction. So different electrocatalytic behaviors indicate that these two species, uh, these two complexes have uh, different uh, uh, reaction mechanisms. So next, we spend uh, a year to identify this uh, nickel three hydride. As you can see, we can generate the nickel one species from the nickel two offering by using a uh, reducing agent. For complex one, with the stack hindrance by adding TFA, then we can see the nickel three hydride, which is characterized by UVs and the EPR spectroscopy. However, for the complex two, without the stack hindrance, then if we form the nickel three hydride intermediate, then it will spontaneously to generate nickel two and the 0.5 equivalent hydrogen. Also, we started this reaction uh, from the other side. Instead of uh, starting from the nickel one species, we try to start this. Uh, we try to start this reaction from the nickel three side. We can generate the nickel. We can oxidize the nickel porphyrin by one electron, and then we react with the hydride dilating uh, uh, reagent. As you can see, for complex one, also we generated the same nickel three hydride. However, for complex two. Without the stack rate hindrance, we can uh, finally recover the nickel two uh, catalyst and 0.5 equivalent of hydrogen. So based on these results, we identified the nickel three, the key nickel three hydride intermediates in the uh, catalytic cycle, and we can say that the uh, protonation actually occurs on the nickel uh, side instead of the missile carbon. So during our research, we also found that the proton delivery or proton transfer plays uh, a crucial role in facilitating uh, in improving the hydrogen erosion efficiency. So in nature, hydrogen bonded water clusters play a crucial role uh, in facilitating hydrogen uh, a proton transfer. As you can see from hydrogen C's, OEC, and the cytochrome C oxidases, 
in the protein structures, what clusters can be uh, located. However, for small molecule activation, it is very difficult to uh, form these uh, what clusters and to see and to identify, to demonstrate the crucial role of this uh, what cluster. So we think if we can bring uh, 18 ground six uh, ring on the cup of the uh, cobalt coral core, which is active for electrocatalytic hydrogen evolution reaction, then it is possible to form hydrogen bonded water clusters. And then maybe it can significantly improve the proton transfer and then improve the hydrogen evolution reaction. In, uh, Fortunately, we can grow the crystal structure of this uh, complex. As you can see, there's a water molecule actually located in the 18 ground six through two very strong hydrogen bond interactions. And also, we can confirm the formation by adding water in the solution, we can confirm the uh, formation of hydrogen bonded water clusters uh, by using uh, infrared and the NMR spectroscopy. Particularly in the uh, NMR dosi spectrum, we can see the 18 crown 6, the molecule can actually host a water cluster. Then we started the reaction of complex 1, 2, and 3. Complex 2 and 3 are controls of this uh, uh, study. As you can see, these three complexes have very similar electro, uh, redox behaviors. But for complex one, after adding uh, 20 equivalent acid, it shows a small catalytic peak. However, with addition of uh, water, we can see that the uh, catalytic current increased significantly. However, for complex two and complex three, uh, after adding uh, acid and water, we can see, although we can see a small uh, improvement, but the improvement is, is, is uh, relatively, relatively very small. And we studied different acids uh, as a proton source. And uh, in all cases, complex one showed significant improvement by adding water uh, in addition uh, to the acid. And also, we uh, tried to, uh, we used the inhibition studies to demonstrate the crucial role of these uh, clone rings. As you can see, by adding external 18 clone 6 to extract, to extract what molecules from the uh, uh, complex one, we can see the decrease of the catalytic uh, weight uh, cousins. And also by adding potassium or MBBA to occupy the 18 clone, uh, the, uh, the, to occupy the, the clone uh, ring, we can also see this decrease of the catalytic efficiency. So all these studies demonstrate that the 18th, the, the crown plays a significant role to uh, grab water molecules to form our hydrogen bonded water clusters and then uh, improve proton transfer for uh, hydrogen evolution reaction. We also calculate, we use computational studies to calculate the uh, reaction mechanism uh, the, as you can see, the, the key step, the hydrogen-hydrogen bond formation step, uh, has a very small uh, activation energy uh, barrier of 15 picocobol. And this result is also consistent with uh, experiment uh, observations. So next, I will talk about the old bond formation studies. As you all know, in uh, nature, uh, proton uh, photosynthesis two. There are two possible all bond formation mechanisms in OEC. One is the water nucleophilic, water nucleophilic attack mechanism. The other is a radical coupling mechanism. Although these two mechanisms has been uh, proposed and has been debated for uh, decades, but uh, until now there's no uh, direct evidence which one is actually involved in the OEC. So uh, we and the Professor Nan and Xiang uh, Fukutumi, uh, we collaborate together. We use uh, uh, to, uh, we try to uh, understand 
uh, the all bond formation by manganese based uh, catalyst. So we we use this manganese coral complex because manganese coral can form a relatively stable manganese five oxo intermediate. We can uh, generate this species uh, quantitatively and uh, study and uh, confirm its formation by UVBs and uh, uh, mass spectroscopy, uh, mass spectrometry. After formation, then magnesium five oxo by adding uh, uh, OH minus the hydroxyl uh, hydroxyl group, then we can generate a uh, magnesium four per oxo species. We can confirm the formulation by using a uh, high, res high resolution mass, spectro uh, mass spectrometry, uh, and also we can confirm the magnesium four oxidation states by using EPR. Importantly, in the uh, infrared spectroscopy. We can also uh, identify the O the O bond at uh, eight hundred ten wave numbers by using uh, O eighteen labeled hydroxyl as a nuclear uh, as a nuclear file. This uh, bond shift to uh, seven hundred eighty seven wave number, and all these results can give us the formulation of a magnus four uh, per oxo species. Then we studied this uh, reaction, the characteristics of this reaction. As you can see, by using water as a nuclear fail, the reaction is uh, smaller than the reaction with hydroxyl by six orders of magnitude. This is consistent with the uh, electrochemical studies, as you can see. By using, uh, uh, in the presence of a base, the catalysis Actually, is, uh, uh, is initiates at the mag uh, for, uh, initiates at the formation of magnesium five species. However, with only water as a substrate, the catalytic wave is well behind the formation of magnesium five by uh, more than two hundred millivolts. So we decided to identify possible uh, intermediates in electric catalysis. If we set the applied potential at the, at the potential for the formation of magnesium 5 species, then we can also see this magnesium 5 oxo, uh, a magnesium 5 oxo species in the electrocatalysis. If we set the potential at 1.2 volts, which is the onset of the catalytic wave, then in UVBs, uh, during the electrolysis, the UVBs change to a uh, spectrum which is similar to the uh, reaction uh, to the one gener generated from the reaction of magnesium 5 oxo and the hydroxyl. That means a uh, magnesium 4 oxo species is likely generated during the electrolysis. And by using EPR, we also identified this is a magnesium 4 species. And by using infrared, uh, infrared spectroscopy, we can see the O1606 band at 800, uh, 810. And by using O18 labeled water, we can see the band shifted to uh, 769. So these results tell us that the magnus 4 and the magnus uh, 5 oxo and the magnus 4 oxo are identified during the electrolysis. And they give very similar spectroscopy features as we obtained uh, in the chemical studies. So all, based on these results, we can draw a possible uh, reaction mechanism for this uh, reaction. We can generate magnus 5 oxo by uh, chemical oxidation or by two PCET processes. And then this magnus 5 oxo can quickly react with uh, hydroxyl to form a magnesium 3 peroxyl, hydrogen peroxyl, which is uh, quickly oxidized to magnesium 4 uh, peroxyl. And then further oxidation will generate O2 and the re uh, regenerate the magnesium 3 species. However, if we use uh, water as a nuclear fail, then the magnesium 5 oxo should be uh, further oxidized by one electron to form a, magne a formerly magnus 6 oxo and then react with water to form the magnus 4 peroxyl species. We try to 
uh, isolate or characterize this man, this six, uh, six oxo species, but it's too active, so uh, we cannot characterize at the cardinal stage. So this is the story about manganese uh, water oxidation catalyst. So in 2012, we used the DFD calculation to study the reaction, mag uh, the reaction mechanism of uh, manganese 3 and the IL-3 and the cobalt-3 species. Starting from this uh, metal-3 complexes, we can generate mag uh, 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 metal 5 oxo, and then water nuclear finish attack forms the, the metal 3 uh, all white species. And this water nuclear finish attack is a really determined step. So, in the next years, we can synthesize these complexes and we can compare their uh, water oxidation activity directly. As you can see, cobalt complexes is the most active one in this uh, series, which is consistent with our computational studies, indicating that the cobalt 5 oxo has the uh, lowest activation energy barrier to react with water to form the oil bond. So how to explain this uh, difference? We can uh, analyze their electronic structures, as you can see, because of the repulsion between metal D orbital and oxygen P orbital, then with the increase of the D electrons, the metal oxo becomes less stable or becomes more reactive. So in the case of manganese ion and uh, cobalt, the cobalt oxo has the highest uh, reactivity. So we can use this diagram to explain why cobalt oxo is the most uh, active one in this series. So based on these results, so we, we try to tune the, uh, the, what, uh, the activity of ion species. So in our studies, we can see if we use the base as the nuclear fail, because of ion 5 oxo, the, the transposition of the ion 5 oxo will be occupied by a hydroxyl group. Then this hydroxyl group we are pushed electron to the, the to the trans oxo to increase the electron density on the oxo, which is unfavorable for the uh, nuclear phenic attack. So what our question is whether we can improve the reaction by tuning the axo, uh, the, the trans position. You have so five minutes left. Okay. So we synthesize this uh, uh, ion buffering with the tethered emitter to protect the actual position. As you can see, by using the, uh, the emitter, which is neutral in charge, we can decrease the electron density of the uh, trans oxo from 0.5 to 0.4, which is uh, more favored for uh, nuclear fail. As you can see also, complex one is also much more active than complex two for uh, water oxidation. So finally, I will briefly talk about this uh, cobalt uh, copper complex. As, as, we, as I discussed uh, earlier, for nickel and the copper, it is very hard to form uh, oxo, terminal oxo or oxyl species for water oxidation. So for the copper, we, I will switch, I will uh, skip these slides. And for the copper, we studied the reaction mechanism and we think that we propose that uh, after one electron oxidation, the copper will form the copper hydroxyl group and then uh, undergo, undergo the bimolecular coupling to form the O bond. This species we can also characterize uh, through the electrochemical uh, by, by using electrochemical methods. Uh, Recently, we have uh, read up uh, a manuscript to summarize our recent works by using metal porphyrins as catalyst for uh, OER, NTR, and OR studies. In my talk today, I didn't talk about the OR studies, uh, but if you are interested, in, then you can find uh, this information in our recent accounts paper. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and also, I would, I would like to thank my, uh, all my students who made this uh, work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice talk, Professor Carl. Uh, since we are a little bit in, uh, behind in schedule, but uh, let's have one question if you have. Anybody has any? Oh, yeah. Please, Carl. Hi, uh, very nice talk. You, you proposed this Cobalt 5 OXO. Was that in the Corolla system? Yes. Uh, Trispenafluorophenyl uh, Corolla is exceedingly redox non innocent. What's your evidence for a Cobalt 5 OXO? Right, you oxidize the neutral Cobalt Corolla and you make Corolla radical. So I just, I, I'm struggling to see how this will support a, you know, a, a, a Cobalt 5 OXO. Oh, I, sorry, I'm talking about the full oxidation state. As you know, the oxidation may occur on the ligands, the cobalt, uh, the, the, coral, the, the coral ligand. So uh, in all my studies, I use the form oxidation state to, to, for simplicity to describe the oxidation uh, process. Sure, but then, if it, then how do we support a, a metal ligand multiple bond in the, in the case of an oxo? Um, I mean, again, what, what evidence do you have for the formation of that terminal oxo? We don't have uh, direct evidence to support the formation of this uh, copper oxo species. Uh, we are trying to, uh, we are focusing on these studies uh, in my lab to use uh, ligands, bulky ligands, to uh, stabilize this copper oxo species. But unfortunately, at this current stage, we don't have direct evidence. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's thank to the Professor Kao uh, for his uh, nice uh, series of uh, profiling chemistry. Okay, uh, okay uh, let me, uh, uh, please join me to thank to the all the speaker in the afternoon, Professor Carol Lei and Professor Jeong Jo and Professor Loi Kao uh, for their nice uh, contribution on this uh, symposium. <laughs> and I'd like to close this uh, session. Uh, we're gonna have a 15 minute uh, break uh, from now, so we're gonna get back to uh, the session, next session for uh, at the, uh, starting at the, uh, 4 p.m. and uh, have a good uh, coffee break. Okay.
now we may start again the biomimetic catalyst session. So, so I'm Yongmin Lee from Iwa Women's University. So next speaker is Professor Yuma Morimoto. So he received a PhD at Osaka University 2009 and under the supervision of Professor Shun Hukujumi. And then he moved to the, the Professor Shinobu Ito's lab on 2013 and uh, as a research assistant professor. Now he is uh, the assistant professor at Osaka University. And uh, please welcome to the Professor Yuma Morimoto. So, Today Thank he is going to talk are. about introduction of bond hardness into the analysis of hydrogen atom abstraction from alkane to the compound one model system. So please. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Long time no see, Lee Sensei. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to organizing committee for involving, involving me this uh, wonderful symposium. Uh, due to the very still strict quarantine rule, uh, I have to join this symposium on over Zoom. Uh, it's a bit sad. However, still, I'm very happy to share uh, Sorry, Yuma. ideas. Sorry, Yuma. And, uh, Yuma, please uh, share your the, the slide. OK, yeah. have an update uh, with you. And uh, oh, my biggest update show, yeah. is I had uh, my first kid last year, and uh, the second biggest update of my uh, for me is uh, titled here. So let's get started. So as many professors uh, showed in their introduction, uh, we can find many hem-containing enzymes in the bioorganisms, uh, and uh, especially. Uh, this kind of hemp containing stuff is found in human, insect, plants, and uh, for everything. And the most of those enzymes are known to uh, generate common reactive species, so-called uh, compound one. Uh, this species have oxide ligand and uh, uh, porphyrin ligand with one electron oxidation state, and the iron center have uh, uh, iron four oxidation state. So it has very strong uh, oxidative reactivity. So it's, it plays very important role in metabolisms. So here is an example. Um, uh, when the uh, enzyme have a, a substrate in the reactive center, uh, this reactive species abstract the hydrogen to form this kind of uh, carbon radical. And the successive process generate uh, such as uh, unsaturated product or alcohol. So uh, this initial hydrogen atom abstraction process is rate determining and uh, uh, oxidation position determining step. So very important step in the metabolism. So how can we uh, have a convince? Uh, this is a homolysis of CH bond. Uh, Professor Mayer uh, tackled to this problem by uh, showing linear energy uh, relationship between the uh, activation energy of the uh, CH oxidation and the uh, uh, bond dissociation energy of the substrate. By having many uh, a series of um, organic compounds with having different strengths of uh, CH bond from 68 to 90, uh, he showed this very beautiful uh, linear relationship. And at that time, he used this uh, model compound, uh, ruthenium 4 oxide species. After his very beautiful um, work, many researchers reported a similar type of the uh, analysis to evaluate their um, uh, compound's reactivity. And uh, so uh, this kind of plot, more than hundreds of uh, this kind of plot is reported to date. And uh, this uh, professor have a review paper for uh, this kind of plot. 
However, uh, this plot does not have very important information. So that is uh, uh, information of this region. So many cases, um, we utilize a substrate with a CH bond, uh, which uh, strongness is less than 90 kcal per mole. However, um, this kind of alkyne uh, substrate is hard to convert. And of course, uh, such alkyne conversion is much more important in the synthetic chemistry. So we'd like to uh, obtain this blank area's information. And the second question here is, what happens if we utilize uh, this type of compound one or its model complex for this type of uh, analysis of the reactivity? Of course, uh, some professors try to have it, and uh, not so many, but uh, uh, John Groves reported uh, this type of PDE and uh, log K plot uh, 2012. And uh, he utilized uh, such a benzylic substrate and uh, uh, cyclic alkane, or uh, this is a sort of terminal CH bond. And he uh, reported this type of uh, research. Uh, this work in this work uh, they utilize uh, power oxidase as the uh, model of the uh, compound one, and uh, this uh, power oxidase extracted from sort of a mushroom shows relatively long uh, lifetime for this reactive species, so he can obtain this plot. However, as you can see, this plot does not show clear linear relationship as shown as I shown in the former slide. Uh, it's a bit weird, but uh, uh, no one can clearly um, explain why the plot show this kind of curvature at that moment. And uh, so we think uh, we need to have a very nice model compound to approach this uh, weird behavior of the reactive species. Of course, uh, many synthetic chemists tried to uh, scrutinize the CH bond oxidation by uh, porphyrin oxide species. And the uh, uh, Newcomb is one of the uh, guy, and, uh, but uh, in his case also, such a benzylic substrate is the uh, sort of the limitation for his work because in model uh, study, uh, usually, we utilize uh, dichromosane or acetonitrile as the solvent. And of course, those solvents have a CH bond. And uh, those CH bond is not so uh, weak one, but still, uh, which can be oxidized by the compound one. So we always have to fight with such solvent oxidation. So um, our oxidation uh, experiment was very hard. So uh, in this work, I tried to utilize the, this uh, new type of organic solvent, uh, trifluorotriene. Uh, in this field, this uh, solvent is not so uh, familiar. However, um, this, this solvent have relatively high uh, oxidation uh, potential, uh, sorry, uh, oxidation potential. So benzene have uh, 1.4 something, but uh, this one, uh, due to the very electron withdrawing nature of this CF3 uh, substituent, um, it has a very high uh, oxidation potential. And the relative permeability is not so different from dichromethane's one, so it can be act as very good solvent for uh, this kind of synthetic porphyrin uh, system. So next, from next, I show the data of my work. So into the uh, iron three uh, tetraxyl porphyrin uh, chloride uh, complex, I introduced the ozone gas uh, slowly <coughs> and uh, in TFT solution at 30 degrees Celsius. And this is the uh, electronic spectral change during the reaction. So uh, this black line is a uh, spectrum of iron three species, and this red line is assignable to the iron four oxide, a porphyrin pyrotical cation species. And uh, of course, uh, if I use dichromethane as a solvent at this temperature, uh, we can't see a, a, a such a 
uh, characteristic absorption band due to uh, one electron oxidized species of porphyrin macrocyclic supporting ligand. So uh, here, this is 30 degrees C. Uh, we still can observe this absorption band. And uh, we further characterized this um, obtained species by uh, EPR. And this uh, EPR uh, spectra shows characteristic signals at z equal 4.3. 3.7 and uh, z equal to 2. This is a very characteristic one for the uh, iron 4 and uh, porphyrin radical species uh, with s equals 3 half uh, electronic structure. And uh, uh, this resonance Raman was taken at the room temperature, but uh, we can see the FeO uh, vibration band at 800 centimeter uh, inverse. Those EPR uh, data and uh, Resonance Raman band was very close to the uh, compound one model species uh, generated in very cooled down uh, dichloromethane solution, as you can show, uh, as you can see here. And uh, this is the decay process of generated compound one model species. So, uh, uh, waiting several seconds, we can see the decrease of this absorption band obeying uh, fast order kinetics. From here, uh, the lifetime of this species was determined to be 20 seconds at 30 degrees C. And uh, the um, final spectrum is very close to the original iron-3 uh, porphyrin complex. So almost 80% of the porphyrin goes back to the original iron-3 species, uh, iron-3 complex. And here is a comparison of the lifetime of compound one. The blue ones are the model systems reported by uh, Grubbs. Uh, it's in water. And these green ones are the um, lifetime of compound one of several uh, enzyme, uh, sy enzymatic systems. And uh, uh, those are known to show a relatively long lifetime uh, compared to the other uh, enzymes. And this is, this is my uh, compound one system. And obviously it has a very long lifetime and uh, we can go down the temperature to 10 degrees or minus 10 or minus 20. Uh, we can further elongate the lifetime of compound one. So uh, now we have the most clean system uh, to observe compound one in our hand. And uh, when, when we think, when I say, uh, I have very um, stable compound one, then people think this must be not reactive. But uh, that's wrong. Uh, here is the data. Um, into the solution of this iron four oxide species, uh, I put the uh, cyclohexane and the uh, absorption was uh, started to decrease like this. So by having a higher concentration of cyclohexane, this decay process was um, accelerated and the second order reaction rate constant was determined to be 1.1 times 10 to minus one, more inverse, sec inverse. So uh, this indicate stable is not equal to inactive. It's stable, but still active species. And uh, some of you probably uh, want to know about the oxidation process of uh, dichloromethane. So I bring this data here uh, into the solution. Uh, dichloromethane was uh, added as, uh, as shown in the former slide. And uh, this decay process was accelerated and the second order rate constant was uh, determined as well. And uh, this um, rate constant is not so uh, large one but still uh, comparable to um, oxidation rate constant of the cyclohexane or uh, other argon substrate. So as I say, uh, solvent oxidation is, was a very big problem to observe the compound one reaction uh, process. Then next, uh, I changed the substrate uh, from cyclohexane to normal butane or cyclooctane or deuterated cyclohexane or tetramethyl butane. Uh, this um, substrate only have primary CH group, but uh, we can see the acceleration of the decay process of compound one. And uh, obtained the second order rate constant was plotted against the bond dissociation energy of that substrate. 
And we can see this uh, tendency, uh, higher uh, CH bond dissociation energy substrate is hard to be oxidized. It's very straightforward. However, this plot seems not, not so straight. So again, I show the uh, graphs data. Uh, this data reminds uh, uh, this um, plot also uh, show this kind of weird, weird uh, behavior. And uh, at this moment, we do not have the clear reason of the uh, discarbature. So we, um, we decided to have further um, experiment for this phenomenon. Then uh, this porphyrin is uh, sort of okay, but uh, we, we'd like to have much higher uh, reactivity porphyrin. So uh, we introduced this dichlorophenyl group into the mesoposition position of the uh, porphyrin. And uh, we a re little bit changed the solvent condition and uh, uh, we again succeeded to generate iron oxide species in this reaction condition. Uh, after the introduction of ozone gas into the solution of this iron three porphyrin complex, uh, we see the clear formation of a characteristic absorption band around 700 nanometer. And this uh, resulting solution shows a characteristic EPL signals uh, due to this type of uh, reactive species. Then uh, again, we check the reactivity of this iron four oxide species uh, toward uh, cyclohexene. And uh, from the experiment, we determine the second order rate constant uh, at minus 40 degrees C as 1.4 molar inverse sec inverse. And uh, of course, in this reaction system, we introduced very strongly electron withdrawing group on the uh, macrocyclic group. So um, reactivity to the cyclohexene was uh, 200 times uh, enhanced compared to the former system. Then uh, this is a little bit uh, side talk, but um, <clears throat> so after the reaction, uh, porphyrin goes back to the original iron three complex. So if we have the continuous ozone gas flow, we can make the uh, oxidation reaction system be a catalytic one. And uh, we have the uh, turnover number of 200 times for the cyclohexane uh, catalytic oxidation. <laughs> And of course, this uh, compound one model complex can oxidize other kind of organic substrate like uh, cyclopentane, uh, uh, heptane, octane, normal butene, and uh, tetramethyl butene, as shown here. And uh, also, I, uh, we check the uh, reaction uh, by employing uh, this kind of cyclic ether or haloalkanes. And uh, we obtained a data set like this. Oh, oh, what's happened here? Uh, when I uh, saw this um, figure first time, uh, I, I became like this. But uh, um, in other viewpoints, it's very interesting uh, data. So we keep thinking about this uh, reason why we obtain this kind of very scattered data set. So, um, Let's go back to the uh, linear free energy relationship theory. So um, reaction coordinates can be um, simplified like the uh, cross section of two uh, parabola uh, curves like this. So if we have the uh, substrate with higher bond dissociation energy, then uh, this uh, top point of the parabola goes down like this and uh, concomitantly uh, the uh, activation energy get larger. So we can observe linear free energy relationship uh, when we change the substrate subsequently. But uh, then uh, when we think, uh, when we see this uh, figure very carefully, uh, we notice that we also have another parameter to describe this kind of uh, parabolic curve. And not only the top point of the uh, parabola, but also the curvature of the parabola. If we have the uh, parabola with different curvature, then of course we will have different uh, size activation energy. Then how can we um, parameterize this curvature of the parabolic curve? Then uh, let's go back to the um, uh, bachelor's classroom or the IR spectroscopy. 
So in the uh, bachelor's class, uh, we teach that um, vibration of um, CH bone or CO carbonyl bone uh, energy can be described with this uh, equation. And uh, this uh, K value is uh, a spring constant. So if we have very strong spring, uh, as shown here, uh, then this curvature gets a uh, sharp one, and uh, then uh, we will have the higher uh, bond fre vibration frequency. Then, uh, actually, uh, when we check the uh, CH bond vibration value for hierarchy or this kind of a cyclic ether, their uh, CH bond vibration energy is uh, largely different even though they are same CH bond. Then uh, I go, now I go back to the uh, former data set I shown in the former slide. And uh, please see this uh, orange uh, region. In this region, uh, we can have four data points. All of those substrate have same uh, CH bond uh, dissociation energy. So, uh, so this, but uh, their uh, reaction rate constant was differ by thousands times, huge difference. So uh, then um, in this plot, I plot the uh, reaction rate constant uh, against the uh, CH bond vibration energy like this. And uh, this plot shows very perfect linearity like this. So now, uh, then I tried to make the plot from the 2D one to 3D one like this. So this blue axis uh, is the bond dissociation energy of the substrate as I um, employed in this slide. And uh, this red axis is the CH bond vibration energy. And uh, this gray plane is the regression plane. To, uh, to explain the uh, reaction rate constant. And as you can see, we can nicely fit uh, the actual data with this gray, grayish uh, regression plane. The um, equation of this regression plane is shown here. Logarithm of K is um, 0.28 times BDE and uh, minus 0 0.0. One nine times uh, vibration energy of CH bond. Uh, in this case, the unit of CH bond vibration is centimeter inverse, and this is a constant. So when we have this kind of analysis, we have to care about the correlation of those two um, uh, factors. But uh, as you can see, this bond dissociation energy and the bond vibration energy do not have uh, any correlation. So those two values factors are very good indicator to describe this reaction system. And then this plot is um, to dimensionalize the uh, one of this uh, 3D plot. The uh, X uh, axis is the predicted log K value from this regression plane and this X value and Y values for those uh, substrate. And this uh, Y axis is the actual measured uh, logarithm K value. And uh, almost perfect uh, linearity was obtained for this uh, analysis. So uh, we can say this model is pretty good one to describe the uh, hydrogen abstraction by a compound one model complex. So uh, this is the uh, wrap, up, wrap up of my talk. So uh, to date, we only think about bond dissociation energy of the substrate. However, from now, now on, please let's think about the uh, bond's hardness. Uh, so uh, if you have soft CH bond, then uh, such CH bond should react faster than the CH bond with a harder uh, spring constant. So this is the acknowledgement, right? Uh, those uh, studies are done with Professor Shinobu Ito and the uh, students and shown here. And uh, when I started the porphyrin project, uh, Hiroshi Fujii in Nara Uman's university helped me very much. So uh, I'd like to thank here. And uh, I also want to say uh, thank you for those uh, budgets. And uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your kind listening.
So still we have a 10 minutes for discussion. Oh, oh my gosh. So, um, so uh, Rata part is not actually not published yet. So if you have some uh, uh, variable comment, it's very uh, helpful for me. So anyway, do you have any questions? Yeah, Professor Joe. Hi, Yuma. Hi. Very interesting. So, so based on your soft hard bond concept, so can you explain that the curvature? Originally, you showed the curvature of the strong so, strong CH bond. So in the uh, original curvature plot, uh, you utilize the substrate, uh, this one, and this one, and this yep. one, and this one. So if I only have those four or uh, five uh, substrate, uh, so plot Yuma, not seems- Yuma, we cannot see the, the slide. Oh, really? Wait a moment. So okay, now it's okay. Ah, okay. Sorry. Could you see this? Yes. So uh, on the original work, uh, we use uh, substrate uh, 2233 uh, tetramethyl butane here, and the cyclohexene, and the butene, and the cyclooctane, uh, heptene, and the pentene. So those um, data can't, can't have uh, any straight line. So uh, actually, um, for the tetramethyl data set, uh, I just have a very small number of points, so I do not do this analysis yet. But uh, if I use uh, this analysis, it should be um, uh, explainable, I think. OK. So I have a similar question. So mm -hmm. here, the what is the product of the? the... OK. So for the uh, alkyne uh, substrate case, uh, we determine the product as a uh, alcohol. However, for the hard alkyne case, we still could not uh, find the actual uh, uh, product. It should have a host. You may have a different BD values, actually. Right, right. So we observe the formation of alpha position oxidized product but uh, we still do not uh, um, uh, actually determine the beta position oxidation product not yet. However, we saw the alpha oxidation product here. So we have a discussion based on this position oxidation. So BDE value of this position and the bond vibration energy of this uh, alpha position. Yes, so, but uh, yes. as you said, it's very important point. Okay, Kello. Okay, Yuri, very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was wondering if your compound is so stable, why do you need such a strong oxidant like ozone ah, to get your uh, compound? Can you, can you generate it with some other oxidant? And that would explain maybe also you be need better evidence for your Raman. You see the stretch, which is like very weak, and you should also be able to show it's an iron oxygen stretch on the, by doing the weight tin leveling. Otherwise, it's difficult to convince people mm -hmm. that it's an iron oxygen vibration. So uh, it's, a, it's a very important point. For the tetramethyl case, of course, uh, we can utilize uh, MCPBA as an uh, oxidant. However, that case, uh, not reactive MCPBA or uh, MCBA, generated after the reaction can kill the compound one actually. However, ozone case after the oxygen atom transfer, it just generate O2 gas. So the system kept very clean actually. How about iodosobenzene? benzene? Uh, that case also. It's a uh, very quickly oxidized uh, benzene or I owe the benzene. So uh, it's not good oxidant for my system. So that is a kind of a very uh, secret important point to observe the compound one nicely. So how convenient is it to use uh, ozone in your chemistry? I mean, do you need so, any, do you need any uh, special setup or? 
uh, uh, today I do, I do not bring uh, any special picture of that, but uh, I buy um, uh, sort of very um, commercialized uh, ozone generator to have the ozone gas. However, normal uh, air gas is not good. Uh, highly purified oxygen gas is important to uh, have a nice ozone gas, actually. So you were kind of closing the cycle because the first time the OXO was generated with ozone and then all shifted to oxygen and hydrosobenzene and now you are coming back. So, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, what do you mean? Uh, no, I think uh, ozone is not a common oxidant these days to generate uh, metal oxo chemistry because of the inconvenience to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, inconvenience, however, we do like to have a clean compound one system, so okay. <laughs> we can't yeah. reap from the ozone actually. It's not so difficult actually. Okay, nice work. Yeah. Thank you very much. Other questions? So I have another question. Can you show me the pitting of the, the curvature line? Uh, this uh, one? Pit, pitting of the, the BD blood, pitting of the curvature line in your data. Uh, right? Okay, okay, formal one. Yeah, formal one. So like this, right? Yeah. Uh, this, uh, no, no, this one. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, uh, if you remove the, the cyclohexene first point, it may be very linear, actually, right? Cyclohexene, no, right? No, this per, one? First point. Ah, uh, octene. Yeah, uh, octene, yeah. Ah, uh, so yeah, but... Uh, okay. So you cannot say just uh, this is a curvature, this is a linear, something like that, right? Mm. So but, also, um, also you can as see I this, shown yeah. here, Groves also reported this kind of weird plot. Yeah, yeah, but in case of, for example, number A shows the hundred mm -hmm. times different from the pit, right? Uh, so okay. quite so different can from I, the. Can I show another uh, figure? This one is reported in 2021 uh, from the Biet Massimo Bietti and the Jim Mayer's uh, group. And in this case also, they reported that uh, oxidation of uh, saturated CH show this kind of very scattered plot, right? Yeah, right. So I think uh, uh, now I'm trying to, but uh, I think we can uh, explain this uh, scattered plot is uh, also uh, fitted by my uh, theory. But here we have to careful about the actually product. So you right. have acetonitrile case. What is oxidized? Acetonitrile is an oxidized and CH or the as a Professor Joe showed the something, the nitrile oxidation something like that. So yeah, yeah, right. you have uh, to so, check something product, right? So for for this plot, um, actually uh, we still have that kind of a problem that the cyano or nitromethane case, it a bit uh, complicated, so I just remove those plot from here, actually. Yeah. But another, anyway, yeah. product is very important, as you suggested. Yeah. Another question is, uh, you showed the cyclohexane oxidation, you got the 30% of a product, right? Right, right. So, do you see the cyclohexane on? Not all. So for that, uh, now we are uh, trying to have the beta varicose. Uh, it's very embarrassing, but uh, our team is not, not so good at uh, uh, quantify the amount of the oxidation product because uh, the system, I only just uh, employ uh, 28 micromolar of uh, compound one uh, species. And uh, so uh, compound one's yield would be not 100%. I guess it would be 85 or 90. So, uh, so you, you pointed out that, uh, where, where was it? This is, uh, this, this one, yeah, probably. Here. here. So yeah, yeah. so. It looks like uh, there is a selectivity, but actually you have an all and on together, right? So uh, actually we do not see uh, many amount of cyclohexanone for this uh, experiment, actually. We just missed the uh, 70% of the oxidized product here. 
So, so here is the uh, some uh, intercept, of course. Yeah. So this amount is um, uh, uselessly uh, consumed as uh, as for the uh, self decomposition. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If no questions, please join me to thank Professor Yuma Morimoto. Thank you very much. So next speaker is Professor uh, Junior Sir. So he received the PhD in um, 2013 from Brown University under the Professor Unsa Kim, under the supervision of Professor Unsa Kim. And then he did postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin, and then he moved to the GIST as an assistant professor. Now he is an associate professor at the same university. Please welcome to Professor So. Thank you for kind introduction. It was my great pleasure to serve as secretary for this wonderful symposium. And also very thankful to have uh, this chance to speak about my research. Uh, today I will talk about electrochemical reactions accompanied by structure reorganization of coordination complexes. Focusing on this complex, I will talk about a complementary role of sigma donor and pi acceptor, and also uh, the Lewis acidic site to promote the catalytic CO2 reduction and uh, proton reduction. In the morning session, uh, Professor Kara Brand explained very well the electrochemical proton reduction and CO2 reduction, and also uh, Professor Rui Kao uh, explained electrochemical oxygen evolution and also um, uh, proton reduction. Well, this time I will talk about our a little different aspect for uh, looking at this uh, electrocatalytic CO2 reduction and uh, proton reduction. Uh, we are living in large fuel cell. Uh, starting from solar energy, CO2 is reduced to carbohydrate, uh, and carbohydrate is decomposed to CO2 and uh, hydrogen molecule. Definitely, uh, ion-ion hydrogenase involved in the proton reduction uh, process. And then another type of hydrogenase, uh, nickel ion hydrogenase, involved the hydrogen splitting uh, pathway uh, for methanogenesis uh, reaction. And uh, next, the methane uh, is oxidized to methanol and so on. So uh, we cannot uh, avoid thinking the redox chemistry uh, as long as we are living in Earth. So uh, we also thinking the reductive reaction and oxidative reaction in our uh, research lab. Um, we try to balance charges in our small lab. Uh, so in one part, we study oxidative reaction, which is oxygen evolution uh, to generate electron. And the other side, we are studying uh, reductive chemistry. Um, and this uh, uh, figure uh, represents well uh, what we are thinking. We start our idea starting from the uh, metal enzyme, two kinds of metal enzyme. One is uh, the left side is hydrogenase for proton reduction, and the other side uh, we have formated hydrogenase for CO2 reduction. When electron enter this system, uh, electron is transferred uh, to active site through ion surface cluster, which is a natural conduit and a proton is transferred through the proton channel to the active site, so we can see proton reduction to hydrogen gas. Uh, and 
Formal dehydrogenase also um, use ion surface cluster for electron transfer, and uh, the active site uh, catalyzes the reversible CO2 reduction to formate and formate oxidation to CO2. At this time, uh, proton transfer uh, should be very critical. Well, natural system uh, quite well uh, control this uh, transfer of substrate and product, but uh, the problem in um, reaction condition of uh, flask in the lab, uh, we have uh, issues, I mean uh, problems to transfer proton and electron uh, selectively for a selective CO2 reduction. When active site uh, has electron, the, we have to think of some electrochemical reorganization of coordination and complex. If you look at, as you know well, the ion ion hydrogenase active site has this type of structure. We only know a fixed structure. However, uh, the enzyme always moves and changes the structure. Uh, as you know here, uh, carbon monoxide bridges into ion center. At some point, ion and carbon monoxide bridges are dissociated and shifted to the carbon monoxide shift to one ion site. And definitely, the pi uh, accepting ability make ion site electron deficient slightly and uh, help to. Uh, transfer electron to the active site. So then the low spin ion site will catalyze proton reduction of, uh, to generate H2 gas. Well, following the Marcus conception, uh, we can think some uh, ground state uh, moves the, uh, changes the coordination structure. And as, uh, reaching some point, uh, definitely electron efficiently transfers uh, the, the complexes, complex and uh, structural reorganization. Electrochemical reaction is accompanied by uh, this structure uh, reorganization. And also, uh, we see a similar uh, pattern uh, in a form of dehydrogenase active site. Well, this time, definitely had, uh, the enzyme active site has a different coordination uh, environment. Well, the enzyme used high volume metal oxide, so it should uh, need uh, redox active dithal one ligand. Ion surface cluster transfer electron to this complex active site, and diethylene will accept electron through a p-terrain structure. When electron uh, comes in this active site, uh, the molyoxo or tungsten oxo react with CO2 to uh, generate formate. However, I mean, this type of molecule has been synthesized and uh, has been studied uh, enormously, uh, so we have uh, many uh, catalysts, a similar structure uh, as this active site for proton reduction and other electrocatalytic reaction. But however, we don't have yet a uh, functional model to successfully, successfully working, uh, to successfully work for CO2 reduction. We are studying this uh, enzyme model, but uh, today will not, uh, I will not talk about this uh, this study, but I will focus on other uh, system. Uh, but what I want to say here is the outside amino acid also involved in the structural reorganization. Uh, so this also follows the the micro consumption. So uh, today I will talk about focusing on this complex. I will talk first uh, the design um, of this complex. Uh, with uh, three uh, reasons. Here's, well, as we know, the pyridine is ambivalent sigma donating and a pi accepting uh, ligand. So, uh, and also uh, this multi dentate NNN type coordination is civilized high spin and cobalt site. Well, cobalt site is surrounded by six neutral and donors. And transposition, we have strong pi acceptor here. Pi acceptor will uh, modulate the electronic property of pyridine. And we have another uh, 
a tool to control the reactivity uh, outside in the secondary coordination sphere, which is uh, released basic amine site, uh, this functional group will stabilize um, CO2 reduction intermediate during the electrochemistry. Um, what I want to say here, and we are, what we are interested in, a little bloody, yes, here. Um, if we don't have electron, the complex is quite well saturated and stabilized by uh, neutral and donors. So uh, I think the complex is happy now, so it will not uh, react with uh, substrate. We tried by calculation to um, uh, reorganize the structure without inputting electron. However, it always come back uh, to initial complex. So we tried to dissociate the cobalt nitrogen ligand bone. However, it didn't work. So it will not react with a CO2 uh, for our interest. However, if we put input electron into the system, the a complex will naturally dissociate cobalt nitrogen uh, upside down, uh, cobalt nitrogen bond, and smoothly react with the CO2 and it goes more. So I'll talk about the mechanism later. So this is what we are studying. Uh, we are studying the electrocatalytic reaction, uh, but we are interested in uh, structural reorganization of the complex. In the nature, uh, in nature um, electron is transferred between cathodic side and anodic side. However, we are studying half cell reaction, so we are using potential stat. So the electrode surface uh, transfer electron to the complex, and a complex uh, will experience electrochemical reorganization. Uh, so uh, and uh, to make a reactive site. When the complex uh, reorganizes the structure and open reaction site, then it is uh, uh, opened to a substrate for reaction, further reaction. Uh, in our interest, research interest, we input the proton or CO2 to the active site so we can see CO2 reduction or proton reduction. So we uh, design complex with uh, different coordination uh, ligand and try to find new pathway for uh, CO2 reduction or proton reduction. I will compare two complexes here. Uh, basically very similar structure, but uh, each complex has quite a little different pi acceptor. Uh, by period in structure, definitely is a pi uh, acceptor, strong pi acceptor. Uh, but the rigidity uh, make uh, uh, pi accepting ability a little uh, stronger. Um, the six uh, neutral and donors make uh, the cobalt site a high spin state with three unpaired electron, but the multi dentate ligation stabilize uh, the complex during the electrochemistry and a further reaction. However, the slight difference of a pi acceptor ligand changes uh, completely the um, uh, further reaction behavior. Uh, after inputting two electron, the left side with bipyridine ligand, uh, it experienced conventional type of cobalt and solvent uh, dissociation or cleavage. However, if you have a stronger pi acceptor of phenanthrolene, then the cobalt nitrogen bond of cytoarm is cleaved and uh, making new reaction pathway for CO2 reduction. Uh, first, I have to say I'm sorry for not showing real data because it's not uh, submitted yet, but uh, at this point, please believe me with this number. So <laughs> Uh, hopefully, I can show real data later. Uh, so, uh, we tested and uh, we studied the chemical reduction with this complex uh, by using sodium uh, mercury amalgam to reduce the complex. When you put two electrons in a serial solvent, 
The left complex only showed one uh, CL1 uh, CN uh, stretching frequency, uh, but uh, the wave number shifted to a lower number, which means stronger uh, pi accepting uh, from the cobalt center. Uh, but right side, uh, we saw a new uh, CN uh, frequency peak. Uh, after two electron reduction in a zero nitrogen solvent, a zero nitrogen solvent uh, was uh, bound uh, after dissociating the cobalt nitrogen bond here. So we know um, the structural reorganization uh, happened differently uh, because of the pi, a stronger pi accepted ligand. Here we followed um, the chemistry using DFT calculation. Uh, we compare the upper part with a furantolone ligand. We see a quite similar uh, bond uh, structure parameter. But if you look at the cobalt nitrogen arm distance, it was elongated. Well, there's a, well, not really big uh, numbers, but uh, I want to say a trend is consistent with what we observed with IR uh, spectrum. Uh, but the pyridine, by pyridine complex here, we can see uh, the cobalt arm bond, well, a little bit elongated, but st uh, still uh, not really um, big number. So which means the complex is quite stable, and cobalt the nitrogen bond is quite a uh, uh, small number, which means also uh, the complex is very stable and cobalt pyridine bond uh, became close. Um, this uh, spin density also tells consistently uh, what we are thinking. The Phenantrolin complex, after one electron reduction and a two electron reduction, the electron density stays between a cobalt and a phenantrolin ligand. However, uh, pyridine case, one electron looks similar. However, uh, further reduction uh, shifted the electron density a little bit. So the electron density is slightly, uh, some amount of electron density is delocalized into the cobalt and pyridine bond which also tells a stable complex, a stability of this uh, complex without cobalt nitrogen bond dissociation. So why we care about this in a structural reorganization? Uh, first the reduction uh, of the complex is relatively easy. Uh, we can see cobalt to one reduction about minus one, uh, minus one voltage versus uh, ferrocene. Um, However, I mean, second reduction uh, is issue. Well, uh, we assign currently uh, the, well, I have to correct the comment. Well, cobalt to one reduction uh, happens easily, but this time we assign um, the first reduction as ligand and cobalt mixed uh, reduction because the electron density was delocalized almost evenly between a cobalt and the ligand. But second reduction are mostly on uh, the strong pi acceptor, by pyridine or phenanthroline. So the pi acceptor ligand uh, uh, will behave like a redox active uh, um, moiety, so to, um, to have the second reduction. Um, this structural reorganization uh, made some uh, difference between these complexes. Uh, again, I'm only giving some numbers here. Uh, the catalytic activity, we can see uh, some difference, but the onset potential looks similar because the secondary reduction is dependent on uh, the pi oxidal ligand by pyridine and phenanthrolene. Uh, gives a similar uh, reduction activity. Uh, but ICAT IP value uh, is a little bit, well, I, I cannot say is a huge uh, enhancement with this phenanthrolene. Uh, however, there is still some uh, increasement of uh, catalytic efficiency. But the catalytic efficiency shows a phenanthrolene complex uh, has higher uh, catalytic activity and also selectivity uh, compared to proton reduction. Uh, 
uh, almost a doubled number uh, we could see with this phenylethylene complex compared to uh, bipyridine complex. So I want to say strong pioacceptyl uh, ligand enabled further reduction on the complex uh, without uh, reducing uh, directly the cobalt site. And this unconventional reorganization pattern opens a new reaction pathway for catalytic CO2 reduction. So uh, this is what we are interested in. Try to find a continuously new uh, reduction pathway, reaction pathway for uh, inert substrates subs uh, such as CO2. Well, here again, uh, after inputting one electron into uh, the system, we could see uh, structural reorganization uh, is opening the cobalt and uh, bond here. And then uh, the reaction uh, goes smoothly uh, as the dissociating, dissociating another, uh, uh, here another, another, here's a solvent ligand from the cobalt side and opens widely the reaction site. And CO2 reacts with the cobalt site. And then um, uh, the re reduction intermediate was further stabilized by uh, outer Lewis basic amine site through the hydrogen bonding interaction. So as you look at here, uh, the nitrogen and uh, CO2 uh, H here, so the distance is almost 1.7, so it is uh, in the uh, cause uh, distance to re uh, interact each other. So it should uh, stabilize quite well the reduction intermediate. However, um, uh, still, the, what the proton transferred, the intermediate is well stabilized. However, still we think the proton transfer step is rate determining step uh, because we have to use proton source of high, large pKa value. We tested uh, this uh, experiment, this reaction using water uh, as a proton source, but H2O gave us a little higher reaction rate. Well, in this Porvex diagram, uh, the relation of potential and pKa value, what well, this is about the proton reduction case, well, in this condition of ha applying high uh, reduction potential, well, we don't have uh, much choice to, uh, for uh, acid. We have to use large pKa value because if you use stronger acid, then uh, proton reduction will be dominant. So to get uh, CO2 reduction, we have to increase the pKa value. So the trifluoroethanol is almost the limit we can use for CO2 reduction for our complex. Um, here is, uh, but still, I can say, I want to say, um, uh, that we, our complex has selectivity for CO2 reduction uh, compared to proton reduction because of the pi acceptor ligand. In the comparison of this uh, pi acceptor ligand and here's without the pi acceptor ligand. Uh, this case, this complex shows a much higher onset potential, I mean a redu reduction potential, minus 2.1, 2 2 .1, but the pi acceptor made that the onset potential uh, shifted a uh, shift to a more positive way. And ICAD IP value is uh, much higher than this complex. And surely uh, the selectivity is much higher with uh, this uh, pi acceptor ligand. And also we could see uh, selectivity for proton reduction. Uh, but uh, this time is, uh, the result is uh, opposite for, uh, for proton reduction. Uh, this complex shows higher uh, reduc reduction current, uh, but uh, the phenylethylene ligand rather suppressed the proton reduction uh, activity, which was interesting. But uh, we can understand uh, understand easily if you think uh, the reduction uh, process. I will 
talk more about this uh, chemistry. So here's uh, the complex similar NNN uh, donor set, but without a pi oxide ligand. Uh, we always have to think uh, when we deal with a cobalt complex, we have to think stability because cobalt uh, sometimes, I mean, normally, high spin cobalt is not stable uh, during the electrochemistry. So we have to think stably, uh, stability and I have to double check uh, after catal catalysis. So we uh, commonly uh, check stability after uh, electrocatalysis. Uh, by rinse test, which means assuming uh, some uh, possibility of uh, generation of nanoparticle. So after catalytic reaction, we um, check, uh, after rinsing uh, the electrode, we check. But this time, uh, this uh, random sepsic analysis tells uh, the complex behaves as homogeneous complex in, in uh, organic solvent. Uh, this linear relations of Cat, cat, uh, the current and scan rate uh, tells and this complex is quite stable in this uh, organic solvent, or which is acetonitrile. And we compared here uh, two complexes, which has uh, outer loose acetic amine site, and the other doesn't have. In comparison, we see both has a high spin cobalt ion. Uh, with three unpaired electron. But the presence of the loose basic site in secondary coordination sphere uh, shifted the, the onset potential and also uh, the catal uh, half catalytic potential. And also E half value was shifted uh, to a more positive uh, direction, which is quite um, understandable because uh, the amine site surely uh, assist the proton reduction and also um, it will react as a proton delivery agent uh, during the electrochemistry. I will explain it here uh, later. Um, the electrochemical reorganization uh, behavior was quite different from the previous case, uh, we, we, which has a strong pi acceptor ligand. But this time, one electron reduction uh, made this uh, structural reorganization as leaving uh, the cobalt acetonitrile uh, ligand. After one electron reduction, we could see uh, this uh, IR uh, spectrum, which represents uh, one acetonitrile dissociated. And this uh, reaction is energetically favored. So we could draw this reaction pathway. After one electron reduction, the cobalt one is generated and uh, we are using a strong acid. So this amine site can be protonated. And then a proton can be transferred to cobalt one site uh, to make a cobalt three hydride. And a cobalt three hydride can react with proton uh, to finally generate H2 uh, molecule, or uh, we can, I, I didn't draw here, but we can also think uh, cobalt site, one side can react directly with external proton, uh, and then uh, another protonation on the amine site can make uh, H2 production. Um, well, after looking at this uh, chemistry with a cobalt complex, we were interested in uh, to see uh, the electrochemical reorganization by proton NMR uh, spectrum. So we synthesized, we changed the metal ion center uh, to uh, ion. ion. So uh, the low spin ion complex, uh, additionally with uh, this strong pi acceptor and sigma donor, uh, isonitrile ligand, we could see the complex uh, by proton NMR spectrum. Uh, but uh, we could see a quite different reactivity with this complex after adding one electron. We uh, followed this chemistry uh, again by chemical reduction. 
So after one electron reduction, uh, we uh, checked proton nanomar, but we saw, uh, interestingly, only ion zero species and ion two species. And after two electron reduction, uh, completely ion zero species appeared. And also in IR spectrum, we could see only ion zero and ion two species. So here, this time, the ion one complex experienced disproportionation to ion zero and ion two. Two ion one species involved this chemistry, so um, we followed this. Uh, uh, we we uh, under we can understand uh, this reaction uh, by electrochemistry uh, too. In electrochemistry, what well, we collected uh, cyclovoltamograms, uh, assuming this uh, maximum reduction current is the point of uh, initial concentration of the ion one species, and we scan more and return uh, at the return potential, and scan back up to the maximum anodic current. Then we can think this time as reaction time. So following the second order equation, uh, we can uh, calculate here. And also current and uh, concentration of complex has a linear uh, relation. So uh, we can uh, make this equation. So then, sure. So then uh, we calculate uh, the half time, uh, half time for this uh, disproportionation reaction. So uh, we could get these numbers. The complex uh, was disproportionated uh, to a half amount of the complex at uh, in within nine seconds. Well, it's not really fast, but uh, still uh, fast in a second uh, time scale. So after two electron reduction, uh, the complex uh, was reorganized like this and has uh, active ion zero site. And when we, when we put proton in the solution, the ion catalyzed proton reduction. Uh, in this uh, reaction pathway, uh, we uh, explained the ion site experienced two electron reduction accompanied by this structural reorganization. And then uh, proton is transferred to the ion site, making ion uh, hydride to hydride, and ion hydride react with proton to generate H2 gas. In previous work from Ruffus group, uh, they uh, detected that the, well, they used the ion, uh, ion system, and they detected the ion hydride, and also pi back donation and protonation, hydrogenation of isonitrile. We tried, well, actually, we got some RV comment, so we tried to detect ion hydride at low uh, temperature, and also uh, we are interested in uh, some uh, how pi back donation, but uh, unfortunately, we couldn't detect. But from our uh, TFT calculation, we could see some possible uh, possible pi back donation uh, because we could uh, we saw some bent uh, structure of isonitrile ligand. So here is a summary. Uh, uh, we detected a structural reorganization uh, during the two electron reduction process of the the complex with the pi acceptor ligand. And the complementary combination of NNN type sigma donor and pi acceptor retained the highly active cobalt site to promote electrocatalytic CO2 reduction. And the strong pi acceptor lowered the barrier energy of cobalt nitrogen uh, bond dissociation and uh, gave us new pathway for selective CO2 reduction. And also, Louis' uh, basic amine site could stabilize the CO2 reduction intermediate through the hydrogen bonding interaction. Uh, without, uh, pro without the pi acceptor ligand, uh, we also look at the electrochemical uh, reaction. But that time, one electron reduction was uh, accompanied by cobalt acetonitrile ligand uh, 
bond dissociation, and a cobalt-1 site was the active site to catalyze proton reduction. However, it, when it changed the metal ion to ions, ion ion, and the two electron reduction was accompanied by uh, the ion and terbutyl isonitrile bond dissociation. And the ion zero site was the active for uh, proton reduction. At this time, interestingly, we could see one electron reduced ion one site experienced disproportionation to ion two and ion zero. So, uh, but I mean, after a long summary, I want to say uh, simply what we are doing is we try to find new electrochemical reorganization pattern and try to find a new uh, pathway uh, for kettle, uh, for CO2 conversion uh, and H2 formation. So here is our uh, group, and we try to uh, find a new pathway for CO2 reduction and proton reduction. Thank you for listening. Here is, yes. So now discussion time. Do you have any questions? Oh, uh, Professor Xiaodong Xiao in the Zoom. YouTube. Yeah. So, can the molecule catalyst be? Uh, so for the cobalt molecule catalyst uh, you mentioned in here, what's the main product for the CO2 reduction? Oh, it was carbon monoxide. We tried to detect the form it, but we couldn't. But this complex only active for CO2 reduction to uh, carbon monoxide. So second question is, can uh, the when electron is uh, put to the, the cobalt complex, why the upper side bond is only cleavage, despite so, of having the, the same bond at the opposite side? Opposite side? Yeah, upper and down. Oh, yes. Uh, we meant one of the NN and bond. Well, probably one, one not really uh, selected between the upper cobalt nitrogen and down nitrogen, uh, but one of them is dissociated, so we cannot... Uh, oh, symmetrical, right? So one of them... One of them, yes. And the next question is, can the molecule catalyst be stable under the higher over potential or high <sighs> current densities? Right, that is uh, one uh, issue we have to work more. Um, well, molecule catalyst always has some issue of stability uh, applying, uh, is, uh, particularly in the condition applying high uh, reduction and potential. So, well, maybe that is the reason we have small number, I mean, relatively, uh, not 100% Faraday efficiency. So we have to uh, always uh, struggle uh, with that uh, stability issue. But this complex showed uh, quite a stable behavior uh, during that, uh, like uh, we did a CPE for one hour, so during the time, uh, it was okay, but uh, if you increase, well, we uh, repeated many times the CPE uh, reaction, but uh, we could uh, make that applying potential like a minus 2.1 uh, or 2. If you go higher, like minus 3, we didn't uh, go above minus 3, but we uh, tested uh, like minus 2.5, but the complex didn't uh, behave like what we see lower. Potential. So since time is limited, so... Oh, Kara has... Oh, Kara? Yeah. Yeah, I may need to last take question. time. Yeah. Um, you did your Randall Sepchik analysis in sort of a limited range of potentials. I was wondering, did you do that at lower potentials as well without a proton source, see if you get the same behavior? Because at the lower potentials, you're more likely to get that 
nanoparticle deposition. Uh, right. Uh, what well, I didn't show here is CB of our all complexes, but if you go lower, lower potential, uh, that complex shows irreversible behavior because structural reorganization happened. So it loses one side of cobalt nitrogen bond. So it is not uh, anymore uh, duck shape. So it uh, only irreversible. But the, um, the linear dependence, well, we cannot say a linear dependence in that case, but uh, it was okay. I mean, in terms of, yeah, the relation. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, just a simple question so for the student. So the coordinated acetonitri when coordinated acetonitri is released, why frequency is reduced? Uh, or you go to 2,200 to go to the 2,100 oh, something? Uh, uh, what well, we, we did uh, that chemical reduction in acetyl nitrate solvent yeah. So it is released, but it repeatedly binds again. So we, what we see is a uh, solvent-bound one. But in the condition of applying continuous potential, definitely it will open for a substrate okay. for further reaction. So thank you. So thank please you. join me to thanks to Professor So. So next speak is Professor Akira Onoda. So he received the PhD from Osaka University 2002. And then he was the assistant professor at Tokyo University in 2003. And then he moved to the Osaka University as an assistant professor in 2008 and the associate professor 2013. And then finally he moved to the Hokkaido University in 2020 as a full professor. So Professor Okida, please join me to welcome to Professor the Onoda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee. Can you hear me? Please, all right. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the Professor Wang Wunam, Professor Minghee Lee, and Professor Song Jun Lee to give this great opportunity. And I really respect this. Uh, I mean, amazing organization of this hybrid uh, symposium. I, uh, so uh, today, uh, I would like to share with you of our, I mean, recent progress uh, in my group that. Uh, the work about the direct evolution of the rhodium complex linked by habit catalyst. So let, let us start up with the acknowledgement also. So uh, I have been work long uh, with the Professor Takashi Hayashi with now Osaka University and and they moved to here for two years ago. But uh, today I would like to share the work which I worked with the students in uh, Osaka University. Okay, here's an outline. I would start with to introduce our, uh, I mean, the kind of biohabit catalyst uh, at the beginning. I, I, we worked on them almost 10 years. And then uh, I would like to share the recent results, uh, how we combine with the, uh, our protein with the CP star rhodium complex, and then how we apply this system to the uh, um, direct evolution. Okay, so uh, I mean, uh, yesterday also, uh, today we have a lot of beautiful, great, and great work about the uh, chemical catalysts, also for uh, bio catalysts. So, I mean, uh, we have the general interest how we bridge this chemical synthesis and uh, bio catalysis. And of course, the, the uh, Professor Francis R. showed that the evolution with the bio catalysis leads to the uh, new catalysts for the uh, non-natural reactions, and also the I mean, combination of tandem catalysis with the chemical catalyst and the bio catalyst is really useful. This is already uh, applied in uh, 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 I mean, production of uh, uh, drugs, and artificial metal enzyme that uh, complements to un the unique feature of this uh, catalyst is still, I mean, uh, uh, many, many uh, open spaces to, to be developed. Okay, so 
I'd like to uh, briefly introduce the artificial metal enzyme or, I mean, artificial metal enzyme is a bit difficult to pronounce for, in particular Japanese, I like to use it by hybrid catalyst, basically the same meaning. And I mean, the chemical catalyst provides us the natural reactions or the wide supra scope. And then biology offers us, I mean, optimizable second coordination sphere or the, uh, to, to make the radio and then angioselective uh, reactions. So then to combine these two unique features has been uh, initiated uh, many years ago by the, uh, as, we, as known as a, a Professor Joseph Whiteside work, and he showed this, uh, I mean, it works I mean, to do the endonatural reaction in the protein in the scaffold. So since there are many, many approaches to link this synthetic catalyst and the protein scaffold has been reported, so that data anchoring with the coordination or cobalt bonding or the supermercury anchoring using the strip diving body system has been already shown. Uh, and uh, it's really powerful for the many types of, of reactions. And actually this, uh, in, ten, in this 10 years, there's a, uh, great advance or there are very unique and very elegant systems have been developed. As you see in the left side, a strip diabetic system enables the, uh, this kind of uh, enantial selective cycle addition reaction catalyzed by CPSTA rodent complex and iridium porphyrin, blood porphyrin in the myoglobin or other HRP matrix also has been shown to catalyze very unique reactions. So, I mean, uh, these are enabled by the second engineering of the secondary coordination environment. So, and how we accelerate this engineering. So, this was, uh, I mean, shown and, the, uh, I mean, uh, developed by the pro Professor Francis Arnold and also the Professor Mans Reeds in uh, uh, metal enzyme uh, engineering. And, also, uh, I think that one who is in, in the uh, in this conference has also shown uh, uh, several years ago that show this protein assembly system can be evolved in in vivo or whole cell system. Or the non-natural amino acid combination is also very useful to do the uh, uh, making the library and uh, engineering the huge. Uh, surveying a huge uh, sequence space for this uh, metal enzyme engineering by direct evolution or high throughput screening. Okay, uh, in this background, uh, our group is also working to construct the uh, artificial metal enzyme or biohead catalyst and uh, using the quite rigid uh, as protein scaffold. Uh, and then we have here, you see the some examples we, where we have uh, play around uh, with the combination of this protein scaffold, CP rodent complex or grab catalyst or other a diiron or copper complex. I will briefly show some of the examples. And uh, okay, let me start with the design at the beginning when we uh, initiate this project. So, oh, I mean, the metal complex should be, uh, I mean, metal ions should be stably linked in the ligand. That's why we selected the CPIC complex and the malaimide group is used to link with the system ready zoo, which we can, I mean, sele selectively and versatilely design in the uh, protein cavity. And the protein we selected is a nitro binding protein, which is relatively small, easy to handle. And um, uh, this protein has a rigid, uh, quite robust, 10 strand beta barrel. Uh, I can show some uh, model. This, it's really rigid. Uh, this is what I can do from office. So uh, it's really rigid protein. And even it's cr easy, easily crystallizable in the APO form without the cofactor. Okay, here's one example. We uh, solve the structure of the CP, CP rhodium complex in the cavity. And it's really nicely fitted, embedded in the hydrophobic part of this cavity, because this cavity is inherently contains a heme. 
Okay, and then we also uh, demonstrate the uh, polymerization of the phenyl acetylene using this uh, uh, rhodium link nitrobinding, and we see some uh, polymer with a higher trans content, which is basically cis is more predominant in when we do the polymerization in the catalyst. I mean, we have also shown that. Uh, that the uh, construction of, of the bihybrid catalyst containing a diiron complex, which generates the hydrogen in the in a photocatalytic manner, mm -hmm. and of course we can tune the secondary coordination sphere. And I mean, we also have a nice work have that engineering the uh, secondary coordination sphere of the synthetic system. I mean, also in the protein system, we can show this uh, glutamate. Uh, in, in cooperation is quite uh, sufficient for improve the hydrogen world evolving uh, activity. Or, or in other cases, we also you this protein cavity is useful to link the even the organic molecule. So uh, this other reaction is very a benchmark type of the reaction when the copper linked uh, artificial metal enzymes. And we also try some system the two pyridine, but it does not work well. And uh, on the left, the Professor Loeff's group showed very uh, elegantly this uh, dimer dimer protein showed a higher enantial selectivity. And we try this try to use this cavity as a substrate recognition in, in the cavity of nitro binding. So we tried to conjugate some. Uh, the benzyl or naphtyl or pyrene molecule with the, uh, attached with the malimide group, uh, which can be linked with the cysteine in, the, in our nitro binding protein. And we do, I mean, we found out that this, uh, in the case of pyrene, is connected in, in this protein cavity. The substrate, uh, diazacalcone, is nicely fitted in this uh, I mean, engineered cavity. That's why we do this. The, uh, this other uh, uh, this other reaction in the presence of copper, we see a quite high enantial selective uh, product. So the nitro binding is quite uh, quite rigid, so it is easily designable for the not only for the metal catalyst, but as well as this kind of uh, I mean uh, to incorporate uh, the organic entity for the substrate recognitions. Okay, and yeah, they moved on to the cypister rhodium complex. So, I mean, cypister rhodium complex is quite, uh, I mean, a very useful and very powerful uh, catalyst that catalyzes a variety of stage bond activation, alkylation, or alkylation aminations. So, of course, there's a couple examples uh, reported by the uh, uh, Ward and Ravis group is, and they, uh, as I showed before at the beginning, so this CBC rhodium linked strip abiding, the artificial metal enzyme catalyst cycle addition reactions. Okay, but the CBC rhodium complex in MIF3, the vacant co free coordination site is attached everywhere. And then we, our group used a system to conjugate the CBC rhodium complex. So we need have to solve this uh, problem. Otherwise, this uh, this cypress around could attach directly to the uh, system or the other uh, basic side of the proteins. So here's the idea to overcome this uh, problem. So we first generate the uh, a kind of a mask, the cypress around complex, the mask ligand, protect ligand, and this latent form of the complex is specifically conjugated on the specific side of, uh, of the protein using cysteine. And after the conjugation, we can cleave this protective ligands by the addition of silver. So we can generate the active form of this CP steroidin linked uh, protein. So we found this conjugation method really uh, works pretty well in a, in a, of course, in a purified protein system or the, even an equalized surface or cell lysate. So I will uh, share uh, how it works. So uh, at the beginning here, I want to sh uh, show how we start the screening. So 
I mean, the, the protected ligand should be should have the higher uh, ligand, uh, higher uh, bind, uh, binding compared with the cysteine. So we use this kind of, uh, I mean, bidentate or tridentate ligand, the thiocarbamine or the uh, thioacid or the thiophosphate ligands, as you see here. So, and then to check the uh, activity, we have selected the uh, this to substrate of the uh, oxime and the diphenyl acetylene forming this isokinolin derivative so this product is uh, efflorescent in in some content of the solvent and there's a two region isomer both is fluorescent and then we can uh, test this recovery of activity using this uh, this reaction so if you do the reaction of cpc rhodium dichloride Activity is, of course, uh, pretty high, but the protective ligands with one, two, three, four does not a good high recovery in the presence of silver or other metals, and relatively high in the combination with silver. But the, uh, the complex rhodium-5 with the, the thiophosphate ligand has pretty high recovery, which is at the similar level of this cp or dichloride complex. So we found that the cp rhodium complex with that type of phosphate ligand works pretty well. Uh, the recovery is quite well. So, and then we tried the uh, addition of the silver and then confirmed this product by ESM tof ms We actually see this ligand is cleaved after the, the silver addition. Okay, and then we also tried the, how, how it works in the conjugation. So here's a, uh, uh, we, confirmed by mass spec, and then here's a nitro binding on the left top, and then we mix with the rhodium-6. We see the uh, specific conjugation and a nice shift. But if we treat it with NB5, so the protective ligands, CP7 protective ligands, we don't see any uh, conjugate, neither adduct formation. But if we mix with the CP7 rhodium dichloride, this complex attaches everywhere on the protein surface. So this really pr clearly proves that our protective, I mean, the conjugation using a light ligand is uh, uh, quite useful. Okay, and how about the activity? So we performed the cycle addition uh, reaction of oxime and alkyne, producing the fluorescence isokinolin product. And we see it's not that great yield, but we, uh, we see the, uh, clear difference in the only in the case of the a silver in the solution. Okay, and then we compare this with the other CP serodium or other, I mean, uh, the CP serodium complex without the protein, they are pretty high, but uh, at least this works uh, in, in the, uh, after we conjugate in the protein. So we should, uh, we try to improve this by uh, protein engineering. I mean, the reason might be it is basically protected in, in, in the protein cavity. So, and then we, we have a bunch of uh, library after working on many years. So we tried this one uh, variant with the L100E variant. It has, uh, and then we tested those, uh, uh, those variant with the CP star rotten complex. And this variant, on the, even in other position with the glutamate ligand is pretty high, uh, a little bit higher yield in the, in the range of 20%. And then we add more glutamate ligand around the CP star rhodium complex. We see higher uh, improved activity around 30%. So, I mean, uh, starting from 50%, actually the uh, engineering, the uh, I mean, neighboring adjacent residue in the CP serotonin complex clearly improves the activity. I mean, we expect this would be the, I mean, support, accelerate the transmetallation of, of the uh, silver to the, the, with the detailate ligands. Okay, so uh, as you see, uh, we have developed this CP serotonin complex with the lightning form, which, like, uh, coordinating this diphosphate ligand, we can specifically link 
this city uh, sort of entity to the system residue, and we can recover we can recover the activity by the addition of silver ion, and then perform the uh, the isokinolene synthesis. So I will briefly also mention about this conjugation works. Uh, no, uh, not very clearly, but it works well in even in a cell surface. So if we express the E. coli with the, this membrane protein that anchors on this uh, outer membrane, and the natural binding is fused with protein, and the idea is uh, the CP serotonin complex, the malaenide group, is linked directly with the nitro binding. Uh, displayed on the surface of E. coli. So actually, for this case, uh, the CP serotonin complex should be soluble because we have to mix in uh, E. coli cells. We add a little bit longer link, link uh, ethylene glycol linkers to make this complex soluble, and then we can improve the conjugation efficiency. And here's the uh, kind of, I mean, it's, the turnover is pretty low. But we see the correlation uh, with this variant activity is quite co nicely correlated with the uh, activity of the purified system. So, so this really uh, clearly show this, the, I mean, the, even in the cell surface, displayed on the, the cell surface in the nitro binding, have to give the same uh, protein environment. Okay, so now we have the I mean, a specific conjugation cis method with the CP serotonin complex. And how the, uh, I would like to share how we can improve this method, uh, apply the method to the direct evolution. So uh, here's a workflow. So of course we have the gene library and then we have a, a protein library based on this uh, information and then screen to pick up the improved variant. And this is really powerful. Uh, we can screen the many, many numbers of the protein variants. But the question is how we can uh, conjugate this completely synthetic uh, entity to this uh, protein library. So we selected to, uh, the strategy to express that nitro binding protein fused with uh, maltose binding protein. I mean, uh, this I mean, purified protein will have the clear results because the uh, activity at the beginning is quite uh, pretty low in most cases before the, uh, before the evolution. So we selected the starch agarose resin to purify this maltose binding uh, protein. Okay, here's uh, I'd like to mention a little bit how we uh, purify the protein and. The MVP tag is, um, I mean, quite common, very uh, general, generally uh, tag protein to purify. So we combine this. But if we use the, I mean, uh, the resin, uh, we buy the resin is pretty high, uh, pr pretty expensive. So it, it generally costs uh, more than thousand dollars per hundred ml, and then. Uh, binding capacity not that great for this MVP red maltose uh, resin. So we may uh, screen maybe two plates, 296 square plates, even though you pay this more than $1,000. So we cannot screen more. Then we decided to uh, make the gel ourselves and it's much, much cheaper. And then relatively low binding uh, aff affinity, but I mean, roughly, the same level. So uh, we can screen many, many uh, variants with this uh, region, which we uh, have also painted it. Okay, so then we have a, a fused protein of nitro binding, with, and then we make a library with the site saturation or uh, mutagenesis, and then transform them to, to make the protein, and then we can purify the. We, uh, before the purification, we can generate a lysate, and then we can simply conjugate uh, with the nitro binding in the lysate using our method with this uh, malaemide with protected with soluble uh, uh, the thiophosphate ligand. 
And after conjugation, we can purify with the uh, affinity, uh, purify our starch agars resin uh, developed in our in the lab, and then purified wash. And then we move on to the library screen. In this case, we use the uh, dimethoxyacetylene to generate this fluorescent product, which is also soluble. Okay, so this is a, on the bed, on, with this with this uh, screening method, we start with the set saturation mutagenesis of a twenty three position, mostly all around the uh, covering all residue of the CP cell rhythm complex, and here we use the degenerate column of a nineteen amino acid because if if we the system is uh, we have we have a system mutation then the conjugation is improved so this will make the system uh, we cannot confirm the clear uh, difference of the activity so we select this uh, degenerate codon that, that lacks the system residue okay and then we do this uh, we, we pick up the uh, uh, plates and then screen them with the fluorescence intensity for 60 nanometer of the isokinolin product and we see some of the improved variants in the screening. And then K127E variant shows a little, a little bit higher, uh, improved like, higher activity. So here's the position of 129. So that might help the, uh, I mean, this actually uh, locates in the second coordination environment of the CP serotonin complex. Okay, and then here's a summary of the uh, selection. So first round, we see uh, I mean, a couple of improved variant. T98 is pretty higher activity. Uh, and we go to the second round for the combination, which we selected from the first round. And then these two, uh, two variants show the pre pretty higher. And we just also uh, improved for the third round, the three variant is, uh, which, which you can see here on the T98 L100 K127. I mean, uh, the log is in the proximity with this uh, rhodium center. So this variant shows much higher activity. So here's a uh, summary of the diagram. And on the, the right side is, you see these three residues, I mean, uh, that would affect the activity. I mean, we believe this might help the again the, uh, to accelerate the transmetallation in in this in this protein cavity. Okay, but we performed the third and also fourth and fifth round, but we don't pick up the much uh, significant improved variant, and then we. Can we expect we expect that I mean basically the binding affinity of the sulfate is not that uh, enough in our system because the cavity here is is a quite open space and then cavity too a little bit shallow so to improve those uh, the such uh, affinity of the substrate we add some cap domain in close to this. Uh, this protein cavity of the nitrogen binding. We pick up the fatty acid binding protein that has a better barrel structure, but with some two helical domain, it works as a kind of lid. And this, this protein really tightly binds to with the fatty acid. So we pick up this domain and try to fuse with our nitrogen binding, binding scaffold. So we screen the several positions and then length and the linker links with this helical domain. And yeah, I mean, uh, a little bit optimize the residues, uh, as you see in, here in the uh, specifying. So, and then we do the same uh, reaction again, with the cycle addition, generating this fluorescence product. So here's a, a summary of the a time cost analysis. This is a starting variant. We change this with uh, uh, hex loop hex one is the variant with the lid. So it, we see a much significant increase in activity. And if we modify some 
the some of the residue in the late part increase more and then again more with the uh, next round of the uh, selection okay so here we uh, I uh, share some what I have done in a couple of years one minute left. With, all right five minutes left all right five minutes left all right thank you so we screen and we have developed some uh, CPC algorithm link by the catalyst and we developed a system to screen the maltose binding protein uh, fusion to improve the affinity purification and using this new fluorescent product starting from the oxan and the alkyne substrate and we improve the more than 4,000 variants and then uh, we have uh, some we, we were successful to find out some variant that has a much higher activity and this the uh, this is the guy who done this uh, all work of direct evolution Shinsuke uh, is now in the assistant professor in uh, Takashi Hayashi's group so we worked a uh, pretty long time with uh, uh, professor Ulrich Vandenberg in Aachen so uh, I really thank oh, uh, with this collaboration and his work. Okay, uh, so here's a summary of my uh, work. So we developed the, um, the a system using the latent CP cell code. This is quite applicable for the other pretty active uh, transition metal catalyst. And then with this method and also the fluorescent screening substrate, we, we perform the direct evolution of CP cell linked. Uh, protein diffused with the mitose binding protein. Okay, uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, again with the, uh, Professor Takashi Ayashi and all the members I worked when I in Osaka and the collaborators and uh, financial support. And I also thank for the new lab members in my group. Uh, actually, we started the new international project work with uh, Chile, but uh, the, the photo is uh, misleading, but this is taking support. So, yeah. And thank you for your kind uh, attention. Yeah, thank you. So now, discussion time. Do you have any questions? Yeah, Professor Song. Great talk. I have a quick question. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that you made a bunch of mutants, and most of them were like glutamate mutations, right? right. Like making a mutation uh, uh, nearby the uh, catalyst. What was the rationale for that glutamate uh, mutation? Right. Uh, I mean, with this, uh, I mean, cypsarodium complex has a, a latent ligand, so we have to. I mean, this replaced with the silver. So we expect this this glutamate residue will, uh, I mean, uh, preferentially bind to the silver. That delivers the silver to the transmetallation is more accelerated. Mm -hmm. This is what we are guessing, but uh, we don't have the exact, uh, I mean, uh, you know, exact results. But the, we we checked uh, from the. Activity, we tested activity in a different uh, silver concentration. Mm. It, it seems like the, those residue will, I mean, uh, preferentially bind to the silver. I see, I see. So it is nothing to do with uh, or the, the reaction mechanism, how the rhodium works. Instead, it's like uh, facilitate the uh, activation right. of the rhodium complex. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, no, that was at this moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Another question? So I think since time is limited, so please join me for thanks to Professor Onoda. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So now I would like to button touch to the next final, today's final session chair, who is uh, Professor Misuk Seo. And uh, from the Iwa Women's University, please. Hi, I'm Debbie Zuxo from the Iwa Women's University, and the second chair for postdocs and students' session two in biomimetic catalysts. 
today we have two speakers in this session. The first speaker is the Chung Chal Shin from Professor Kiang Bak's lab at KAIST. Please welcome to Chung Chal. Uh, thank you for your kind, in, uh, kind introduction, Professor uh, So. So my name is Chong Chul Shin. I'm working on the um, group 10 metal catalysis catalyst in Professor Kiang Park's lab. So it is very uh, great honor to me uh, to introduce my works for in front of many professors. So today I'd like to talk about the reductive emission reactions of the nickel organ nickel complexes uh, via uh, photo excitation with uh, C2 nickel charge transfer uh, excitations. So uh, this nickel cross, uh, nic uh, cross coupling catalysis with nickel catalysis uh, actually have the rate determining nature of the reductive emission re step. And the step is often slow due to the uh, endergonic thermodynamics. And this, uh, you can see that the uh, catalysis has the a very uh, high temperature, requires very high temperature and very long time. Uh, so uh, there are some strategies to overcome these uh, slow, slow reductive emission reactions, like utilizing the ex uh, excited state nickel to complex, which have the uh, faster reductive emission uh, activity. So uh, this is the one example. Uh, five years ago, the Professor McMillan published the uh, uh, CO bond forming reductive emission reactions at excited state nickel to complex. So this is just five years ago, so the mechanism is still under debate. Uh, so such as the the excited state character at uh, what, which is which is inducing the reductive emission is not yet uh, clarified. Uh, and also the reductive emission mechanism from the excited state also is not uh, clarified. So we wanted to clarify the mechanism of the uh, excited state nickel complexes, uh, the mechanism of the cross uh, excited state cross coupling mechanisms with the uh, nickel complexes. We utilized the NMR spectroscopy and also the magnetic circular dichroism spectroscopy as this ma magnetic circular dichroism spect spectra of complexes have the bandwidth um, plus and minus signs so we can observe the high resolution electronic spectra. And we also use the TDDFT computations to assist the understanding of absorption and MCD spectra and also to calculate the excited state energies on the top of the ground state geometry. So these two uh, are my targets to uh, talk about. And you can see that the, these um, nickel-2 complexes have, um, nickel-2 complexes are uh, in order to under dark, con uh, dark condition at room temperature, but they undergo the reductive emission reaction over uh, the excitation of the uh, photon. And also, this uh, reaction is, uh, can, be, can be also available at the high valent nickel complexes like nickel-3 and nickel-4 complexes. And I will start my talk with the nickel-2 complexes. So these three complexes are my target complexes. They have a BPY ligand and a very similar uh, geometric structure, uh, cycloneophile moiety. And they uh, have very similar uh, uh, geometric structures and also the electronic spectra. But uh, all, the only uh, nickel SC complex undergoes the photo induced uh, CS bond formation, while CO and CC complexes are not. Uh, it is very uh, interesting that you can see the, uh, the when we use the monochromatic laser excitation with the uh, different uh, excitation energies, we can see that the 400 nanometer excitation induced the uh, SC coupling selectively while the lower band transient does not, which means that this, uh, the excited state reached by the excitation of the higher energy is very important to the reductive elimination while the uh, lower energy transition does not uh, uh, induce the reductive elimination. So to understand the electronic structures of this uh, nickel complex, we uh, 
uh, monitor, we observed the magnetic spectral dichroism spectroscopy spectra of spectrum of this um, nickel complex. So uh, by the iterative Gaussian deconvolution of this MCD and observed spectrum, absorption spectra together, we could find five uh, different uh, bands and with the extinction coefficient of about uh, 4,000. So by the uh, assist, assisting of the resonance Raman spectra, which uh, show the uh, uh, enhancement of the in-plane uh, CC and C and uh, stretching vibrations of BP wiring over the excitation upon the excitation of the band one and two, so we could co conclude that this is the MLC transition from the nickel center to bipyridine pi, pi star orbital. And we also support the TDDFT calculation to show that these two and three, four, five are all the MST transitions from the occupied nickel 3D orbital to unoccupied BPI pi star orbital. However, there was the very small intense TDD transitions beneath the uh, higher energy band. So now we were, now we are, um, we uh, had a question about the which transition induces CS reduction emissions, MLST or DD transitions. So we, uh, we solve this problem with the changing the ancillary ligand to raise or remove the low-lying pi star orbitals of the BPY ligand. So we change the ligands to uh, PY3CH and DPP ligand with the less conjugated system, and also we apply the aliphatic timida and DMP ligand. And as you see here, all of this nickel SC complex with five different ancillary ligands shows uh, show the photo-induced uh, cross-coupling to uh, produce the SC-coupled product, and their uh, K values are very similar. So, which means that this, uh, regardless, regardless of the ligand, the SC-coupling is active to active for all of the nickel SC complex. But uh, this nickel OC and nickel CC complexes does not go uh, undergo the reductive elimination, uh, regardless of the ligand. And, and okay, so here you can see that the, this timidine and DMP aliphatic ligand have no low-lying ligand-based orbitals, so you can see the very low, low extinction coefficient here, so which means that DD, this is DD transients. So we can conclude that pure DD excitation induced induce the CS bond formation. So next question is that how they can uh, Induce the uh, the reductive SC reductive elimination. So we compare to cyclic cyclo neophil derivatives. I mean the uh, uh, nickel cycle complex and the acyclic nickel SC complex. This is acyclic analog with the very similar electron structure and also geometric structure. And we could see that the 400 nanometer excitation gives the or uh, ethane and methane as the major product, which is can be produced by the uh, nickel carbon bond homolysis, uh, by, uh, induced by the uh, light excitation. So this reactivity is in not different for uh, de not uh, dependent on the li ancillary ligand, and also it, it is not dependent on the uh, type of substrate. So you can see that SC and OC and CC complexes all generate the ethane as the major products. While the cyclic nickel complexes undergo only the uh, SC coupling. So here we can say that the nickel carbon bond homolysis can uh, occur for all nickel complexes, but uh, consequent uh, CX bond formation only occur for nickel 2 SC complexes. So here we apply the TDDFT computed ground state and excited state PSs, and so here I can uh, I could uh, get some uh, very important information. So upon the ex upon the excitation to the DD excited state here, green green one, and it can go to a lowest triplet uh, excited state, and it also can have a uh, dissociate the nickel carbon bond to generate the nickel one intermediate. But this uh, barrier is calculated as 25 kcal per mole for uh, with TDDFT, but it was uh, 
uh, published that 70k kappa mole is needed with the higher level QD and FPT2 KSSCF computation. So, so another pathway is needed to uh, explain this uh, nickel carbon bond homolysis induced by the uh, ligand field excitation. So here you can see the repulsive excited state with, with the character of carbon to nickel charge transfer. So via the interstitial crossing to this uh, repulsive surface, we can achieve the nickel carbon bond homolysis with the uh, S equal one nickel one intermediates. And this S equal one intermediate can uh, undergo facile intersystem crossing to S equal zero system because the, this uh, nickel center and the carbon radical center is very far enough so there is no interaction with each, uh, between, each, between two radical centers. And this nickel uh, one intermediate can undergo the burialless uh, CS bond formation to produce the nickel zero uh, SC uh, products. So this barrier is uh, one, one kilo kappa mole. So we can now uh, explain how the uh, SC cross coupling from the uh, photo um, uh, ligand field excited states. So for OC and CC couples, uh, OC and CC uh, bond formation, the, the barrier of those uh, uh, barriers were uh, calculated as 10 or 11, which is very high uh, compared to the CS bond formation. But the problem is that there is another pathway, step two prime, which is the CC, nickel C upon the recombination, it, which, which is calculated as barrier list for all three complexes. So, uh, so we could find that this nickel SC complexes can be uh, photo, excited, uh, photo excited and then it will give the nickel one intermediate which is generated by the nickel carbon bond homolysis and it will undergo the reductivation, uh, no, uh, the SC uh, bond formation while the other complexes undergo the uh, nickel one complexes undergo the nickel carbon bond recombination to give uh, the nickel to OC complexes or CC complexes again. So here, this is uh, my um, last slide for the first work. And secondly, we can uh, uh, achieve the C2 nickel charge transfer excited state directly with the nickel three and nickel four complexes because these nickel three and four centers have the lower uh, uh, d orbital energies compared to nickel two center. So. Uh, we need to uh, ex photo excite, uh, irradiate the UV lights to make the car carbon to nickel charge transfer excited state for nickel two, but we only need the visible light. So, for with the uh, carbon to nickel charge transfer transition arrowed here, we can see that the uh, the maximum yields can be obtained by the irradiating the uh, the carbon to nickel charge transfer transition energies, and the time is much shorter than previous nickel two case, like five minutes or one hour with just laser, not the LED. So I can I could conclude that C two nickel charge transfer excitations facilitate the CC bond formation for nickel three and nickel four complexes. So here I uh, conclude my work. So the C two nickel charge transfer excited state are very important for. Uh, the, uh, the cross-coupling reduction reaction, reaction at the nickel two and nickel three, nickel four complexes. So uh, for this work, uh, uh, many of our uh, um, many of the graduate students like uh, Suyeon, Saman, and Jisun uh, worked together. And also, uh, I'm very uh, thank you for the professor uh, Kyung Park, which uh, supervising uh, me. So. This is my, uh, the end of the slide, so yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, time for the questions. Do you have any questions from the audience and June? Okay, no questions? Thank you, welcome, uh, thank you to the, the uh, uh, Chang Chal Shin again. Okay, so we move on the uh, second speakers. You ready? Okay, so 
second speaker, Sakam Panda Manatban, is from the Professor Yunus Lee's group at the Seoul National University. So please welcome to the speaker, and he is going to present about his great work today. Thank you, Professor So, for the nice introduction. Uh, yeah. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to <coughs> yeah, uh, present my research here. And I'm going to discuss the nickel catalyst upcycling of nitrogen oxyanions. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So in yesterday's session, Professor Lee actually discussed the introductions about the nitrogen oxyanions and the environmental issues related to the nitrogen oxyanions. And also he mentioned about the nitrogen cycle and the different en en enzymes working at the deoxygenation of nitrogen oxides to, the, to dinitrogen. Anyway, so I'm, I'm not going to discuss the details about that. So. Uh, from our lab, we actually uh, published the PNP ligand scaffold uh, supported nickel complex, which uh, catalyzed the deoxygenation of nickel, I mean nitrogen oxides to the dinitrogen. So, the initial work related to the biological deoxygenation process, which produces the di uh, nitrogen di uh, dinitrogen from the, okay dinitrogen from the nitrogen oxides, but the resultant, resulting product dinitrogen is not meaningful and which is inert and free. So we wanted to utilize a different technology, which is the nitrogen oxides conversion and utilization technology. So in this uh, technology, we wanted to utilize the nitrogen oxides as a N1 resources. So, uh, so we started utilizing the uh, our new uh, ligand framework, which is a rigidified acrylate PNP ligand. Okay. okay, yeah, now I'm getting this, getting used to this. Okay, so we started using the uh, rigidified acrylate PNP ligand framework as a catalytic framework for the de deoxygenation of the nickel, I mean nitrogen oxides to the nitrogen ox uh, nickel nitroso complex, and then. The important finding is here is that we characterize the uh, PNP nickel nitroso complex to be a nickel one nickel I mean nickel one nitroso radical species. Uh, so after characterizing this, I started working on our lab. Like I wanted to uh, finish the I mean find the catalytic cycle for the nitroso tran group transfer reactions. So initially, I, react, I reacted the benzyl halides, excess of benzyl halide with the nickel nitroso. And I clearly found that the nickel nitroso complex can completely convert to the nickel chloride so that from the nickel chloride, we can actually regenerate the nickel nitroso complex, which uh, can indicate that the catalytic potential of the nitroso group transfer reactions and the catalytic potential of this PNP scaffold to use nitrogen oxyanions as a NO resources. So after this, uh, so when I used the complex for the catalytic reactions, I found the maximum turnover number for this uh, nitroso group transfer reaction to be more than 200 and then the selectivity for to be more than 90 percentage. But uh, the associated byproduct in this reaction is the direct reaction of this uh, nickel uh, sodium nitrite with the benzyl halide to form some alkyl uh, nitroalkanes and then alkyl nitrates. So this uh, seems to be a problem issue in these reactions. So we try to optimize the reaction conditions. So, uh, so in the initial solvent screenings, we found the acetone and acetone nitrate to be the best solvents for the, in terms of oxime yield and also the oxime uh, selectivity. So we carried out uh, using acetone as a solvent for the next reactions and then our temperature optimizations and uh, controlling the amount of the sodium nitrate 
did not uh, help in improving the oxygen yield. However, so when we decrease the uh, catalyst loading to 0.1 mole percentage, we could actually get some high turnover number like 2, 230. By the way, okay. So, uh, and then when we try to improve, increase the CO pressure, actually we could not get any uh, good improvement in the oxime yield or oxime selectivity, which uh, actually, oh, yeah. So, okay, I can go now. So, when we try to increase the CO pressure, we could not get uh, much improvement in the oxime yield and selectivity. You can see in the uh, one atmosphere CO and then in the six atmosphere CO, the oxime yield seems to be like 23 versus 24 percentage. So, it so far, this uh, is the best turnover number for us in this uh, nitro, nitroso group transfer reactions. Uh, after this, we started to uh, do some control experiments. So the first control experiment was the blank reaction without the nickel. So we could not, we could not see the oxime for formation in this reaction. But the side product, nitroso alkane and, uh, sorry, uh, the nitro alkane and alkyl nitrate were formed to be like around 40 percentage. So if we do not add the carbon monoxide gas, also did not form any oxime in that reaction. So meaning uh, both carbon monoxide and nickel complexes are needed for this catalytic reaction. So the seems like the nitro alkane byproduct formation is not related to the catal uh, nickel catalyst. So to check that, we actually did some other control experiments. So when we treat the benzyl bromide derivative with the nitro, uh, I mean nickel nitrate complex, mm, we could not see the generation of the nitro alkane or alkyl nitrate byproducts, which means the nickel complex, I mean nickel nitrate, cannot uh, catalyze the, I mean transfer the nitrate anion to the benzyl halide. So that's good actually. So. After that, I started screening the different substrates, and in the different substrates, um, the both primary and then uh, secondary benzyl halides and alkyl halides worked greatly with us, and we started to observe some trends in that reactivity. So the uh, primary halides, whether it is benzyl or alkyl halide, uh, the oxygen selectivity was about 40 percentage, but when we increase the steric bulk in the benzylic portion, like secondary halides, uh, the selectivity for the oxime was like more than 90 percentage in our cases. So, okay, we were happy, but when we try with the tertiary halides, actually the reaction, uh, I mean, the nitroso group uh, product formation was not there. So, and uh, yeah, we used the bromide maintain and then the tertiary butyl bromide. We could not see the nitroso alkane in these two reactions. So, we wanted to study more about this. And then, so we wanted to see the kinetics of this study. study. So when I check the uh, kinetics with the different recurrence of the benzyl bromide, that revealed that the uh, complex three, which is the nickel nitroso complex, uh, behaves like a pseudo first order decay in this kinetic uh, anal uh, analysis. And uh, the bimolecular uh, reactivity reveals that both the complex three and the benzyl bromide are involved in the red determining step. So in that case, then we thought about two different reaction pathways. One is the nickel halide, uh, I mean nickel, can, nickel radical can abstract the halide to form uh, nickel halide and then the alkyl radical, which can uh, re, uh, generate the nitroso alkane compound. Or in the other pathway, the nitroso complex can directly attack the alkyl alkane and then it can regenerate the, it can generate the nitrous alkane complex. So first, since our uh, DFT and uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy revealed that this complex was, uh, behave as a nickel one nitrous radical compound. So we thought of uh, the radical type reactivity with this, but Professor Zhou from Kyung, uh, Jungbuk National University, he, uh, he quickly calculated uh, that the C, direct C and bond formation has the low energy barrier than the uh, halide abstraction pathway. And the uh, HOMO minus one of the transient state also shows the nice interaction between the nickel and the nitros, nitrogen and benzylic carbon. So it 
we started to realize that it may not be a radical reaction, but it can be a direct SN2 type react reactivity. So to check that, we added a tempo to our uh, reaction, catalytic reaction, but it didn't uh, inhibit any catalytic production of uh, oxime. Also, when we react that tempo to the, when we add excess of tempo with the PNP nickel nitroso complex, we couldn't see any other uh, reactivity, meaning that the nitros, uh, nickel one nitroso radical may be stable with two radicals, or there may be some covalency. So in that case, uh, we need to think about the uh, second pathway, which is the direct NC coupling pathway. So if the direct NC coupling pathway is possible, we should be able to get some uh, nickel C nitroso complex as an intermediate. So we couldn't isolate uh, such an uh, intermediate from the catalytic reactions. However, uh, our uh, uh, colleague Jung uh, Choi actually prepared the nickel C nitroso, nickel one C nitroso complex by reacting nickel one with a nitroso dimer, and uh, it revealed that it has a uh, unpaired electron in the nitroso moiety of the complex. And one electron oxidation actually revealed that a nickel two complex can be formed. And interesting thing is that the nitrogen, I mean, the electron density on the SOMO has, uh, has been removed because of the oxidation, and then the uh, NO bond bond length become shortened in this oxidation complex. So showing that uh, the C, C, direct CN pathway can be a potential uh, pathway for this reaction. And then finally, uh, Professor Joe actually summarized all the catalytic steps involved in this. And then this reaction, uh, as, as I mentioned, the C, um, I mean the NO transfer to the benzyl halide seems to be the red determining step. And then the further uh, uh, bro uh, alkyl, I mean nickel bromide generation and then the nitroalkane generation, uh, nickel nitrate complex generation seems to be downhill and a uh, total of, uh, and then the CO binds with the nickel nitrate complex and deoxygenate it to the nickel nitroso complex. So, so by this, actually, we can summarize that we are uh, now introducing a nickel catalyzed nitrogen, I mean, NOx, conversion and utilization technology, which is parallel to the carbon capture and utilization technology. So that's how I'd like to summarize, and I'd like to thank our group members and Professor Lee and the funders. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, questions time. If you have any questions. Okay, uh, actually we are running out of time, so please. <laughs> Thanks to the, the uh, Staka Padamanaban, and thank you very much. And uh, the, please join me. Thanks to the, all the speakers for through today, sharing of the, uh, their great works. <laughs>